Morning. It's afternoon. Afternoon. Well, it depends where you are. Easy. Hello. <clears throat> Yo. Thanks. Acropolis. Yeah, that was... That was a weird one. <laughs> I really wanted that to be better than it was. But, um... Weird. They have a sound limit because they're scared of you, um... <laughs> vibrating it too much because I think they're worried that the rocks are going to fall apart but never mind all the local traffic and the fact that they put the sub right next to the rocks that they were worried about so they could have put the sub near the audience not so much technical issues it was the the venue just had this weird sound limit um, so we had to have it really quiet and we had to have the sub mix really low because it was tripping their meter, which was set weighted towards bass, which obviously they're just worried about vibration. So, but I think it's a lot of bureaucracy, really. I think more it's to do with sound leakage and local residents and stuff like that. But they don't say that. They say it's because it's this ancient structure. So they just kind of use that to get you to play ball, I think. It's my take anyway. I don't know. Morning, morning. It's not morning here though, so, but I guess it is in the UK, so, morning. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to barbecuing. I'm a bit worried about reverb, but we'll see what it's like when we get in there. I've heard good things about it, so, um, and they did a lot of work on it, like, I think in the early 2000s to try and even out the weird because there's beams running down it that cause weird sound issues so read quite a bit about it so but i'm reasonably confident it'll be good lfo 94 yeah totally remember that i think that was the i don't know if that was the first tour we did it was around amber so it was like an amber sort of related tour. Yeah, it was really good. LFO were fucking ace on that tour. They're good to hang out with as well. Um, how did you get all the live replays on Spotify? I don't know, even know what that means. I don't use Spotify, so can you elaborate? Because I'm a bit dumb. <laughs> How different do you expect the two sets to be at Barbican? I don't know, because it depends. I, I mean, I'd say pretty different, because hopefully. But um, I think Rob's got a bit of work to do on his bits before I know for certain. But yeah, I'm reasonably sure it'll be quite different. Like, quite different, I don't know. But we'll see. Uh, Milano recording. Yeah. Yeah, we got that. And we got the Acropolis one, which I should say is going to sound better, actually, on the recording than it would have done in the gig, cause, just because of the weird mix in the venue. So I'm glad we got that down, because I don't think it was a bad gig from our end. And it sounded much better on the stage than it did out front, so that's quite weird. Um. Is there a soundboard quality copy of the quirky Brixton set? Not that I know of, unless somebody grabbed it. But I wouldn't put it past them, given who organised it, to have recorded it and not give us it. But um, I just don't know, is the answer. But that camcorder copy that's kicking around is actually quite good. You know, considering it's from a fucking camcorder. Um... Will the live 2022 stuff sound like sign and plus? A bit, I guess. I mean, insofar as we always sound a bit sort of similar to what we're doing in studio, but yeah, not really. Cause I mean, the tracks are quite different structurally and stuff, but some of the sounds will be the same. 
how did the elephant gear collab with these snares come about yeah so uh basically daniel anson died and that was a bit of a blow for everyone because he was fucking well smart um and then aaron got in touch to say that he'd been asked to do something for that compilation and i'd already i had like an old track from about 2005 that i'd given for it because they were doing a compilation to kind of commemorate daniel and i had um basically yeah i had this old track so i give him that and then aaron got in touch and said that he'd been asked but he didn't have any electron gear <laughs> so i just twatted out like 10 minutes of just mayhem um on the machine drum i think just the machine drum i can't remember now i think it was just the machine drum and then sent him that and then he made a track out of it basically so it's more or less his track but done using a load of patterns and sounds that i made but you know because i wanted i didn't want to just send him sounds because that would have been a bit weak and i know he would have just took over being how he is so I, at least i give him patterns to cut up but he done a good job i reckon and he managed to sneak something like a 303 in there anyway so you know It sounded mono unless you were seated dead centre. Yeah, it would do. That rig was wrong, really, for that layout of space. I think flying a rig at the same height as the back seats at the top, which, where you know, when you fly a rig, the speakers are doing this. So they're like... Because line array, it's sort of designed for um, a big flat space, like a field or whatever, or like a stadium. So um, it doesn't really work when the seating's at a weird angle because all the seats are reflecting the sound back at different so it just scatters all the way fronts and you get this weird they should have thought about it a bit more basically but anyway i don't want to criticize them on a technical level i'm sure they think they know what they're doing so um mix alarm mixes daily no well they weren't really mixes so I'm not, by the way, I'm not keeping the scroll going here, so I'm going to miss stuff. Because last time, oh fuck, I've lost the chat again. Yeah, last time I I kept scrolling around and not being in, up to date and missing reactions, so. Alright, Ned Rush, alright man. Send some of your videos. Right, so. How do you approach making a youth? I've started scrolling now, so I've fucked it. How do you approach making a euphoric sounding song? I don't know. I don't, I don't know what that is. Uh, euphoric. I think I'm always fucking euphoric. So, I don't know. Oh, my God. Um, can you describe your approach to percussion? Around the time of XI, you mentioned not being tied to the grid anymore. Yeah, because using Mac so you don't really you're not really aware of grids but I wasn't even when we was using DP because DP doesn't really DP I mean it's probably changed a bit now because I ain't used it for 20 years or something so but back in the day DP was like really fucking weird with regard to grids so it never kind of because you probably noticed in a lot of other programs that the visual grid that you see and always kind of defaults to being in groups of four or multiples of four but dp don't do that it's like it's weird it's um it, you don't know where you are in the grid when you're using it it doesn't really give you any pointers it's just a kind of a b a b for whatever step size you're working at and there's no kind of generally bigger lumps to to view so but i found that really liberating um so yeah that but then after that, yeah, using Max. I mean, you don't, you're not really thinking about grids in Max. At least I'm not. I mean, I guess it depends on how you're working. Because if you're using step sequences, you will be. But I'm not thinking about that at all. So, yeah. But I'm still thinking in terms of like there being a rhythm, like a sort of relatable human rhythm, not some just whatever you could just call any kind of messing around with time rhythm really but 
anyway yeah that's a big topic um you're still keeping your eye on the graph scene i mean not loads but um but i'm on the and style sub so like i check a lot of and styles these days and styles have just gone mad tagging's just gone mad um and it's much more about what i used to think it was about back in the day not like just a mess but like art you know because i think and styles can be art i think that's it's lost on a lot of people because you see a lot of tags just look shit but depending where you live obviously but um some of them are just pure art and i think you know i really like that that you can really get a sense of someone's flow like the way they move through just the way that letters are drawn so yeah i don't know i've kind of i have a very vague sense of what graph's about these days but i don't i couldn't list like loads of artists um there's that guy i like that that guy who keeps doing the same thing in dublin i think he's called aches or something and he does that weird color bleed thing i like his shit um because it's quite fresh but he does do the same thing all the time so but yeah his, his shit's good but yeah some, sometimes i see people and, and try and remember who they are but most of the writers that i really rate are you know they were around back in the day i still really rate tdk i think they were fucking really really good if you know who they are Describe the live setup of the last gigs. Laptop controller, sound card. Thanks. I mean, you know, two. I mean, the the latest ones uh, are just two. M1 Max, um, Kenton Killer Mix controllers, two interfaces. I've got a uh, Apogee Symphony desktop. Rob's using an Apogee Element Twenty Four. Um, the mixer is like a little Machionix twelve channel thing just because it fits on a plane easily and, and it's easy to get around. And it's replaceable if it breaks, you know, it's not, we're not relying on some esoteric mixer being found by the promoter at the last minute, so. Because that's always a consideration, you know. There's only the controllers really that would be hard to source. So uh, we often carry spares, like if we're on a tour bus, we'll have spares of the controllers wheels. Um, Will you ever release an album with vocals? Um, I think we did that, but, you know, I guess they're not vocals. You mean singing? Like, am I going to start singing on tracks? Because that's... <laughs> yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? Like, I think... <laughs> I don't want to I don't want to say this, but I kind of do. But, you know, there's just so many electronic producers think, yeah, I'm going to sing on my next album, and it's just shit because he can't sing, so, you know. I think Aaron's are all right, though. I quite like his singing. Oh, you know. Um, how the hell were the sounds on Paralit Triangle made? You also said it wasn't generative. Yeah, no, it wasn't. Um, yeah, so, like, the main kind of gong pattern is... Um, What's it called now? Is it a rayong? I can't remember what it's called. It's like a gamelan instrument that's like a row of like little pots, metal, on suspended. So that that was played live, and then um, the percussion track. So that I took that and then put that in Logic, and then the percussion track was done with samples of. Um, Yeah, like rubber bands in a shoebox, sampled on um, an emu, e-synth, um, and sort of using the filters in that a bit. And that was programmed. So what I had to do in Logic, rather than like, because I didn't, there was no flex time or anything then. So I just basically timed up the project to the live gong playing, because I weren't playing to a click or anything. So I didn't have any... So it was drifting the timing basically. So I had to time up the logic project to the gong track. And then I'd made the percussion stuff over the top of that. So it was kind of the time. That's why the timing slips around because 
it's just my shit playing of the gongs to begin with that, that dictated the timing on the track. Um, so, yeah. And then there was a few of a couple of MIDI parts laid over the top, but I had to detune them a bit because the gongs were a bit... Well, they're weirdly tuned, aren't they? So, sort of... I think it was like 9 EDO or something. Yeah, I can't remember now. How do you feel about making the front cover of New York Times when Simon's released? Yeah, cool. You know. Um, what was the sample used in All End and Blade Dolores? At least I was that sound producer. Got to ask Rob about that because he did them. Oh, I got a weird. You know, those thick hoverfly things. They just sit there, like, holding. No, it's some weird wasp. Fuck. Okay, I'll try and ignore him. Wow, he's fucking cool. He's really interested in my shoes for some reason. Um, what do you change in your performance in an amphitheatre setting versus a flatter room, like a band room? Um, I mean, I've only played couple of amphitheatre type settings they are really weird spaces to play because you've got that horrible combination of the steps and the and the kind of circular thing because circular venues are the fucking worst any round space is just horrible acoustically um so yeah i don't know there's not a lot you can do with it you know there's like i mean you have to mix your drums a little bit lower but other than that there's, there's not really any hard and fast rules for working with it, other than how the PA is installed and stuff like that, which isn't down to us. And usually we get in there and we're just like shouting at people for doing things wrong. So that's about all you can do. And they just like get angry with you because it's their space and their ego has been damaged. Um, what do you think of the Prima set? Uh, yeah, pretty good. Like bit gassy in that room but yeah pretty good at what point do you decide the air all has to go and do number one all over yeah like usually before now because it's getting a bit long for me but you know like and it's summer but you know i'm just lazy and i've just been patching for weeks so you know you're getting hair at the moment rare hair have you ever used bitwig a uh, bit yeah Bitwig's fucking sick. The only thing... I mean, I'd rather use Bitwig than Ableton, to be honest, but it's just because it runs max patches in Ableton, and I don't really use Ableton much, but if I need to do some... Like, if I've if I've got to run a patch along, you know, in, in, in sync with what I'm doing in, in a DAW, I use Ableton. But I've been looking at Reaper recently, because it seems like you can do some pretty nice little fiddly little bits in Reaper. Um, and I know a couple of people who use it for surround multi-channel type stuff um yeah it looks like quite a good program reaper bitwig wh why i like bitwig is that it's just really really open-ended and modular it's nice you know i also think reason doesn't get enough shouts because the dsp in reason is fucking amazing i think um but i don't use it but whenever i hear someone using it i'm like fucking hell it sounds good so, if you ever were recording, it's one recording of everything, all kit running at once. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you if what you mean is like, do I ever record in stereo? Yeah, all the time, basically. I prefer doing that. I prefer doing the mix as I'm working, because I think it's just essential to how the track sounds. I don't record parts and then have a mixing stage, because... I don't know, just not how I've grown up working, basically. I prefer knowing what I'm gonna get while I'm while I'm doing it, if you know what I mean. So I don't really record parts separately. I don't enjoy doing that. And when if I do do that, it's because I've got to, you know, because maybe I've only got one of a synth or something like that. So uh, do you miss doing just DJ sets, or did you ever enjoy that? Actually, what <laughs> weirdly phrased question. Um, yeah, I enjoy DJ sets loads. Um, oh, you mean live DJ sets? Like, yeah. Um, eh, yeah, it's all right. 
I mean, I think I'm just not buying enough new records these days to, to make a go of it properly. And also, like, I'm not sure if I'm giving the audience what they want because I'm a bit self-indulgent on that tip. So I think mixing for radio, you can get away with being self-indulgent a bit easier than you can in a venue. But, yeah, I might, I might be up for doing that down the line. I got a bit rusty recently, I think. That's another thing, you know, I've just not done it for a bit. Um, in a sense, extracting out of one time live jamming sessions so that you can't go back to extract layers, etc. Yeah, 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 that. Yeah, I do that all the time, basically. That's mostly what I'm doing. No, it's not snooker balls in Pro Radio. It's. Um, and is the vocal sample John Virgo? No. But good guess. Do you know if David Lynch is aware of your music? Yes, I do. Um, I'm sure he'd love it. Yeah. Um, so before COVID, we got invited to play at one of his fundraiser things for his um, Transcendental Meditation organisation thing. I can't remember what it's called. The Lynch Foundation or whatever it is. Um sent us a nice little letter and stuff. It was really cool. I was like, fucking hell, a letter of David Lynch, mad. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, he's aware of us and, and I think he likes us enough to want us to do a gig for him. So I'd be well up for it, doing it, actually. It's just getting it organised now that COVID's died off. So that might happen down the line. Um, memes, yeah, memes, you know, memes are memes, whatever. What track would you play for David Lynch? <laughs> what, you mean if I had him sitting in a room? I'm not sure I'd be playing tracks for him. Um, I don't know. I Probably some are unreleased, because I've got a few things that I think he might like that I've not put out, so... Um, or Tucker Live at the Roadhouse. Yeah, that'll never happen, because it's too fucking round. So, who wants to play it in the Roadhouse, really? You know? But I need to scroll because I'm missing you all now. And these some of these questions are mad long. I was in the last London gig at Queen Elizabeth. I had the impression that the PA was split three ways and the sound seemed to travel upwards as it got into high frequencies and downwards as it was into the low hertzes. And it was super synesthetic. Are you using these techniques when you play live? I mean, insofar as the venue gives us that. I mean, like in that space, obviously the bass was set lower in the space. And so if you were aware of where the bass was coming from in there which is you know unusual but not impossible then you would have you would have noticed that but that's just to do with the way the space is set up and in general like bass is going to be lower down when in in a venue and it's going to hit you more with a body hit in it so in general than an ear hit so you're going to get a sense of that kind of positioning anyway just from the space so yeah i guess we are using the techniques but it's more like playing an instrument the instrument being the venue if you know what i mean have you ever thought of purpose of life do you feel think you're fulfilling any purpose or find some reason yeah this this stuff i mean i think meaning is something that we project onto things so you know you can you can argue that life's meaningless but, you, you know, I mean, that's because we create meaning, I think, or we find it. Um, but, yeah, I'm not... I don't read enough philosophy to have a kind of... a well-informed opinion, if you like, on this. But I, I get the feeling that meaning is... is, is it, it's just a kind of human condition. Um any intention to do some more of those long twitch streams yeah my, maybe i don't know like um i think i got a bit bored of doing it actually after a while but could do some more yeah it was fun to do them and it was fun like developing stuff with you lot are watching I mean, I wasn't really patching on the screen or anything, but you could probably sense that it was changing subtly, especially day to day, because I'd have I'd have ideas in the shower and then just 
cobble something together and then just get online with it straight away. So that aspect of it was really fun. Um, but yeah, I sort of felt like I sort of reached a plateau in, in terms of my interest in it and, and all that kind of stuff. Because I'm not naturally a visual... I don't program visuals naturally, you know. It was just something I was trying out for a bit of a laugh because uh, I thought I might get in trouble on Twitch just playing like my weird video collection over and over. <laughs> so, um, have you used MC in Max much? Yeah, um, quite a lot. Um, it's really flexible and amazing, basically. I really rate it. I think MC's like, yeah, just amazing. And it's kind of weird because I've been doing like massively poly polyphonic kind of stuff and then suddenly MC popped up and it was like, oh, okay. It just gave me a whole new way of looking at it. So used it quite a bit on sign actually, which you might be able to hear. Um, older AE tracks had more timbre and tonal variety because they came from various sources. The latest Max MSP material feel cut from the same fabric. Yeah, that's interesting because I'm not sure you would be able to identify which tracks we used hardware on, on on the recent material that we've released. But it'd be interesting if you had any guesses. Because, you know... Doesn't that concern you? Doesn't that concern you? Is that really what you want to ask me? Bonang is the gamelan instrument that you're describing. Right, yeah, it could be. Would you ever stream yourself making a patch? Mm, maybe, be a bit boring, I think, for you. Because um, I tend to... I don't start with, like, ideas. I kind of feel my way around and try lots of different things out until I hit on something that I like. So... And I'm sure that you lot in the chat be going, that's good, that's good, stop there, that's good. And I'd just be thinking, yeah, you're wrong. So, you know. Uh, how easy did you come up with new song ideas? Like how many tracks you start in a day averagely? Um, I don't know. Like how many tracks do you start in a day? <laughs> Not more than one usually. Trackpad or mouse when you do live? Um, Rob's mouse, I'm a trackpad guy. But I don't really use either of them much. I, most of the essential stuff is on the keyboard. So I just use like key stuff. And then I'm using the controller. So I don't really have to use the mouse much. I mean, I could do, but it'd be a bit slower and weird because obviously you can't do two things at once. All new tracks feel like parts of a bigger track. Whereas in older releases, each track sounded different. Hmm. Yeah. I don't really understand what that means. Are you guys going to release some more of the older release on vinyl? Um. Yeah, like we've got... So we, at the moment, we've got Comfield and Draft are ready to go. I don't know if they're going to go any further than Draft. They might want to do until... This just comes from Warp, really. And, you know, obviously, like, I'm aware of the resale value, and I think they are too, so... I think once the resale value for stuff goes really high, then they're worth doing. Because, you know, you're, st you're stopping people getting ripped off, scalped and stuff, so... But otherwise, I don't know if I can be bothered. Like, if there's no demand for it that I can see, then I, I wouldn't bother doing them. But, yeah, I think it's basically what I want to do. Them. And, I th and it's because originally when we signed to what we had a kind of weird agreement that, that they'd keep all our stuff in print constantly. Because I remember that was a thing from... I'd read this in a Depeche Mode interview sometime in the 80s, that they'd agreed with Mute to keep their stuff in print forever. I always thought that was really cool. Because I thought, yeah, it'd be good to just be able to do this for the rest of my life. So, wanted to do that, but then, um, but then it just got really expensive storing records. So a lot of them just fell out of print, and I think Warp intended when they signed us to to honour that, but they just couldn't over time. And it was only a kind of 
verbal agreement anyway. So, you know, them repressing stuff, it's, it's what I'd prefer. I'd prefer the stuff to be available all the time. That's why everything's on digital now as well, so, but you know. Like, for me, that'd be enough, because I don't mind just having the music. I don't really need all the packaging and stuff. But I know some people really like to have physical items, and some people prefer listening to vinyl. So, you know. Got to keep everyone happy. Could you please explain your mention in the Metroid Prime credits? Well, I can now, because I've talked about it themselves. So, even though I am violating an NDA, technically, by saying this. But basically, we got asked to do the soundtrack by... Um, uh, what was that company in Austin that developed it? I can't remember the name now. But, um, but yeah, we met up with them in Austin. And they were really keen. And we were really keen. Because it was fucking Metroid, you know. Uh, best game ever. So, And then um, Nintendo kind of barked it for some reason. And wanted their guy to do it. So that was that, really. And I think that they... I don't know how much involvement they had in, in the sound of it, whether they intentionally tried to make it sound a bit more us-ish, but um, I don't think so, really. You know, I've read people saying that they think it sounds a bit like us, but I don't think it does, so... But it's subjective, that, isn't it, so... Um, do you have any say over art direction on, on your record covers? Yeah, a lot. Yeah, we, we're pretty involved in it. Um. But it does depend. Sometimes, like, I'll give Ian a rough idea and he'll go away and come back with something. But we'll have kind of very... Uh, we'll make a lot of suggestions, but they won't be, like, in terms of how it looks graphically. And other times, I'll just tell him what kind of colours I'm seeing and associating with the, with the music. Uh, and he'll come back and try and satisfy a, a very rough description. But I never give him a description that says, you know, this kind of shape or... But I'll kind of give him vague pointers for stuff. Um, and Rob's the same, you know, he has... We, we're both quite synesthetic, so we both have kind of some visual ideas usually associated with the work, but they're usually, like, difficult to communicate, and that vagary, you know, the fact that it's so difficult to talk about, it makes it a bit... Um, makes it easy for Ian to find a way in and, and express himself and, and sort of... Sometimes he undermines what we've said on purpose, and, and sometimes I really like that. I, I really like working with Ian. He's, he's super creative, I think. He always finds a way of slightly subverting what you've, what you've asked him for and improving it at the same time, and I really rate that. What do you use in Max to write patterns of the grid but still having an electro vibe to it with eight times more kicks? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah I don't know like what do I use in Max all sorts of stuff you know phasers um, metronomes delays you know just the usual Max stuff you know I kind of think in terms of events causing other events you know like when I used to think about rhythm I, I didn't used to really like rhythms where there were a lot of overlapping sounds. I preferred it to sound like there was a kind of ball bouncing off different surfaces, so you'd hear it kind of moving around, kind of like that, you know. Um, does that... Is this kid across the road had this thing called Matchbox Cascade. I don't know if you've ever seen that. It was like... Um, it was like a kind of... Um, Hell a scout, not a hell a scout. What do you call it? Like a screw thing that would make balls go up in a, in a tube, and then they'd come out the top, and then they'd just bounce off all these little trampolines, and you could set the trampolines up around the room. So we used to just fill the room with these trampolines and have this thing going off constantly. And I think that slightly informed the way I think about rhythm because I used to really like listening to the rhythms you could make with that thing. It was fucking cool. Um, have you heard any acoustic covers of your songs that you like? Um, yeah, I like all the Pink, Pink Freud stuff quite a lot, actually. I really like how they develop the tracks, especially the God's Quarter one. It's really good. Um, so, yeah, that. And, like, occasionally I find people on YouTube. There was a guy, fucking hell, there's one guy. I can't remember his name now. I ended up finding him on Bandcamp, but he was basically, he's like a fretless bass player, and he was playing 
the bass along with one of the AE Live things, which I just think is mad because there's no sequence for that anywhere. It was just all generated. But he's playing it like verbatim. He'd learned like about a minute of it and he was just playing it. It's somewhere on YouTube if you look for it. Can't remember his name. He's got this amazing bass. Like the sound of his bass is fucking beautiful. It's soft felty and kind of velvety, beautiful sound. And it's really good because it sort of really mirrors the synth that's doing the bass part on the track. So yeah, sometimes I see stuff like that and I'm just like, wow, fuck. You know, that's just crazy dedication, that. But, um, you know, but I, yeah, it's it's often... And there's, I, I remember seeing a guy doing eggshell with like a, a guitar and, an, and a looper pedal. I quite like that as well. And it ended up sounding like some kind of early 90s kind of grunge thing. And I was like, wow, this is weird. We're like a sort of... Because I didn't even realise how post-rock them melodies are on that. Because I don't listen to a lot of that kind of stuff. But, you know, hearing, hearing it played on a guitar, it suddenly made sense. I was like, wow, it is really American, that melody. I'd never really thought about that. Because I don't really know what I'm doing musically. Or I didn't in 93, you know. Um, relatively recent snapshots of your Max patches, just to get a sense of their general appearance and tidiness. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I like this. Yeah, it's funny, this thing of, like, people's patch styles, you know. Like, I look at Mark Fell's patches and they're, like, so different to the way I patch. Visually and, and sort of the whole vibe of it and everything. Yeah, I might do. I mean, you know... I don't know what, to, what I'd do it with, but, yeah. Um, Blade Dolores question. Yeah, I just said ask Rob because, you know... Because it's Rob. And he did it. Have you ever tried or used other visual programming languages besides Max? Um, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I've used other Max type things. So, like, Turbo Synth. Um, I've used Reactor a little bit, but I don't really... I didn't really get along with it. Um... How did you make the rolling pitch effects of the cowbell in C patch? EPS, yeah. It's just sampled on the EPS. Um, I think there was a reverb on the sample and then we had the loop in the EPS extending that and then it's just pitch bent, basically. Who are my favourite MCs at the moment? I'm always getting asked that. I mean... Uh, just the usual, like Rock Marcy, K.A., uh, Conway, Westside. Um, I still really rate Cool Keith. Can't not rate him, really. You know, he, he he's not always good these days, but when he is, he's fucking really good. Um, Gene Grey, you know, love Gene Grey. Funny as fuck. Um, yeah, don't know. Who have I heard recently? Like, that Uncle John guy, I quite like him, he's funny to me, you know. It's like so fucked out, it becomes like, it's like pure comedy to me, you know. Um, K.A., I rate, um, Willie the Kid. Um, I like Earl Sweatshirt, you know. I know it's OF, but he's, he's, the, he's the best one. And I still rate Tyler, you know. I know a lot of people don't like Tyler for fucking weird reasons, but I rate Tyler. Tyler's good. You should rate Tyler. Um, Favourite place to go in Norway? Uh, I like the south coast at the moment, because it's summer, and the rocks are really round and beautiful, so I'm going to say that. Because um, it's not what most people would say, is it? So, But I haven't been up north yet, and I keep getting told to, so I'm going to do it at some point. Because I want to see Northern Lights. Older AE tracks... This guy again. Older AE tracks had more timbral and tonal variety because they came from various sources, different hardware. The latest Max MSP material, while prolific, feels cut from the same fabric. Isn't that the confinements of the system? God, that's such a bait question. Yeah, I mean... 
it'd be interesting to know which tracks you think aren't made in Max MSP that we've released recently. Can you can you tell me which ones you think they are, or is it just that our kind of ability to nail what we're into aesthetically has improved? Because I think like it's easy back in the day to hear a track that was made on an RY30 because there's only so much you can do with it, but you can do more with it than you can do with the R8, you know. So I think it's actually the confinement to the hardware that lead to the tracks having more variation, and that variation isn't necessarily what I would have done if I had more control there would have been more homogeneity if you like so yeah that's how i'd respond to that i hope you understand me answer there because i do mean it um what's your approach to djing just playing shit i like which isn't really what you're supposed to do is it you know you're supposed to play to the audience but yeah i've not i'm not really very good at doing that i tend to just do what i'm into so and hope that there's enough people there who are into it and stuff, so. How did the Sophie remix come about? We got asked, basically. Um, and yeah, that was it, really. We just got asked and then sent loads of stuff. I've still got all the parts for product. I've got like the whole album in parts. So I could do more of them if I wanted to, which I don't know, I might do at some point. Um, because I just picked out bit because it was the first thing I heard by her that I really rated. So, but yeah, I've got, there's a few others that I really like from, from product that I might be in a remix in at some point. But if I do with me, it'll just be for the crack, really. It's not, you know, there's no need for it. Mr. No Haircut, I respect that. Yeah, you're right, Alexi, this is correct. Don't even bother. How do you normally pass your time outside the studio? Well, I mean, it, outside the studio. Um, I'm never really outside the studio because I've always got my fucking laptop with me. So if I feel like just doing something, I'll do it. So there is no outside the studio anymore. Like I could have my laptop here and be doing tunes here. Although I wouldn't be able to talk to you a lot, so. What's that sample on Pro Radio? You said it wasn't a football or soccer sample. So what is it? I'm not telling you. You're supposed to figure it out. It's no fun if I tell you, is it? Fucking, where's the fun in that? Also, am I tripping or is there a voice in the second half of the track saying the song's name? Thanks. Um, yeah, you're tripping. Or well, maybe there is. Ah. Uh, you mentioned using Simplant on a track. Do you have any other notable digital Sims effects you use? Yeah, I only use Simplant on a couple of tracks. So, I was trying to figure out what they were. I think one of them's not actually released. And then there's that TS1A thing. I think it might be on that and all. Because um, I was using FS1R for a lot of that kind of wacky FM stuff back then and all. And then Simplant come out. And I did check it out and use it on a couple of things. But it gets old quick, you know, because it does what it does. And then, you know, you're just like, yeah, okay, it does that. So it's a bit of a gimmick synth, but I do kind of like those kind of synths in the short term you know so i will download stuff and check it out for a minute but they don't end up being like part of the tool set like i ain't had simplant for 10 year at least so um zebra was a good one i'd say zebra i'd still really rate zebra and it's old as fuck now but it was just a really good modular vst thing for a while um you know, generally the more flexible they are, the more I'm into them. And FM7 and FM8, just because they're good for doing dx -y stuff, but they're, like, so flexible and fast, you know, with the patch thing. It's um, it's a really good interpretation of Yamaha FM, I think. It's one of the best things Native have done. It's like... Because it's really kind of inspired. Um, so I, I, really, I really rate FM7 and FM8. I think they're really good. They're my, yeah, they're my favourite native things. Um, but yeah, I don't really check out a lot of VSTs now. I'm, I'm a bit shit, because I'm just using Macs for everything. So if I want to do something, I'll try and figure out how to do it in there. And I don't run any audio units or VSTs in Macs. Yeah, it's just a point of principle, really. Um, because there are some things where you think it'd be easier to run a VST, and quite often I'll find that my versions of them are better. Um, 
and yeah there's a lot of things that i would just wouldn't be able to run like synths and stuff like that they, they, they wouldn't work really because of the way our synths need to know in in advance what the duration of the note is and our sequences aren't outputting note offs they're just outputting durations so there's a kind of limit in terms of how much stuff we can use and no at least so far with the way midi works um a lot i'd say most audio units and vsts don't um effects units don't accept no information and that's really important to us that they can do that so because it's weird because like some midi stuff can do it like the quadriverb could do that it could receive midi note info and do things with it but you know it's weird that you can't do it with audio units and vsts and that but you know so all our stuff does that um and we kind of rely on it a lot because i think it's important so yeah it there's there's some hard limits on us using them but also just because i don't i'd rather build the thing and, and have my own version of it because then i can probably improve on on a commercial one um what keeps you making music i don't know like honestly like i'd love to know what why i want to keep doing it but i just do so i think if, if i got bored with it i'd stop because I, it is kind of compulsive for me to to make music i'm not you know, I don't really have a reason for doing it other than doing it. And I'm pretty sure if I had to get a shit job, if I stopped earning money off it, that I'd still be doing music all the time anyway, in my spare time. Because that's, you know, I was doing it for five years before we started making any money off it. Um, and before that, I was doing mixing for a few years. So, you know, for me, sitting in my room with my headphones on, kind of obsessively working on one little bit of audio, is just like, it's just so normal. It's like... I've been doing it since I was a kid, so, you know. Um, there's one I have called Convulator, which simulates a crusty voice call effect, which makes for a nice audio design. Okay. Do both of you run the same software at your live shows? Yeah, so, like, sort of. I mean, my version's a bit different to Rob's now. When we started out using this setup, it was pretty much the same. But Rob started adding features to his, and some of them I didn't want to add to mine because I felt like that they were a little bit... Not necessarily... Well, I wouldn't say unnecessary, but they were just, you know, the trade-off between kind of... Um, the feature working and it causing too much of a CPU spike wasn't worth it to me. So mine's a little bit more limited and bare bones than his. And as as time's gone on, he's just become a bit more mutant. So it's quite a different setup now. And when I send him updated versions, he has to kind of somehow fit him into his system, which is a lot of work for him. So, you know, I just keep mine as bare as I can. Um, and I'm always trying to make it more efficient and he's always trying to add more features. So it's kind of, I think we kind of balance each other out in some weird way. Um... Last time you described your live rig as having modules that would interconnect. Can you describe some of the essential modules? Not quickly. I mean, they're, they're, it's sort of hard to describe things because you sort of have to look at the patch, really. Um, I mean, some of them I can use very kind of vague descriptors. Like I could say, you know, a spectral compressor and you would know what that was. Um, but it wouldn't... You know, a lot of them you can't really describe in that sense because there's no precedent for them because they're weird. Um, I don't know, really. I, don't, I wouldn't know where to start with it. Um, I'm trying to think of one that's easy to describe, you know what I mean? Um, I mean, the ones that are easy to describe already, kind of, there's, there's some kind of... Uh, there's, There'd be something for you to refer to, so it wouldn't almost be, wouldn't be worth telling you about them, if you know what I mean. Like if I say a mono synth with a three or three type filter, you know you're gonna know what that is. So that's just you know what's the point in me even telling you about it? But yeah, the, that would be something that's in there. But the more esoteric, interesting things are, are just I don't really have descriptions for, um, because they don't really exist outside the setup. So. That's a hard question to answer, really, in in here. David Lynch is aware of you. Yeah. He's aware of everyone, though, let's be honest. 
you probably he probably watches you when you're sleeping through a meditation you know what i mean he has an out of body experience he can go anywhere david lynch can be anywhere and everywhere you described the latest track you've been working on through onomatopoeia or whatever uh That's that's as far as I'm gonna go with that. Um, do you have any preference with trackers, or do you have any recordings using them with A or Solo? Yeah. Um, there's a few tracker tunes in that last leak, actually. Um, quite a few of them are tracker tunes. Um, mostly Renoise bits, some Vox. Um, never used Mod Tracker, Pro Tracker, Optimed. Never used any of them. Never had an Amiga. It's not really my thing, trackers. But I have fucked with them a bit. Um, but I've got mates who are really, really into them and live for it. So, you know, and I, I like the sound of them, but I just get a bit bored with a list. And I think it, there's a thing of like making your tracks incrementally more and more perfect until they're done that I, I find a little bit just doesn't work for me I don't think like that you seem like a really nice guy thank you but I'm not really well I suppose I am a bit I don't know fucking hell don't say stuff like that can we get a peek into your studio no because I'm not there yeah I'm in Norway well I do have a studio here but it's not really a studio it's just a room with a desk two speakers and a laptop and a Kenton so it's basically like what you'd see on stage for me and nothing else so, and an interface, obviously, because, you know, you need that. And headphones. Do you use randomness in your tracks, or are your processes always deterministic? Here's a question. Fucking hell. Randomness. Yeah, so, like, I tried to avoid randomness for quite a while, and then I kind of embraced it, but in a very different way to just using the random object. Um. Everything's deterministic now. Everything's algorithm. So I, I have some. I have a thing that works. So it's got the same in, inlets and outlets as a as like the random object, but it doesn't behave in a random way. It's it's chaos stuff. Um, and it's really controllable, and you can seed it in very specific ways. So it's not quite random but it can give me if i need something that feels random i can make it i can get it into a state where it'll give me something that feels random but i know it isn't so yeah i'm kind of a bit funny about randomness in general but i think it can be good because i think quite often you know if you generate like 20 random things and you pick one and then you breed it with another thing and then you kind of create spawn from that that you can end up in territories and with results that are really interesting and good aesthetically um, and randomness is quite powerful in that sense um, but I think it just all depends on application and taste so I don't like the idea of just randomly generating a track and saying there it's done you know that's not I, I can't do that I know there is people who do that but it's just not for me so um, I used to be a lot more fiery about this topic than I am these days because I, I can understand why what the strengths are in noise, if you like. Um, but, you know, you have to direct it and you have to kind of be very aware of what it's doing and stuff. So I have a lot of respect for noise these days. What kind of person are you? How do you perceive yourself? What kind of person are you? I don't fucking know. Like, what kind of person are you? Well, I'm this kind of person. Yeah, I don't do that Twitter bio shit. So no, basically. How do you reckon you changed over the years? Um, I'm older. Uh, probably a bit smarter, hopefully, and maybe a bit slower as well. If if that makes sense. <laughs> Is that true about Lynch? <laughs> Zelensky. <laughs> oh no. I feel sorry for him. But at the same time, you, you know, you understand where he's coming from, don't you? You know what I mean? So, 
he just means well, you know, don't take it personally. Um, Badalamenti, I love Badalamenti, it's so kind of childlike. Um, <clears throat> yeah, he stuff's great. I love the Italian approach to kind of... I don't, I don't even know if he's really Italian. Isn't his real name Badello or something like that? Speaking about working outside the grid, what are your thoughts in Tidal Cycle? Yeah, nice. I like Tidal Cycle. I think it's quite a smart approach to pattern generation. Um, it doesn't really play nice with our stuff because of the no on, no off thing. But, um, yeah, it's good. Rate it. It's an interesting approach. Although I wouldn't call it outside the grid necessarily. It's just uh, application of differently sized grids, isn't it? How would you answer what is the meaning of life? Yeah, I wouldn't answer that. Alf 9X is one of the most beautiful things. Oh, thanks. I'm sorry, why am I just reading out compliments? That's no good, is it? Uh, what's your weakness? My weakness? Um, meltdowns when people are lying about stuff. Definitely. So now I've told you that, you're going to just start lying about stuff, aren't you, to, to trigger me, which will be really horrible and bullying, but, you know, I'm ready for it. Um, is Scam going to keep releasing music? Ask Andy about that. I expect so, because knowing Andy, he's just having a bit of a rest. Um, but I don't know, you know. I never know where he's at with stuff. But, yeah, you need to ask him, really, not me. Um, I'll take a live in Melbourne 28 was kind of like the Roadhouse as a venue yeah interesting have you ever do you ever feel like cranking out 20 hours of generative music and then just bleeding it out over a group of releases yeah uh, uh. bit unfulfilling isn't it so I saw you said you don't use step sequences so how do you approach your step your sequencing um I, d I just kind of build a thing that makes it that that makes a nice pattern and then when it starts getting a bit funky I start recording it but I don't know really it's just a bit weird isn't it these questions because it's sort of it's too open-ended and I have so many different things I try out all the time that you know, how I approach my sequencing, it's not really, I can't answer that succinctly anymore. There's prob there was probably a time when I thought I'd be able to do that, but I can't now. I just make too many different things. I don't really have an, an approach, you know. Um, I don't think I could have been doing it this long if, if I'd have had an, an approach. Rob doesn't either. We have habits, I suppose, because everyone does, but I'm not really a creature of habit, if you know what I mean. I don't kind of... I don't know. I think it's weird when people just keep delivering the same thing over and over. I get bored with artists who do that, so and I'd get bored of myself if I did it as well, so. Um Any more tracks or albums similar to Untilted in the works? I don't really know. It was a very different time in my life. Um I don't want to talk about the emotional stuff I was dealing with at the time, but it was I was in a really different place. Um, and also, like, you know, just the technology was different. My approach to using it was different. My feelings about aesthetics in general were different. So I doubt it. But it's not impossible that I might start to re-explore some of the same ideas because I do have things that I like that are kind of base things you know that I'll kind of revert to so yeah maybe have you seen the AE in the studio spoof someone's put on YouTube recently uh, yeah I have seen that yeah it's really accurate it's exactly what we're like um, so that was a bit scary because I think they might be spying on us, you know. I think they've set up cameras around the farm and stuff. 
Are you imagining things when making music? And it reminded me of Russ Abbott as well, which was great because, you know, I love nostalgia. Are you imagining things when making up music or are you just focused on the content technically? Um, yeah, a bit, a bit of both, really. I kind of, the content, it sort of, I, have, I can sort of see it and feel it and it triggers things and memories and thoughts and associations and weird images and... But also, you know, there's the sort of synesthetic thing going on. So I can kind of... Yeah, I don't know. I have a lot of stuff going on in my head when I'm doing tracks. You know, it sort of takes me off into some weird sort of internal spaces. I don't know. Uh, it's interesting that there's no end product to the Twitch streams. How in the moment it all was. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, my life in the studio is a lot like those Twitch streams. So it'll just be like one patch jamming out all day while I'm just tweaking it. And I love the kind of the never complete feeling. But at the same time, it's a bit, you've got to be, you've got to be careful with that. You know, you have to kind of capture things sometimes and then review them. Um, and they quite often sound different when you listen back. So, but yeah, I like the kind of impermanence and the sort of whatever it is drifting thing you know how did the Skeng remix come about I just got asked by Kev because he did me playing bits of pressure on a mix that I'd done and I think he was a bit surprised that we liked pressure and I really like pressure it's one of my favourite things he's done which is a shit thing to say I know because you don't want to just rate someone's first album but I really liked it Um. I love the kind of emptiness of it and how ghostly it is. Um, so, yeah, I'd, and I was kind of... I'd, he got in touch and I was like, yeah, man, I fucking love that. It's an amazing album. Are you serious? And then he was like, oh, do you want to do a remix? So, And then I hadn't actually heard Skeng because I weren't keeping up with stuff much. And then... So I'd listened through all the tracks on the album and I went, oh, yeah, that one. And I hadn't realised it was a, as big a tune as it was. And then... Um, and he was like, oh, are you sure? Because we've had a Code 9 mix of that already. And in, don't you want to do one of the other ones? And I was like, no, that's the one I want to do. Because I was like thinking to myself, no, that's the best track on there. I want to do that. So, um, so yeah, that's how that came about. I don't know. Do I like a lot of the bug stuff? Yeah, I mean, like, I like it when it's not that distorted and kind of screamy. Um but I also like that side of his stuff, and I, I feel like that's what he's where he is naturally. So it's a weird one with him. Um, but yeah, I like some of his really kind of drawn out, ambiente sort of weird drony. But I don't know what to call them. But you know what I mean, them things. But um, yeah, I don't know. I sort of I I think I prefer the the more kind of like. I I think pressure's my favourite thing he's done actually because it's quite bold as a statement you know um, anyone recording this to upload for Adam blah 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 <laughs> do you use much multiband compression no what I tend to do I don't really like multiband compression much and I'll only use it if I absolutely fucking have to because something's impossible to control and I don't like the way it fucks phase. I don't like I don't like things where the EQ's changing too much, but I will use sidechain EQ compression quite a lot. So where I've got the sidechain going through a brutal EQ and I'm only compressing it when that part of the spectrum's too loud, but I'm compressing the whole thing. So I think that sounds a lot nicer um, on individual parts. Um, you can even do it on full tracks and it'll give you a different feel. And a lot of my compressors have these, the ones I've done in MSP, have these sort of, I've built in kind of a similar, not quite Fletcher Munson, but like a kind of more similar to, um, it's got, there's like a bump at 3K and then a slightly bigger bump around 6K. And that's variable. So you can kind of... You've automatically got a kind of ear-based compression. 
thing built into the compressor. There's a sort of separate knob. Um, and some of them just got it built in by default. So, and I find that compressors where it, it slightly takes into account what the ear is hearing actually sound better. So if that makes any sense, if you know how to implement something similar to that, um, that's quite an effective strategy. And just even just have, like, having a, comp like when you do set up a compressor, just put in a little bump around th 3K on the side chain um, can be useful just as a default setting. Because you'll find that it'll kind of get rid of some of the more harsh elements of the sound, you know, without fucking the sound up too much. Um, what do you think of the two guy theory of electronic music? I don't really know. I think like some people work really well as solo artists and I think from, from a marketing perspective being a solo artist is a lot easier because you can play the kind of genius card so or the kind of ro rogue kind of different person. You know, you can be a snowflake, special snowflake if you're like one person. You can't really do that if you're two people. You can't have two geniuses. It doesn't really work like that, does it? So, but I think from a kind of, from a tracking perspective, it's definitely easier for me because, you know, I, I often, I'm not sure if things are good or not. Like, I'll think that they're really good, but I'm not sure how the rest of the world's going to react. And it helps having Rob around because he can sort of tell me whether or not they're shit. And vice versa i think it's good having another person to bounce stuff off because i figure if i like it and he likes it there's probably some number of people who would like it and so it's worth releasing if i like it a lot and he doesn't like it then i'll have doubts um because i trust his opinion because i know him really well and i only really can trust opinions of people who i know because i kind of know what their parameters are and you know, maybe I like their taste, I agree with their taste and their decisions a lot of the time. So even though they might be a bit different to me, I kind of, the fact that I know them helps me to understand their opinion. And like my other mates, it's the same sort of thing. If I play a track to Jed and he likes it, then I'll know that I'd satisfied that and that I'd managed to communicate to that type of person. You know what I mean? So, whereas opinions of people I don't know, I, I just don't know what to do with it. You know, it's just like... If I don't know you, then I don't really know what, how to understand your opinion. So, um, there's a lot of apparent warmth in sign compared to the previous recent albums. Any particular reason? Don't know. Like, maybe just the tech, because um, there's a lot of MC stuff used in sign, so, and a lot of kind of, a lot of the sounds were quite thick as a result of that, so that, that might be it. I remember reading that you had just using max gen and some c externals what kind of things were necessary to warrant coding into externals as opposed to regular patches um well originally like i don't use any c externals anymore i used to but i've redone all of that stuff in gen now so but anything that required single sample delay basically originally like filters and stuff because i didn't really know and feedback fm you know i didn't really know how to do that well, you couldn't do it with vectors, so basically I had to do that. But they were real basic things, you know. Um, just a few FM algorithms and a few filters, just basic stuff. Um, and I didn't really do any oscillators, but I wanted to do oscillators in C, but I wasn't quite up to it. And then, but I've got good enough to do them now, so I use Gem for them though. I just use Gen Expo, so. Um, yeah, oscillate. You know, anti-aliasing oscillators, um, which took me a bit to figure out actually. Uh, yeah, those things, stuff like that. You know, um, what's your favourite type of water? What does that mean? Type of water? Is that? Is it a joke, or is it about bottled water, or is it about actual? types of water on the chemical level because i kind of i mean my chemistry stops at gcse level so could ask my girlfriend she studied organic chemistry type music is macrotonal you knob who said that <laughs> what is that to me <laughs> thai music i don't know anything about thai music 
Um, do you find yourself romantic? And if so, in what way? Romantic. Romance. Romantic. I don't know, that's one of those fucking words, right? That's a little bit too vague. Like, I'm not sure what meaning of the word you mean when you ask the question, and I'm not sure how to answer it. You know, do... do you know, do you mean it from the point of view of sentimental, or do you mean that I like to just talk bullshit? I can't tell. Are they the same thing? Why, does, why do we have the same word for both of those things? That's pretty weird, right? Um, how do you think about tuning systems? Good with 12 to EDO? Or, I answered this in the last one. So, but yeah, you, the system can run with any arbitrary number EDO and you can mix and match EDOs in the same scales. So, and then you can just detune them arbitrarily, however you like, beyond that. So, yeah, I use all kinds of combinations of EDOs. Uh, would you ever do tracks on just hardware? But, you know, I like 19 and I like 31 EDOs because they're interesting. And they're sort of very similar to 12 tet in places. So, you know, you can kind of do other things with the weird overlaps that you find within them. So... But I'm sure you know that already if you're asking a question. Do you ever do tracks on just hardware again? Um, maybe? I don't know. Like, I don't really, I don't think I'm going to do a hardware track or I'm going to do a software track. I don't think like that. I think this whole hardware versus software thing is a bit strange. You know, so much hardware is digital anyway. Um, and so many of the techniques that you do in software are derived from analog techniques. So... There are, you know, there are areas where you can only do it one way or, or another way, right? Um, you know, like edge cases, which we can go off on one getting angle about, but I don't really find that very interesting, personally. I, I'm more interested in what you can do, like what I can do. It's like if you've got a synth, you know, you've got one synth, haven't you? But if you've got, if you're using software, you can have like 20 of them. And then you can have you can modify them all to be a little bit different to each other, you know that that I find that more interesting personally, just from a creative standpoint. So I guess I'd probably stick to using software for a while. I don't really see the benefits in hardware because hardware is like basically like software where you can't change anything apart from obviously you can build your own hardware. But again, with a lot of analog stuff, it's it it gets very time consuming if you want to build something that's got loads of voices or that's got a lot of flexibility um but not impossible and obviously if you've got unlimited funds it can just be something where you just amass loads and loads and loads of it but again working with it can be quite slow as well and then you have problems with stability and patch recall and these kind of things so but yeah i guess unlimited funds would mean that you could do it but you might it might still be quite slow to work with so i don't know I like just having a laptop and low power consumption, just having it in my bag and getting on planes without trucks full of gear and stuff like that, so. Do you see a value in ambisonic, ambisonic Dolby Atmos, binaural and such complex space things? Well, they're all different and like I can answer questions on each one of them individually if you like, but um, I don't think of it as a gimmick, no. I think, I think that there are good, strong kind of mathematical reasons why working with several speakers can be can be better in terms of determining source position even though you've only got two ears and even though you can do it in theory two speakers as soon as you put them in a real space where you've got walls and stuff like that um source location identification becomes harder if you've only got two speakers um than it is if you've got several speakers and that's for reasons i don't fully understand i've just looked at studies on it so yeah, I mean, there are reasons why you might want to use several speakers. Um, but also you can play around with it a lot, you know. Um, but I think the most interesting version of those types of technology is probably wave field synthesis. But I'm not sure um, that there are that many people who've taken advantage of it yet. So, And I don't see that as a gimmick at all. I think it's really interesting. Any health issues considering the long time spent sitting in a studio? Um, probably, 
yeah, I don't think that the health issues are caused by sitting in the studio, though. Um, but I don't know, actually. I hadn't really thought about it enough, you know. I mean, I suppose the great thing about laptops is you can use them anywhere, right? So you're not really sitting in a studio all the time. And I have a chair that's really adjustable. I think that helps. Having a chair where you can sit in a number of different positions and you're not, you know, and you're having your desk at the right height and having your screen in the right position so you're not overextended and that your arms are in the right position and all that, that helps a lot. So, but you know, you can get it wrong. And I'm sure a lot of musicians do. I mean, I see a lot of people's setups and I'm thinking, wow, your back is gonna hurt in 10 years. But you know, it's a lot easier if you're just using a computer, obviously. Um, right, I need a piss, so I'll be back at some point. Wait, how do you get this thing to stop? That's better. Relief. Yeah. Are you getting that Twitch money? Uh, probably eventually, yeah. I think they only send you a cheque when, when you've got like, when you've earned 100 quid or something. So I'm nowhere near that. So, you know, I'm not really relying on subscriber income here. But, you know, they sent me an affiliate link up after I'd done the long streams and I thought, yeah, fuck it. So, you never know, things might get really weird. I might have to turn into like a gaming streamer. Get, you know, like a Recaro chair and all that and a fucking stupidly expensive, pointless microphone. Tinnitus is destroying my ability to make music. Is it something you ever deal with? Yeah, it comes and goes, though. Like, actually, like, good strategies for dealing with tinnitus um, that I've found. Listen, <laughs> it's going to sound totally... This is going to sound really pretentious, but it does work, right? Is listening to Computer World by Kraftwerk on decent speakers and something about those little zap sounds the high q sound the them sounds cleans my ears out cleans my ear brain out but apparently tinnitus is like neural feedback loop so obviously like from how i understand it and i might be wrong about this because it's not my field obviously but it's the um you know certain hairs in your ears certain cells die off so that part of the spectrum drops out and then the, a feedback loop gets, gets, occurs in the brain because the brain's trying really hard to amplify that frequency and it, and it tries so hard that it, I think it resonates itself into self-oscillation. Um, but I found that not concentrating on it makes it go away, which kind of makes sense if you think about it because I think it's a tension that drives the internal brain amplification of that part of the spectrum. So, but you know, don't listen to me. I'm not a fucking scientist, so I don't know. Um, but yeah, Kraftwerk Computer World really helps me for some reason. Um, yeah. But you know, it's just nice to listen to it anyway, isn't it? You know, maybe it's just that I really like listening to it, so I'm listening to it in a certain way. I don't know. How'd you deal with preset management live? It's all patter. So like, yeah, it's all patter now. It used to be patter and then presets. So the global stuff was a patter and then the stuff in the modules was presets, but it got too unwieldy. I had to build, rebuild it all with patter. Plus I like being able to morph them because preset morphing is just tons of fun, isn't it? So, so it's all patters. And then I built a thing that where I can name them. So 
there's like a little box you just type the name in and click enter and it just saves it with that name so then i have like a u menu with all the names in and i found that loads easier to work with the numbers um so yeah it's patter all the way down but it's pat it's like a global pattern and then each module has its own patterns because the modules are loaded dynamically i couldn't have uh patter the global pattern reaching into the modules if you know what i mean so they all have to have their own pattern storage in each module but that's okay you know um what games would i stream i don't know you know it'd probably just be me playing centipede for like two hours or something like that which i'm sure would drive everyone mental um i don't know why i just really like these kind of repetitive groove games you know where you're just in a groove with it and you're just kind of doing a thing but there's just this constant variation i like centipede because it's never the same game twice you know um you can say that from most games really can't you but you know i don't know why centipede's my favorite game ever it's just so good um hot tub stream yeah that's not gonna happen partly because i don't own a hot tub but also because why why would you why wouldn't you stream yourself in a hot tub with something like champagne and stuff and rack out a few lines of uh, baking soda this is bordering on podcast half of what's on twitch already is it does that mean I shouldn't be doing it I don't know do you have the analog series on vinyl? Uh, no, I've got digital, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> I keep losing the chat. Right. I'm gonna. I'm just looking for interesting questions now. Do you want my machine drum? I don't use it. Don't give it to me. Fucking give it to one of these buds in the chat if you're serious, which you know you probably know, are you? So just making a point. Yeah, I actually lent mine out uh, to Mike, but I just got a bit. I reached a bit of a ceiling with it. I was a bit amazed when the machine drum came out because I was like, wow, this is like loads of techniques that we used to use on using different hardware like obscure combinations of hardware that other people weren't using but all together in like a box it was almost like somebody had listened to our stuff and then just made a box so that you could generate what we did so i was quite into it when it first came out but it you know once i'd kind of done everything that you could do with it i just thought yeah i've done that now but yeah rate them though i think they're good um, and I like, I really like that kind of kick drum modelling, whatever the fizz mod kick drum thing that's in there. It's just so nice. It, sometimes it sounds like a bit like a, you know, like when you tap a beach ball and it sort of goes, ding, ding, that sound. I love that sound. Because um, I don't know how they've done that exactly. It's different to my model kicks. My, mine are just membranes, so... They sound a bit, you know, they sound a bit more like an actual kick drum. But theirs is fucking well strange. Um, have you ever heard the hum? Yeah, I've heard of the hum. And, like, I've seen people talking about it. The one I really like was that Sky Trumpets thing. I don't know. I'm pretty sure it's fake. Because it's so fucking extreme. But, um, it's mad sounding. It sounds like metal grating. It's like a big metal plate kind of being... Um, dragged across the floor or something but it's got this weird like yeah I, I love the sound of it and I love it like whoever's done if it is fake whoever's done it, it's pretty good with the reverb and stuff because it does sound a little bit like a thunder reverb you know it's got that kind of <coughs> sort of distance you know but um, yeah I don't really know about the hum because the way I I figure that there's probably an awful lot of low frequency shit going on anyway without a known source I mean it'd be pretty easy to find a bunch of uh, potential sources for something like that surely unless I'm misunderstanding how it actually sounds you know 
I don't know. Maybe if you could post more info in the chat about it, I can speculate a bit better. Um, JJOS is brilliant. I don't really use it much though. Rob's the one to ask about that because he's really, he was all over it. I hardly used the MPC. I have got a 1000 at my house, but it was Rob's spare that after a bit he just left at mine. But I barely used it. But he was all over it. He loved it. I didn't quite get along with the OS. There was something I didn't like about it. But I know that on paper it's great because it's like an R8 where you can just have all your own sounds in and the filters are quite nice because they're those Akai filters. They're quite resi and sort of, they've got a good feel to them. And he's used them really well. Some of the tracks that he did with it, like Perlance, I think are just fucking amazing. Like really nice sounding, you know, beyond the composition being interesting and good. But yeah, Rob, Rob made some fucking amazing shit on the MPC. Pro Radii as well. Like all the beginning beats on that that he done just beautiful I think so yeah I, I do rate them but I rate them as a kind of spectator more than a user do your laptops communicate during live shows yeah um, not side chaining no um, we've, weirdly we've been discussing that recently so um, do we use OSC no we're just sending each other really basic stuff and using MIDI to send stuff back and forth so it's mainly numbers and everything like a like a kind of bit extender thing that I've built that just uses several MIDI channels to to give higher definition floats and stuff like that. So yeah, it's kind of bare bones, but it's it's quite reliable because you can use network MIDI then, um, which is if you're using Thunderbolt, is super fast. Uh, whereas OSC with its packets and stuff, it's not quite as good for timing stuff. But it would probably be better for sending floats around, but I'm not sure if it'd be tight enough for what we're doing. But yeah, I've thought about using OSC and not really used it for much. I've used it in the past. Um, maybe I should look at it again, because it's probably a bit faster now. We're on a much faster ports and stuff, so... I don't know how that works, really, with packet-based stuff. Would I say Super Collider is just as powerful as Max? Uh, apples and oranges. I mean... Um, yeah, I probably would, yeah. How much time have I spent in it? Not much since Super Collider 2 first came out, which is when I last had a bit of a go in it. Um, so I kind of looked at Super Collider 1 and I was like, nah, and then... I think it was Rich, actually, who said to me, like, nah, 2's a lot easier, you can just write... And then he sort of gave me some code examples for oscillators and stuff, and I was thinking, yeah, I'll have a look at it. And I did like 2, but again, like, I've moved away from doing the note on note off thing so I guess I'd have to think about sequencing differently if I was using it because the sort of layer between control rate and and um, I should say like yeah I don't know it's, it doesn't make sense to talk about super collider in that way I suppose but yeah like in max like con the difference between control rate and audio rate is sort of you know there are a lot more ways to, to get across that boundary Thing when there are in Super Collider, but I'm not experienced enough with Super Collider these days to, to to give you a proper answer on that. But I definitely like the sound of Super Collider; it's good, and it's probably better for doing some things. But I think that since Max now has dynamic loading in polys and stuff like that, it's and it the, you know the poly object offers you a lot of flexibility that you didn't used to have. So there's sort of there's been a lot of improvements in Max over the years that have brought it up to par almost with Super Collider in terms of capability and it just becomes about which aesthetic you prefer whether you prefer coding or whether you prefer visual programming and i'm definitely a better visual programmer than a coder but it doesn't help being dysgraphic really i have issues with text and text-based stuff it takes me a lot longer than most people to do that stuff Yeah, the transients in computer world, exactly, yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking it was, yeah. Uh, are you out in the sticks there? A bit? I mean, you know, there's trees and stuff, you know. This kind of thing. Trees. Much decent wildlife. I mean, we get deer, badgers. 
uh, loads of squirrels, uh, loads of birds, different birds, um, nutcrackers, uh, woodpeckers, uh, loads of different tits, tits everywhere. Uh, yeah, I don't know. These grey crows, I can't remember what they're called now. They're different to the ones we get in the UK. They're like grey and black. Um, jackdaws. Um, a lot of carvids actually. Magpies. Magpies nesting right behind the house. They've been there for generations. Same family. Pretty cool. Um, Favourite track from Amber? Hmm. Like my mind went to nil, like immediately, so I want to say nil. Uh, but there's probably, I, I like Pizzo, I like Montreal. Uh, how do you store and step through so many different harmonies in such a varied way? Ah, just, um, G1E1 I don't know, I'd have to look I'd have to load up the old rig because that's an old rig so I'd have to load it up and, and look at the what I had loaded up because it just depends on what the sequences were which I can't tell you off the top of my head I'm fucking shit at remembering things Um. Yeah, so I'll tend to send, I'll, I'll quite often I'll s save scales like in series. So I'll have like a bunch of them, like some number of them, and then some length for each one, and then it'll kind of go through them like that. But I think that track might have just been one scale. So it was a case of like pushing it into different harmonic spaces with a controller. I can't remember now. It, the, all the sequences that we build are a bit different to each other, so... Um, I don't want to fuck up the answer by just guessing. I'd have to... Yeah, I'd have to, literally have to load up this. I was going to say I'd have to listen to it, but I don't think I'd know from listening. I mean, I make them in such a way you can't really tell. Um, yeah. Too many versions of very similar sequences running, so... And then I'd have to just show you the patch because it sort of doesn't make much sense to try and describe how it works. But yeah, I mean, it was it would have been largely automatic with some user input because most of it, it works like that, where you need to kind of push it into a direction and then it will kind of do a thing, you know. Um, did you use Atari to sequence stuff in the early days? Well, when we first started, we were using just like the 202 and the 606 to do all the sequencing. So, and we borrowed, like, we'd borrow Simsoft Daz, like, we borrowed an SH, I think an SH2, and then a Karg MS-10, which we eventually just bought off him. Um, and then it weren't until we got the Juno, I think. Uh, we got the R8 first, and then that admitted, but we weren't using it. We were using the Roland tape sync off that into the 202. So we'd use that with those bits and then when we got the Juno we got an Atari uh, 1040 and then we were running C Lab Creator on that and then we used that as our main kind of hub sequencer for, for a long time so from kind of late 93 to no maybe earlier maybe like 90 when was it night when we did get the Atari it would have been 91 92 92 maybe it's hard to remember now. Yeah, probably 92. So, yeah, would have been 92. So then, yeah, so that, because we, before that, we'd worked in Dazzy's studio for a bit, because he used to give us keys to his studio. I had a studio above Dr. Rock in Rochdale on Drake Street. And when we started, when we met Daz, it was in the shop where he, because he worked in Dr. Rock. So we used to go in there and be like, trying to get fucking din leads and stuff you know and he got rob got talking to him about midi and we'd never used midi so daz let us in his studio this is in 89 so he'd let he'd give us keys we'd what i'd do is i'd i'd go from work because i worked in a shop 
in Rochdale at the time. So I used to, after work, I'd go into Dr Rock, Daz would wait for me, hand me the keys. Then I'd go upstairs to the studio, then Rob would arrive from his work, um, or sometimes I'd go and meet him at the station. And then we'd go in Daz's studio for a bit, and, it, and he had like a, a full MIDI studio. He had like a bit one, TX81Z, uh, DX, he had um, and Sonic VFX SD, um, an Atari running a few different programs. And the in, on the Atari was like, and he had an FZ1 as well and an R8. It's the first time we'd used an R8. And um, so a lot of that gear was new to us at that point. And his Atari had like Pro 24, something else. I fucking can't remember. Some other Steinberg thing. And he had C Lab Creator. And we tried all of them. And we really liked C Lab because it was patterns. And it was a bit more like using a drum machine, which was what we were used to. We'd only used the R8, that, uh, the, sorry, the 606 and the 202 at that point. So we didn't really know much. We didn't really understand timeline sequencing. I just found it a bit annoying. Um, and I didn't like Cubase. He had an early Cubase. I think he had Pro 24 and Cubase. That's what he had. And I didn't really like Cubase, but I liked C Lab Creator. So when we got our Atari, we were using C Lab Creator for ages. And that was like, that was good. I fucking loved that program. You could do some really mad stuff in there. Um, it had, like, you could save grooves and put them on other MIDI tracks and do stuff like that. So, and it had, like, the fact that you could mute channels, like, while it was running, was really good for, like, jamming out things live. Um, so it was a really nice sort of halfway house between a kind of live sequencer and uh, and I guess what you'd think of as like a DAW or whatever. So yeah, that was that was my favourite program for ages. And then when and we used that up until about halfway through doing chiastic slide, we got um, a Mac, and then we got Logic because Logic, as we understood it, was the kind of new version. And so it still had the event list from C Lab in there, which I really liked. Um, so yeah, we used Logic for a little bit towards the end of doing Chiastic. So there's a couple of tracks using it on Chiastic, but most of Chiastic was still the Atari. Um, and yeah, so like Cipeta was done on the Atari and New Ain was done on it. And I think the tracks that we did use in Logic were quite basic. So I think Recury was done using Logic and Pool was done using Logic. Um, yeah, I think the rest of it was Atari thinking about it. Maybe Sickly was done using Logic as well. Can't remember. I think it was actually, yeah. I think Sickly was Logic. So, And that's the kind of point where we stopped using the Atari really after that. I like LP5 was just Logic and getting into the, in Logic, getting into the Logic environment. And so that was our first foray into doing kind of I don't want to call it generative music, but, you know, like, this kind of slightly more automatic riffing on kind of arpeggios and, and kind of building our own little machines in there, like little sequences, building little sequences in the environments window, which I believe still exists, although I've not really used Logic much in recent years. But I think it's still in there somewhere. I think you can still do that. It's like a very rudimentary version of Max, and, and it was using that that somebody said to me, see me using that, a uh, guy said to me, like, oh, you'd probably like Max. And then I sort of started to explore that world a little bit more and ended up getting Max after that. So after we'd done LP5, got Max. And then, yeah. So, yeah, one thing leads to another. Uh, anyway, sorry, that was really fucking boring autobiographical nonsense that I'm sure you're not very interested in. I stopped the Helsinki gig. I saw you in Stockholm, the emergency exit signs were covered. Um, will EP7 ever get a reissue? That's a good question, yeah, we didn't think about that. Maybe we should... I, th I don't think so, because we've got that EPs box out there, and I think that that was Warp's attempt at dealing with the EPs, right? So I don't think that they're going to want to do individual EPs, given that it exists as part of that, and that you can get that at a pretty decent price at the moment still. But I don't know.
Yeah, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I talked about metal bands last time, but, you know, I like Confessor, early Confessor, like Condemned. Um, like Gargots, early, like Obscura, like... Um, yeah, I don't know, like, uh, I do like Necrophagist, yeah, because I quite like the fact that a lot of it's drum machine, and I can kind of relate to that. I like Sleep Terror, even though I always get fucking slagged off by Metalheads when I say that. I don't know why. I rate Sleep Terror. I like his sort of comedy aspects as well. I like his weird funk kind of beach music. I think he's quite cool. Um, like, yeah, I don't know, like, Cryptopsy, good, you know, um... You know, it's a bit hard naming loads of metal bands. I can just, you know, I can just reel off a load of old earache bands. I mean, I had this mate I used to work with, and he was really into like Deicide and Carcass and that. So I used to listen to a bit of that back in the day. Um, and when I was really young in school, like this lad I used to go to school with, Lee Fletcher, he was into Metallica and Megadeth and kind of 80s metal. So he used to give me tapes of that stuff, and I remember really liking Metallica the first time I heard them. I was like, fucking hell, it, they had a different sound to everyone else, a kind of chug. So, you know, I know I shouldn't be really naming Metallica in the list of metal bands I like, but I've got to be honest, you know, I was only 14, so, you know, it's fair enough, isn't it? Uh, have you ever used any machine learning? Yeah, a bit. I mean, I fuck around with Mubu a bit. Um, yeah, Mubu is super interesting, actually. It's one of the more interesting ERCAM technologies, I think. It's worth an explore if you're into that kind of thing. That's all I'm going to say about that, because I don't want to get too... I don't want to have a big conversation about machine learning. I think it can be used well. I think it's all about curation, ultimately. But I think, you know... There's going to be so much shit art made as a result of machine learning existing that... I know that any opinion that you have on it right now is going to date badly. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what your opinion is, you know. I mean, it's almost impossible to have an opinion on it, really. Um, is there a concept behind every article? Well, if there was, I wouldn't talk about it. Um, but there isn't, so stop asking. Um, can you recommend any good resources for Gen Expert and anti-alias and in Gen? No. Because I had to fucking dig through loads of examples of other people's C code and try and figure out how they were doing things. Um, most of the techniques for doing that stuff, like Hollyblep and MinBlep and, and um, EPTR and all them, are well documented online and you can easily find examples for all of them so I'm not going to bore you with links um, yeah took me fucking ages you know <laughs> hard work <laughs> it's fucking really hard work but worth it because I've got oscillators that are different to all you lot now so that's good Unvaries in frequency from 40 hertz to 125 hertz, roughly. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know, man. I am. You know what? I don't think I've ever, ever heard it, but I don't. I don't think I've ever not heard those frequencies, because you know that they're just present all the time anyway, just from air moving, right? So, like, if you just look at a spectrum from a decent microphone, you're gonna see a shit ton of just activity down there anyway. Because it's just always there. I don't think you can really get away from it. So I'm not sure that the hum is a thing, but willing to be proved wrong. If you can get a recording of it, that'd be really cool. Maybe it's just a brain thing, in which case I can't help you. Well, maybe I can, I don't know, eventually. Favourite tricks with Boss RSD10? Yeah, besides the obvious, like, the pitch input. Um, but even just using it as a pitch delay is quite fun. I think you can hear all that stuff on Lego feet, to be honest, because we'd pretty much done it all by then anyway. Um, but that original Accelera track, which 
was originally it was called Ripping Circuits. That was Rob's track from '89. That was like the first time that we'd done that pitch thing, and it was really cool because like, like on the 202, if you was if you was using the 202 as, a, as to generate the square wave for the pitch input, and then you had your sample in there, and then you started adding resonance to it, it just start losing it slightly and getting really good. So yeah, that was the that was the favourite. And then like discovering that if you use the sample itself as the source of pitch, right? So you get that feedback loop going. Um, and just in general, just fucking around with the square wave in different ways. The, in, the pitch input square wave, fucking around with that in different ways to try and get it to do different things. Um, and re-triggering it as well, like at the same time as that, like using the trigger input from the 606. But, you know, th these are all quite obvious things, I think, if you've got one, because you've probably tried all these. So I don't know beyond that. Um, yeah, that was our only sampler for quite a long time. Like, that that Destroyer of Worlds track was done just using that as a sampler done on the 4 track. That's why it took so long. So, like, all the sounds were, like, sampled on that and then just triggered on that. Um... I remember reading once that the first Stereo MCs album, that 33, 45, 78 or whatever it's called, that that, that was done with the RSD-10 as its main sampler and being totally amazed, like how the fuck? That must have just took forever. It's quite a well produced album that. Um, Favourite British comedy TV series? Do I have to kind of narrow it down like this? Um, I mean, I've got favourites that are favourites for very kind of personal reasons. I really like Armando Iannucci shows. Um, I've got some, some that you might have missed that I used to really like that people didn't really check much. Um, the Paul Merton shows, the first two series of the Paul, of Paul Merton's were really good. There were some fucking ace bits in there. Um, I used to like Absolutely back then as well. Absolutely, you know, the Scottish series. I used to like that. There's one sketch in the first series where they're trying to get the remote control for a telly and they can't quite reach it. That I love. I still love that. I think it's amazing. There's some really good Absolutely stuff. Just fucking really silly stuff. Um, especially the George and Donald bits, really good. Um, yeah, I like comic strip. Uh, I like, you know, there's some comic strips I really, really like. Mr. Jolly Lives Next Door, uh, Fistful of Traveller's Checks, uh, Gino. Uh, I mean, I like probably like most of the early comic strips, but like they're the ones that I really remember fondly. Um, yeah, Supergrass is quite good and all. Um, the Yob, obviously. Um, I think, like... I don't know, I mean, I liked a lot of British comedy growing up, so... I like Vic Reeves, you know. Um, I really like the second series, like, after Big Night Out, wherever it was called, like... The Smell of Reeves and Mortimer or whatever. The one with, like... Master Chef, <laughs> that, that is fucking amazing. Like, just with his head and stuff. Um, I'm trying to think. Like, I'm, I know I'm missing stuff here. That's like, oh, Fifteen Stories High. That's kind of underrated. Really like that. Um, obligatory Chris Morris and Partridge mentions because you can't not mention them but they're so obvious to me now that I feel like just even mentioning them there's no point but the day to day was life changing it was just utterly amazing at the time I mean if I had to pick one series out of all of them it would probably be the day to day just because it was so dense and different and so fucking it was like it was like the good bits of Robocop but times a million you know just fucking amazing um yeah don't know there's too many things that i like you know like really is too many things like there's a couple of peter k in that the early sh the the first series that peter k thing the ice cream man one i love that um 
yeah, there's like quite a quite a bit of Peter Kay's really early stuff was was amazing actually. It's a shame that he sort of gets dissed now for being a kind of observational comedian because he was doing amazing observational comedy but in in a di totally different pseudo documentary format way better than most people were doing it you know back then it was just so well observed but i guess maybe growing up in the same part of the world gives me a different view of it than a lot of people so you know i can see how well observed it is anyway i don't want to god i could just just talk about comedy all day here but maybe there's nothing wrong with that i don't know I feel like I'm excluding everyone who isn't British, though. Um, any pieces of vintage or new hardware I'd like to own? Not really. I don't feel like the need to own anything in particular. I don't really... I don't... I know I should. I should be like, oh, yeah, I really want a Roland System 100 or whatever it is, you know. Oh yeah, I'd really like a first generation Korg MS20. You know, I'm not like that really. I just tend to work with what I've got. No way, Vectroid. Hello. Um, I just want to say those Twitch streams where you sample TV commercials are mad inspiring. Oh, come on, you was doing Vaporwave before I was, so I'm not going to take that from you. But thank you, you know, and respect Mac Plus. Um, do you guys chuckle at how long it takes for fans to get your albums? I think, yeah, I mean, sometimes it takes us ages to get it, you know what I mean? We'll do stuff and just rack it up, and then it won't be for another year that we'll realise it was quite good. So, you know, I can go off things quite quickly after doing them and then get back into them later. So, you know, I don't hold it against someone. And also don't think, you know, I don't think all our stuff's that hard to get. I think some of it's quite instant. I think some of it is a bit more like they're growers, you know. And we know because they've had to grow on us before we got to a point where we think that they're releasable. So, yeah, I, I don't really... Reaction to Quarrus Dis was quite hostile originally. Yeah, I think it probably was. I think because we'd gone from doing untilted type, hyper-sequenced, very kind of DAW sequencing to, to doing these rough hardware jams. So it's not surprising. I think people kind of get an idea of, of what it is that you're doing and they start to rate you on a technical level or rate you in terms of how much effort you're putting in that they can perceive. And then when they don't get that from your next release, they'll be like, oh, this thing is missing. But I, I don't really do that with music. I tend to think get more excited about what's there than what isn't there because there's obviously a lot less there than isn't there. You can always talk about what isn't there with music. Do you know what I mean? You could say like, oh didn't like that metal album because there weren't enough pan pipes in it it's like well yeah but you know there's loads of things that aren't there in there you know what i mean there's no opera singers either or you know whatever mouth organs or whatever it is that's not on that album you know what i mean it's just so i don't find that very useful but i get that other people might expect something from you and then you don't give it to them and then they're like oh well i haven't got the thing that i thought i was gonna get but you know yeah I don't think we're making stuff in that way though, so it's not about, it's not a competition really. It's not like we have to have a load of boxes ticked for things that are there, if you know what I mean. Um, just whether you're vibing off it really, isn't it? So. My phone's getting too hot. It's going to start complaining in a minute. I was just blasting Piso really loud. Thanks. No, I like you guys as much as I, DJ. Thank you. That's high praise indeed. Um, fucking hell, I'm so much behind in the chat again. This always happens because I'm being too good trying to answer all these. Somebody's highlighted the, the message. Right, okay. <laughs> I think I might just have a policy of not reading the ones I highlighted. Original copy of Confield I got off Soul Suit was missing Parallelic Triangle. Oh yeah. Well that's what you get for downloading albums on Soul Seek. Um What do you see as the next big technological step in music creation? Ugh.
How long have I got to think about this? Because it might take me five or ten minutes, so... I don't know. Something that we're doing, probably. Do you like recent Frusciante stuff? I, you know, I don't really know his stuff very well, but I believe he's a, he's a, he's a fan of ours, so that I do appreciate that. Um, I used to see, when I was working in the shop, because we had tellies in the shop, because it sold tellies, because it was that kind of shop. Um, you know, we used to have MTV on a lot, and I used to see Chili Peppers on there, and I used to think, yeah, it's not bad, this. Like, it weren't really the kind of thing I'd go out my way to check, but, you know, I liked the funk and the drums and the movement in it, so there were some elements of it that I could I could get behind. So it was quite refreshing to read that he was a fan of ours. Um, but other than that, I don't know, because I'm just not familiar enough with that kind of stuff, so... I'm in a bit of a bubble these days in general, so that doesn't help, but I should probably just check out a load of their stuff and then I'd have a, more of an opinion on what I think of his having a, an opinion. <laughs> I don't really know, but obviously it's like, um, it's super humbling because he's really gone out of his way to shine a light on us and I, I do really appreciate that. So, you know, yeah, thanks, basically. Um, Is it disappointing how predictable and safe most music is? Or where mainstream internet culture went? That's a big question, isn't it? Bloody hell, internet culture. So we're going to talk about the early days and when everyone were goons and when Beta first started out and then what happened after that. Don't think I really need to. I think you all know the history of the internet, right? I mean, you don't need me to give you a kind of shit version of that. It's weird seeing people discovering shit posting on Twitter and thinking it's a new thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because <laughs> we were used to shit post on Usenet. You know, I was shit posting when these kids were zygotes. Fucking hell. So, that's funny. But you know, like, it was bound to end up like this. I think what bugs me the most is all the, all the manipulation really and all the kind of the kind of political stuff gets me down a bit because I don't really enjoy it on socials anymore I think it's it's just a lot of outrage and people getting upset about things without really asking why they're they're so upset you know I think people are quite happy to inherit opinions and I think you know I believe that the reason conspiracy theories are so popular is because they confirm pre-existing beliefs you know and people want to be spoon-fed a reason for for their kind of prejudice a lot of the time and there's pe other people who want to capitalize on that and i don't like that do i think music's predictable and safe i mean this is a hard one because i've i've kind of I've, I've since being a kid i've i've seen group behavior is something that excludes me and i can't I don't really understand it a lot of the time if lots of people are saying and doing the same thing. So I don't want to criticise people for wanting to be in the group and wanting to get the approval of the group. You know, that's something that is important to them. And, th you know, they're wired differently to me. So, you know, I can't criticise people for being like that, but I'm not like that myself. So, you know, it's not, I'm not coming at it from the angle of being critical. I think I was when I was younger and I didn't really understand as well how the world works. You know, I used to think, why is everything so shit? But now I realise that it's because everybody wants to fit in. Um, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not disappointed by how predictable and safe most music is. No, I'm not. But it's just the way it is. It's always going to be like that. I think it's always been like that as well. So, um... I thought things would get more interesting fearless based on early interactions, iterations of the internet. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think people's... I mean, identity is a big part of this, right? So, 
because I think early on, the, you know, the in, on the internet, identity was more diffuse, and you could fuck around with your identity and experiment with different identities to some extent, right? You weren't tied to your real name and your job and your fucking location and all your real friends, and like that wasn't how the internet worked at all. So, and being free from that was really liberating for a lot of people, especially weirdos like me, you know. Um, and we've lost that to some extent, and where it does exist, it's just the hell holes now you know they didn't used to be but they, they kind of become that really um because it just offers you free license to be a cunt all the time and that's you know that's not going to be good if you've got a lot of people who've got that urge in one place things are going to be a bit weird um but you know for a while it was good while identity was diffuse and people were creative and trolling was creative everything was creative memes were creative you know it's not like that so much now. Memes are just shitty reaction images that you download from a reaction images website. So, the fuck is that? You know. Just the way the words change as well. Like just the word trolling, the way that changed over, over time, and the way that the word meme now just means like a shit picture of something. You know. Anyway, I'm not an expert on internet culture, so, you know just an average bloke who's been on the internet for way too fucking long um, and I'm not that average I don't even know if I'm an actual bloke to be honest I don't know what the fuck I am so every time I hear about logic I start to wonder if I made the wrong move going all in on Ableton nah like you know depends on what you're doing and, and how you want to do it um, but yeah I like logic better I'd use logic if I could run max patches in logic I'd use logic like, and, you know, nine times out of ten. There's a lot of stuff I can't do in Ableton that I find just totally infuriating, like selecting stuff. The fact that it doesn't have... A, like, if you want to just arbitrarily select a number of regions in your, in your tune and move them, but they're not contiguous, fucking good luck with that. Can't. Like, and I've complained to them about it, and they said, oh, well, that code's so old, it's just going to be very hard to update it now. And I thought, well, fuck, <laughs> you know... But, you know, there's things about Ableton that are really good. The, the workflow's really fast. The groups thing is phenomenal. It's really powerful. Um, being able to have racks, racks of different synths in the same instrument is really cool. So there's things about Ableton I think are amazing. And there's other things that I think are really weirdly babyish. And I don't understand their choices. So, like, it, it just depends. You would find, I think, if you'd grown up using Ableton and you then went to use Logic, you would find it laborious to do some very basic stuff that you got used to having in Ableton and vice versa so you know apples and oranges really gotta stop saying apples and oranges right um, there are way too many questions about fog shaking I do appreciate them though Do I have any tips for people interested in doing visual art with visual programming tools these days? Nah, I'm not the man to ask about this. I believe VVVV is very good, um, and I believe processing is very good. I don't use either of them. Um, so, I'm not. Can't see shit. Right. Am I still in contact with Tartus? No, you know, it'd be good to be, though. I always really like John um, and Bundy. I think they're fucking good. I was in, more in touch with Casey for a little while. Casey Rice. He's there, mate. But I ain't seen him for ages either. Fucking flake in here. <laughs> but, um, yeah, Tartus are good. Like... I don't know what happened with Tartus, actually. I don't know where they've gone. <laughs> Are they still doing stuff? I'm shit at keeping up with stuff. Fave Ween albums. Yeah, I mean, um, probably Pure Guava, because it was like my introduction to them. 
So, and I, at the time I was just pure electronic listening. So a lot of the kind of drum machiney ones were a bit of a way in, and I liked how well made it was, and it was obviously like thrown together. But um, yeah, I got more into the pod a bit later. Um, and Mollusk is good, but it's sort of it's it's more of a concept album, I think. Um, but it's good. I mean, I really like uh, Buckingham Green, but I like the demo of it more than I like the version on the album. Actually, the the really long extended demo version of it, I think, is amazing. Um, and I like the I like them when they're a bit rougher and not so overproduced. I got um, the Country Greats album, and I thought it was fucking hilarious, but also a bit like it had a short shelf life for me. Cause just because I'm not really into that kind of music but I thought it was such an anal project to do um, but in general yeah I'm a big Ween fan I really like Ween um, and I've seen them live um, in the 90s and they were just fucking I think they were so off their heads they could barely like keep their faces in a, in a kind of rational they were like this but they might have just been putting it on but yeah, a mate of mine used to tour manage him a bit. Um, this guy know, and he knows him pretty well. But yeah, big green fan, big green fan. Like I love how anal it is, and I love how careful they are, and how well they can nail other artists' vibes without actually doing an impersonation of them. You know what I mean? So, and yeah, dodgy subject matter and all that um, just makes it a little bit more fun. Because it's so absurd, it just becomes really absurd that you're listening to a song about whatever it is, you know, shit or fucking incest or whatever it is, you know, child abuse. They're not good topics to make songs about, but they somehow managed to make it not uncomfortable. Um, yeah, I don't know, it's perverse as fuck, we, and I think you have to have quite a twisted sense of humour to enjoy it, really. Musically as well as kind of thematically. Um, have I thought about things like Patreon or Bandcamp subscription? Uh, no, maybe I would if I didn't have any money. I don't know. Do all right. I mean, we, we do pretty well off gigs and stuff. So, is there a major shift in your method methodology around the transition from untilted to choristers? What was going on behind the scenes? Yeah, I mean, fucking hell. Um, a lot of stuff for me. I mean, I mean, my dad died in 2004, so that was a blow. And that sent me off on a weird spiral of not knowing where the fuck I was or who I was. And then a lot of stuff that my family had kept from me came out. And then we toured. And then I'm not going to talk about any of that stuff, so don't ask. And then, um, and then me and Chantel split up 2005 and then I moved to Manchester and I hardly had a studio for ages because we were just doing gigs for money. So um, for about three years I didn't really have a studio, I just had kind of a live set up on a desk in a room and my speakers and a, and a mixer and I was building the studio up slowly while we were doing that. So of course this is the sort of sound of me putting my studio back together plus a few tracks that I did on my laptop in Renoise, sort of mixed in there. So like Fall 3, Fall 4, WNSN, uh, Rail, they're all Renoise tracks. Um, and then there's a bunch of like Rob's MPC things, you know, Rob was doing like MPC tracks. And then, yeah, I don't know, like, that was a bit fierce. So, yeah, I don't know, like, a bit, bit of a mixed bag, really, of, of things happening, you know what I mean? Um, but I was enjoying being in Manchester in my new space and feeling quite free and liberated and not really wanting to work with DAWs because I, I felt like I'd reached a bit of a ceiling with that and I didn't really want to go much further into it. I started getting a bit bored with timeline sequencing, started just wanting to do things in the room and have a bit more of a live vibe to them, which was a bit more like a return to roots which is the kind of thing you do when you've just split up with your wife that you've been with for 10 years, you know what I mean? So um, so in a lot of ways, I was returning to my roots, really, you know, go, going back up to Manchester and then doing all that. I hope that offers some 
understandable context for that. Were you a fan of Captain Beefheart when you put Magic Band on at ATP? Yeah, of course. I wouldn't have put them on otherwise. But um, that Mirror Man Sessions has been a favourite for a long time. Um, and I really like John French. I really like his drumming. But I wasn't expecting him to get on stage and start singing like Beefheart. That was weird. But, okay, that's what you want to do. You jump French. It's fine, you know. Um, I mean, he did most of it. Um, if you know, you know. Um, and yeah, it was just such inventive music. Just amazing. And his drumming is fucking brilliant. It's just amazing, amazing drummer. One of my, you know, all-time favourite drummers. Just, just beautiful. Just amazing sense of timing and his micro-timing and his groove and the way that he's decided to flop his grooves over slowly over the course of this... Like these jams from Miraman were like 15 minute jams where the loop's just changing slowly and kind of, it's just right up my street. I love that shit. But um, so much funk, you know. Um, yeah, I think he really gets it. So yeah, we're a huge fan of theirs. Huge, huge fan. Um, Twitch streams was a good way of embracing internet media to release your music. Thought about doing this more. I mean, to be fair, I mean, that happened kind of organically. It wasn't like I had the thought to do it. It was just that I was doing the mix of our streaming and we've been doing streaming for as long as we've, it's been possible to do streaming because obviously coming from a pirate radio background makes you want to do, you know, it's just we're just into doing broadcasting in general. We've always been into it. and. Yeah, as soon as it was possible to do decent radio streaming, we were doing it. Using At first, we were using, like, um, what was it called now? I can't even remember what it was called. People still use it as well. You can stream from it on your computer. <laughs> this is like a fucking... It's not like I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, but, yeah, we, we basically, you'd be streaming directly from your machine. So not via a server, and then I'd, I'd, you know, so you'd have like all kinds of overhead bandwidth issues with that. But it was fun for a while, and then um, actually, I think Alexi still uses that shit because I've seen I've seen his streams are like that same platform, and then yeah, started using UStream, and then for a bit when that first came out, and then. Um, yeah, and then Mixella. So, like, after a few weeks of doing that lockdown streaming, it got to a point where I was thinking, well, fuck it. Um, people, no, it was Phil. Asked if we'd do some video streaming on Twitch. If I'd stream my fucking obscure experimental film and video collection and video art. Because I'm quite into video art on the quiet. I don't talk about it much, but I've been for a long time. So he wanted to. He wanted me to do that. So I went on Twitch and started streaming that shit. And then that got a bit boring. And then I started playing films. And then people were saying to me, "Yo, yo, you're gonna get cancelled off here if you don't calm down with the copyright strike." So I thought, okay. So then I, I thought, well, maybe I'll just stream some of this shit jitter stuff that I mess with sometimes. So, and it just came out of that, if you know what I mean? So, yeah, it was a big decision to get on this cool platform and do it. It was just that I, know, I knew that you could stream video on Twitch and you'd probably get away without a strike if you just did it on the DO, you know, if you only had a few people listening. But it started to get a bit out of hand, so... And then it wound down again, and then I got bored, so that was that. You recommend a good cheap FM synth? Uh, you mean a hardware synth? I don't know anymore. I'm so out of the loop. You, you just ask ask any other person than me. Because I just... I just use Max for everything now. I mean, cheap FM synth for me would be Max because I won't have to buy anything. I just build one. So um, I'm desperate to leave the UK. Can I be your gardener? I'll live in your shed. We don't need a gardener. Um, but 
but yeah I mean like if you want to leave the UK just leave the UK it's surely not that difficult you know um, it is weird not living in the UK for a while it's different out here you know not in a bad way but just very different did you ever hear any Norwegian folk music only bits of like I mean no not really no um, because I wouldn't call it Norwegian. Is that an owl on the door? Yes, it is. Well spotted. Um, for those interpersonal questions, what one says about oneself is the opposite of truth. So I invert the statements. What? trying to work out what you mean by that but yeah I mean I can't I think it's more what you want other people to think right I mean it's not necessarily not true you might just have identified the one thing that you think is worth saying so you might be saying that so yeah I don't I don't buy that it's the opposite of the truth you know I'm not this isn't like some KGB propaganda channel do you like FSOL's new stuff um not heard much of their new stuff, actually, for a bit. I've got that stacker out, that Humanoid album, um, on Detuned, whenever it was, a couple of years ago. It was really good, I thought. It was really, really good. Yeah, so I like that a lot. Um, but I haven't heard any other FSOL bits for a bit. I've just been keeping up with that stuff, because that's more on my tip, really. Um... What are we talking about reverse polarity for, by the way? I don't know what that's about. Do you have separate tra tasks when performing live or do you both deal with everything? Yeah, yeah, we do have separate tasks. We have, so we've got two rigs running concurrently, synced, and we're running different stuff on each one. So just depending on what bits we're running. So yeah, yeah, different stuff, but when you say tasks, I don't know what you mean exactly. Because obviously, like, I suppose you could break down the music into constituent elements and say, oh, this is a rhythm bit and this is a melody and who does the rhythm and who does the melodies, in which case, you know, it's just, yeah, we do deal with everything because we, both of us are working with all kinds of different material. But it's sort of like, you know, it fits together, if you like, like different things that fit together. Um, how much hard drive space do you have? Just quite a bit, because hard drives are quite cheap now, so, you know, you can get like a 12 terabyte drive for a few hundred quid, so, you know, it's, sky's the limit, really. The music doesn't take up much space, does it? It's not like video, so. Do you have an organisation principle for all your files? Yeah, I mean, I tend to label them with stuff, but, you know, you can tag stuff in macOS, so you can just tag everything with multiple tags so yeah I use that quite a bit um, and yeah that's it really I don't know I don't know what to say about that you don't have to do a lot of organising because you can usually just derive a lot from dates and because I've got like so the the system or the rig or whatever all the, the folder of patches is sort of saved as, as a zip every time there's a modification so I can easily find which version of the rig I was using for the track because the track's creation date will be just part of the metadata for the track. So um, it's quite easy to get through it and figure out what's what. Um, do you have a lot of old files from the 90s or do you let them disappear whatever over time? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it, it, it's different formats. So I've got them, like I've got all the ASR discs and I've got all the DATs, but they, you know, things decay and stop working after a while. So, and I don't maintain it very well. Rob's a bit better at maintaining his, his kind of archive than I am. Um, I'm not that concerned with it, so. 
you know, if things die, they die. It's just part of the story of how things went. So I quite like that. I like memory being imperfect. I don't feel the need to record everything. I don't go around with a camera taking pictures of things and stuff. I like not quite being able to remember things. Yeah, I like that better. Um, aren't you using computers like Mac MSP? Yeah, we are. Um, I use auto files to fertilise the earth. Yes, that's quite a novel approach. Why doesn't Bob make an AMA like you? Is he shy? No, he's just doing family stuff. He's like, he's busy all the time. He's busy doing patching and tracks and trying to keep up with my shit and doing bits for the live set. I'm sure you could coax him on here though. I don't think it'd be that hard. He's not that shy. He's just a bit, um, I think he just, maybe he just wouldn't enjoy it as much. I don't know. He's not really shy. I think he'd probably just see a lot of these questions and be like, oh, fuck off. Um, have you watched Limmy Show? Yeah, I like Limmy Show. Okay, no, I didn't mention Limmy, did I? When I was talking about comedy. Yeah, Limmy's top. Fucking hell. How can you not like Limmy? Yeah, really creative, I think. And his characters are brilliant. Like, just really good, 3D as fuck. Even the ones that only appear in, like, one sketch. They're just fucking really good. They're, like, super 3D and real. They're, like, real people. So I think he's really good like that. And it's a shame he, has, he isn't doing more TV stuff or sketches or whatever, you know? Because I think he's really good at playing different people. So I love Dee Dee. I think he's brilliant. He's so real and kind of identifiable. I know so many people that are. But even that Benny Harvey sketch, like, where they're both wigging out to that a heart tracker, like, I just recognise it. <laughs> totally recognise it. It's mad. Like, I think it's weird, Limmy. He sort of, he manages to pull things out of me unconscious that, that they're almost like memories. You know, it's brilliant. There's one at a party where someone's, like, totally off their head and they're just talking to some other bloke and the other bloke's just going on about people in soap operas. <laughs> oh, fucking hell. That's so good. Yeah, there's some shit in Lemmy stuff that's just nailed something. I don't even know where he gets it from. Well, obviously he gets it from his life, you know. I don't know why I'm saying that. It's silly. It's just good that he has the same sort of thoughts as, as I do about some things. Some things. Yeah, really good. I really rate him. I think he's really good. Um, Reeves and Martin, the nightclub sketches. Fucking hell, yeah. Um, the Reeves and Martin... Right, the ones from... I, f I think, because you said Big Night Out, but I'm assu I assume then, when I read that, I thought you meant the ones with fucking... What's his name? What's his fucking name now? <laughs> They've got the one bloke who's grown up in Hong Kong and he talks with a Chinese accent. And then you've got the other, the, the guy who's like, that guy, what's he called now? The guy who manages that band and the band are called like Mandate and they're singing about salmon and stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's just amazing. Shit, no. Okay, so... You mentioned being neurodivergent during the last AMA. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to go on about this too much. So I've got to rub my eye. Fucking cry laughing, thinking about Vic Reeves. Um, yeah, so, any tips on how to get through the day routines, getting stuff done, thanks a lot. I'm not, like, I'm not, I can't start giving out CBT tricks and all that, because it's just different for everyone, and I'm not, like, I'm, I'd never do that. I think you just got to, like, work with somebody who understands you, really. I think that's the key thing, um if you can find somebody to work with who understands you. I don't mean work, work. I mean, if you want to work on strategies for, for coping and stuff. Um, don't let it get you down is the main thing for, I mean, I was lucky, right? Cause I didn't know for a long time, I didn't know. And I had the validation of the world. So I, had, I kind of had an outlet from quite an early age. Um, and I was lucky that because I had the typical thing of being advanced in primary school and then getting into middle school and then suddenly hitting a bit of a brick wall academically. 
So I did I had really good scores until I was about eleven. I was like top of top of the school more or less. And then I was eleven and then I went to middle school and then things got suddenly quite difficult. And but I also had music and doing tapes and doing editing and there was a point to me kind of being obsessive and suddenly my obsession got diverted into all this electro and doing pause button tapes and all that kind of stuff and then buying a sampler and you know I would get an approval from my mates in school because electro when I was so this is like 83 84 when electro was big and I started first doing tapes you know suddenly people were talking about me as a DJ in school they were saying oh he's a fucking DJ and that was really good for my ego and didn't you know it didn't matter that I was different to them suddenly it didn't matter that I was outside the group because I was like getting respect for what I'd produced when I was outside the group if you know what I mean so it really helped me to have that um, and it's probably why I clung onto it so tightly for so long and was so obsessed with making it work you know um, so yeah and I didn't know until much later that you know Asperger's and HFA whatever they're not like it's not necessarily like a diagnosis that you have to worry about it's only if it's affected your life in a negative way so I didn't really need to know because there wasn't really anything I needed to tweak and by the time I found out about it I'd learned enough just through trial and error and experience learned enough strategies for dealing with people and social dynamics and I'm quite good at picking emotions up in people it's not like I'm insensitive to that stuff it's just that I don't quite I quite often don't know how to behave in response because that those things aren't hard coded in me so I don't know some some I find some types of social interaction easier than others I find it much easier to deal with somebody in on in like a one-on-one -on -one than dealing with a large group of people but if I know the group of people really well I'm quite good but if I don't know them really well I tend to go quite quiet and I just go into lurk mode basically I just kind of observe people um, so it all depends really on what the setting is in terms of how I respond and you know my, my strategies are, are very personal I suppose they're not really worth sharing because they're you know I'm coming at it from such a weird angle being a kind of being a, a musician slash artist slash whatever I am you know that I think that my advice probably isn't that useful to somebody who isn't doing that you know um, but I don't know maybe it would be It'd be, I'd need to really discuss individual situations and ways that I would deal with him if I was in him, you know, for it for it to be any use. I can't just kind of give out general advice like that. But I do really appreciate that people... Like, I... I appreciate that people appreciate me talking about it, but I don't really know how to talk about it. And there's been a lot of situations where I've been in interviews and I've brought it up and they've quickly changed the subject. They don't want me to discuss this in interviews journalists see it as a little bit of an awkward subject area it's a bit like if I started to discuss some kind of personal health problem you know they don't like talking about this stuff a lot of people are kind of repulsed by anything that they perceive as a disability which is a shame really because I don't perceive it as a disability at all you know or, or a kind of superpower you know I'm not on that tip either with it you know I don't I just think it's all about difference and people being different I don't like a lot of this kind of new identity politics in that you're supposed to join some group and identify with that group and wave the flag for that group. That's just another type of group behaviour to me and I can't really identify with that either. So, um, you know, I find certain cultural phenomena a little bit difficult to engage with personally. And that, that's become a little bit more of an awkward thing as I've got older because people are so fucking fixated on these prefabricated identities you know I don't like that anyway god that was a lot of talking sorry um, <laughs> the day to day where Morris turns away from an organ after the intro yeah on the hour as well like if you'd listen to on the hour before the day to day there was on the hour on the radio because that was where we first caught it. So I remember playing Sonic 2 
and listening to on the hour and just thinking what the hell's going on it was like radio 4 had just folded up it was fucking amazing there was some bits in on the hour I remember there were one the one bit that really sticks in my mind when I was listening to it were the, the pips before the news. So it went beep, 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 beep. And it just did it for ages. And then it went into this melody or something. I just remember thinking, fucking hell, this is amazing. Like, I love Iannucci's edit, like, radio edit stuff. Because he does a lot of stuff that's on the same sort of tip as Kenny Everett's radio stuff, which I also really rated as a kid. Um... And my dad had some mate in London who was one of the van guys, because my dad was in van clubs when, when I was a kid. They used to customise vans and all that, and some of his mates were from London, and they used to have these tapes of these mad edits that Kenny Everett used to do that had a huge impact on me as a kid. And there's bits of Iannucci stuff that's like that, where he's done all these weird edits that are in the data. No, there's not really in the data. There's a couple of bits in the data day that are like that. That bit where it goes like collecting stamps, that bit. That's like that kind of humour. It's just really obscure, like, approach to editing. And kind of... Yeah, I love that humour. It's so over the top and weird. <laughs> it's so different. But, yeah, anyway, sorry. Um, do you think it was funny how there was one guy on Reddit who thought the Anal CDR was fake or just insulting that he didn't believe that you could have tracks that were a bit... Sketchy or less serious. Um, I mean, every, every time there's, there's this fake thing, right? So if there's a possibility that something's fake and people say, oh, Tech would never do anything this shit. And then they're like, oh, it's real. Oh, well. And then there's this idea that, you know, it's all about reputation. I mean, I kind of, I'm kind of down with that. I mean, I kind of think, well, if you, you should just approach it on its own merits. If it didn't have our identity associated with it, what would you feel about it? Would you be into it or not? I think that really is the question, you know what I mean, whether you like something. But you might be looking for that essence of somebody within within the track and trying to figure out if something's in. Like, I remember Steinvard thinking for ages that that must, must be Richard, but I didn't know, and I still don't know who that is, really. But when I heard it, I was thinking, yeah, it must be him. There's just so much of his essence in there, but... You never know if somebody's just cloning him. Because there's a lot of kind of Aphex tribute acts out there, isn't there? You know what I mean? So, um, And some people it's harder to do than others. Like, I don't think you could clone Luke Vibert, really. Because he's got a very particular approach to things. But it's just not that easy to boil down into constituent parts. And say, this is what makes a Luke Vibert track sound like Luke Vibert. If you know what I mean? It's be very difficult to, to emulate it. Um, whereas I think somebody like Rich, you can you can probably do it a bit easier with because you could just buy the same gear and do the same sorts of tunings and same type of patterns. But then there's some point at which you can slightly tell the difference. And I think those tracks, those guest com things, they're a bit diffuse because there's a few different people on them. So depending on who's there, there's different vibes to them. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It just depends on on. I mean, it's a bit different with them tracks because I don't really take it personal if somebody thinks that they don't sound like Arteca because they shouldn't, really, because they're not Arteca. So, especially like the this penultimate track, which just doesn't sound like anything that we would ever do, you know what I mean? So, but, um, but at the same time, yeah, like, I think the old question of whether a fake sounds like the actual artist... Um, ..is a bit weird for a band like us because we quite often don't sound like ourselves. Or, you know, we do something that's a bit, you know, different or fresh for us or whatever, so. Have you used Dali too? No, I'm on the list though. We'll see. The problem is I didn't tell them I was a fucking tech journalist or whatever, so I'll probably get it a, a year after everybody else gets it, so. Um. But yeah, it's weird because I'd like... I'd show you my, my old Reddit account, like, where I post all my Dali shit. And some of them are pure comedy, but, like, I can't, I'm not going to reveal any of my Reddit accounts to you, so you're going to have to just guess at who I am on there. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but, yeah, you probably see me on one of the Dali subs spamming fucking bullshit images. <laughs> um...
the irony of Soul Seek that a lot of electronic music artists were on there early on, yeah, me included, you know, and Audio Galaxy as well, you know. Um, props for keeping the band together for three decades, any wisdoms? Not really, just don't be a dick, you know, in general, you know. What's your opinion on Wendy Carlos? Phenomenal talent, just absolutely, absurdly respectable person and human and a lovely person. And, and it's such a shame she seems to be hiding lately. And I wish she wouldn't do that, especially now, you know. Yeah, I don't want to go on about that, but you know, you know what I mean, don't you? So, yeah, it's a shame. But like, yeah, just a phenomenal talent and just, just like so many things to learn from Wendy Carlos in general. And I know, you know, you can listen to it and think, well, it's just classical music made on a synth, you know, but it's just, it's done so well and it's done with such rigor and, and a kind of and fascination. And, you know, it's just, and there was so much trial and error in Wendy Carlos, you can hear it, you know, so many happy accidents and, and capitalising on those and, and there's just so much to learn in, in terms of approach from, from the way she's done stuff. That yeah, I think she was absolutely brilliant. Um just amazing, basically. Um but you know, I mean well well discussed. Um Time Steps is min yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I you know, also the Gamelan stuff that she tried to do um is really convincing. And I've played that alongside other Gamelan tracks and people haven't noticed that it's simps. You know, people who are familiar with Gamelan music, so... Yeah, it's fun. Okay, um, Have you read The Free Body Problem? Yeah, you know what, I got halfway through book two and kind of sloped off. And I still need to, forget, need to get it finished. But, um, there's some ideas I like in it and some of it I think, hmm... That doesn't really make sense, but maybe it comes together a bit more in the third book. I'm hoping it does. I kind of need to get back into it. I had this with Southern Reach trilogy and all. I got halfway through book two and was like, where the fuck is this going now? Like, and then it really came together. Book three was like, wow, fuck, you know? So yeah, um, I probably need to get back into free body problem. I found it, there was something about it that was bugging me, book two. It started to bug me a little bit. I'd probably just need to read through the bits that are bugging me and it'll start to make more sense, you know. What Norwegian food do you enjoy the most? Um, so I have this thing for like buying lumper and like just combining them with the wrong things. So like those little tins of mackerel with in tomato sauce, slapping that on lumper and eating that and letting it go through the holes a little bit. Or like fried eggs on lumper. And I keep getting told off for putting the wrong things on lumper. But I love it. But like straight up Norwegian food that I like is probably like hot dogs on lumper. It's, and that weird mustard that everyone eats here. And like, and fucking brown cheese. Brown cheese is ace. Like, totally unknown in the UK. Um, and... Yeah, that company Marud, or however you pronounce it, their peanuts are, like, f fucking amazing. They're, like, the best peanuts I've ever had. I really like peanuts, but their peanuts are, like, particularly well roasted. Like, amazing. Um, and, yeah, there's some weird things, like, Christmas dinner is, like, completely different to the UK. Um, and that thing, I don't, can't remember what it's called, where it's, like, I didn't... The first time I had it, I wasn't sure. It's, like, cabbages and and sheep and it's boiled I can't remember what it's called now but I really like that now I didn't the first time I had it I wasn't sure and then the second time I was like wow this is amazing like the cabbage had loads of flavor and stuff and it just was amazing so yeah there's some I think Norwegian cooking's quite basic in some ways oh and them little balls them little reindeer meat ball things that you get in them fucking weird packets that are like something from the 70s um, I think it's called Vilti now, but it used to be called something else. 
I love them shits. They're fucking really good. They're like something that I would have eaten when I was a kid. And I'm sure when I eat them, I get a weird nostalgia off it. But I don't know why. Because obviously we, we didn't have that in the UK. So, yeah. There's, I don't know. There's a few weird Norwegian things I like. And, and uh, Fiske Guteng or whatever it's called. You know, the fish. That's like a weird 70... You know what it's like? Fucking macaroni and fish and potato. Like, it's so weird. That's like a 70s dish. But um, but it's really good as well. That gives me weird nostalgia at all. Especially with a bit of black pepper on it. It's fucking really nice. So, yeah, I like these weird nostalgia foods. That are, It's like nostalgia for a time I didn't personally experience, you know. Um, underrated stereo widening techniques. Yeah, this is Rob's blag. He he does a lot of this stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, just in general, just like... I, th there's so many things you can do like this, but, like, an un an, there's a load of unknown ones. So, like, one is, like, using denoising, but then taking the inverse and then processing that and knocking one, you know, knocking one channel out of phase or knocking both channels slightly out of phase with the mono, which is the... So you're just taking the noise, basically, and widening the noise, effectively, and then mixing that back in. I like doing shit like that. But, yeah, I mean, in general, weird matrix mixing, I'm all over it. Because the first person I saw doing interesting mixing like that was this lad, Paul. He used to knock about with the reflex lot. He used to be in a reggae. I remember being round at his, and he was playing reggae records through a four-track. So he had, like, the record was playing into the four track, but then what he'd done was he had, on each channel, he had, like, on one channel, he just had the bass, and then on another channel, he had the same record playing, but just the mids and the bass and the treble turned down, and then on the other channel, he had the highs. So he had these three faders for each EQ band, and he was sending them to different effects. And I was like, whoa, fucking hell, that's really nice. So, yeah, I've kind of... I've just taken that to so many places over the years, like that method of thinking about splitting an original stereo signal up into multiple parts and then recombining it again later and doing slightly different processing on each part, depending on how you're splitting it up. So splitting it up using loads of different methods and then, you know, doing different types of processing on them. So that just opens mixing right up, doing that kind of stuff. So, yeah, in general, that. Um... My sugar, yeah, I fucking forgot to mention them when I was talking about metal, but that's probably because they're not strictly metal, but yeah, I really rate them. They've, there's a kind of... It's it's very mechanised, um, and obviously it appeals to me because it's mostly about the rhythm. Um, so yeah, I, I do really rate them. I think they're really good. Um, but I can only really get through one album at a time because it gets a bit... Um, it tires my ear brain out. Oh, there's a car by the way. You're going to have to wait for the car to disappear now. Um, God, I'm so far behind in the chat. I'm just reading how, how far behind I am. Sasha Gray's musical career. I don't know anything about Sasha Gray's musical career. Oh, God. I'm not interested in David Tibet at all. I have no... Don't care. Edgemeister. Um... Yeah, Kibras was amazing. Fucking hell. Um, Gamer. Must have owned a specky. Yeah, no, actually. Because my dad was... My dad used to fit burglar alarms. And he was a bit of a tech geek. He, you know, electronics geek. So, and engineering in general. He liked cars. And he liked putting little weird boxes together. And, this, and he didn't like the specky. Remember the specky coming out, and my dad was like, no, don't like it, shit. And he had all these reasons for not liking it. And then the BBC came out, and he was like, yeah, Acorn of the future. 
And he made, made us get a BBC, which meant I had a fucking BBC, which was good for Elite, but, you know, for most other games, I mean, Chucky Egg and, you know, Manic Miner, um, decent port of Manic Miner on there. Um, but a lot of other games were shit on there. I had GR Kung Fu, and then I had just tons of adventure games that I used to hack. Um, so yeah, I was sort of into computers, but in a bit of a weird way. But it was good because obviously school got BBC, so then I knew what I was doing, and I was a bit ahead of the pack. Um, but in any other context, it was shit because you got on your mate's house, and all my mates were game swapping and sharing and copying stuff. And um, yeah, God, I've got some funny stories from back then, but they were a bit long. But yeah. Um, so, and I had mates with VIC-20s, mates with 64s, mates with Spectrums. And I was the weird, I was the one weird kid who had a BBC, so. But, you know, it was because my dad thought it was a superior computer, and he was right, but it just wasn't that common, you know what I mean? So, it's fucking, it's what happens when your dad's into fucking computers, isn't it? Um. Can you enjoy normal music anymore? What the fuck is normal music? Yeah, of course I can. Like... I mean, I think we make normal music, don't we? I think. It's pretty normal. <sighs> fuck, I haven't drunk this coffee at all. This coffee's so good. Flasks. That's my recommendation for today. Fucking flasks. Worried about spilling drinks on your computer? Worry no more. Buy a fucking flask. Flasks, in general. Hot coffee all day. Best invention ever. Fuck, I nearly dropped you then. Too much coffee. Right, so, can't recall whether this is true or not, but that you were one of the few people complained about the selected ambient works 8592 pre-mastering process from comp <laughs> what the fuck <laughs> that's not true at all what the fuck where did that come from you were one of the few people complained about the selected ambient works no that's not right that's i know what that is that's rich that's right so in i remember this conversation this is where my memory is coming into play now. So, from what I remember, and I might be wrong, but in 95, I had a conversation with Rich about how I'd heard that he used to master his tracks to long play dats. And I remember saying to him, like, really? Do you really do that? Because I was thinking, wow, you must have really done a lot of stuff. Like, I was quite impressed, actually, at how much work he used to crank out, you know? Um, because we were quite slow, and I think just because we had less equipment and stuff, really, because we had to do a lot of it on the four track, like doubling synths up and stuff, so it just took us longer to do stuff, you know. And we were recording a lot to the 244, um, which has a, quite a different sound to recording to that. And when we got a DAT, I was a little bit like, oh, I'm not sure I can get down with this because it's a bit clean, but I managed to figure it out how to do cleaner mixes and all that, but you know. So I think it probably just comes from that conversation, maybe. A misremembering of, of that, or maybe something. But um, but I do think that, like, some of Rich's stuff has been badly handled post all that. Like, I think the Classics album sounds like junk compared to the records, which just sound fucking great still, you know. Um, but, you know, you can blame Renat for that shit, can't you? It's not Richie's fault, really. Um, have you ever owned an 808 or 909? No. We didn't have the money, because... Yeah. No, we just I was just the wrong age, really. If, if I'd have been a few years older, I probably would have. Because they were cheap until about 88, and then they just went through the roof. Which you can blame Chicago House for, and kind of middle-class Brits trying to do Chicago House, you know. So we just, the only thing we could get was a 606, which we bought in 88, early 88, Rob bought it. 
off this lad Jaffa who used to live in the flats in Rochdale for 50 quid. Anyway, um, Um, favourite studio monitors um, yeah so uh, probably Dynaudio BM15As because I just know them so well but they didn't mean they're the best or anything they're just what I know really well and what I've been using for the longest time so probably them but it's not a recommendation really it's just experience you know. Um. Would you be interested in remixing a track on the new Grace Jones album? Is that a real question? Yeah, defo. I fucking love Grace Jones. Are you serious? It's not sounding shit. I mean, that last thing, that corporate cannibal thing, I thought it was really good. Don't know if that were anything to do with you, but I really liked it. Because um, someone sent it to me wondering if I'd heard it because it they thought I might be into it and I think it's that thing of oh it sounds a bit like you maybe you like it but I just really liked it and um but I love Grace Grace is amazing fucking hell that would be such a killer remix I mean I really love Grace I think she's fucking ace like totally ace um yeah yeah hit me up man I mean fucking Trying to think of a way of getting an email to me. Um, you send an email to Ned, maybe. I'm not putting my email in here, so you could find me on Mastodon if you know where to look. But um, I'm not dishing that out in here either. So um, yeah, if there's some way of sending me a DM in this shit fucking platform, maybe you can do that. I don't know if there is or not. So otherwise, just put your email in the chat, and I'll try and scroll back and get it later. Um, amazing FM sim for the book and you can buy this stuff blah, blah 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 what's this do you speak Norwegian fluently no no yes not a Um what were the tracks you streamed on XLT in the early mid noughts with titles like Toy, Small Animal Reprise, etc. Oh yeah. <laughs> God. Shit that someone would remember that. Nice cast. That's the fucking program I used to use. Nice cast. There you go. I knew I'd fucking remember. Um Yeah, so it was an ice cast thing, right? So yeah. Um Yeah. Fuck. Um what were they? They were just fuck about it's little tracks. Um, actually, ended up sending a lot of those bits off to Mackenzie for one of the Hafler things. Um, so he's got them now. Um, and once that was done, that was it. I didn't want to use them at, at, at any point after that. But they were some of them were the bits that I sent off to him because that was around the same time. So, but yeah, they're just fuck about. It's just little things that I used to do, like laptop messing around bits that you know that you might make something that's not a track but you might make just record it and think well i might use that later i might use a bit of it or sample it or whatever so do with those sort of things um uh Do you have any special tricks with Quadroverb or do you just run sounds through it? <laughs> Both. <laughs> <laughs> That's a funny question. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's got loads of MIDI on it, so fuck around with it. You know, see what you can do with it. There's loads of tricks. There's loads of Quadroverb tricks. There's just a, a book. You could write a book about the shit you can do with a Quadroverb. They're amazing little things. It's just mainly about the MIDI, you know, the, just the amount you can manipulate it. So just get busy with the MIDI. Get busy with the MIDI. I remember in an old 2000s interview, you said you were reading Derrida, found the concept of deconstruction interesting. Are there any thinkers you find stimulating these days? Now, I'm like shit at reading other thinkers. I like Derrida because he was an awkward old cunt. And he was like, yeah, but why? But why? About everything. And I kind of I like that. 
but it got boring as well because I was like, well, anyone could do this. If you read enough philosophy, anybody could do this. And I think it was interesting what he did. I mean, really, for me, it became about... Because this is a tangential point, but you probably understand what I mean. I think, like, the vast majority of debates that I see on the internet are about semantics, right? So they're just people arguing about what words mean. And I feel like Derrida was doing a very kind of advanced version of that. Um, and it's fun for a while. But really, it is just that. And... Yeah, I don't know. Language is sort of necessarily imprecise. It's it's one of these things that's not... It's not designed to provide clarity. It's designed to convey... with some degree of vagary an idea in a vague sense so that the other person can then work with that. And I don't feel like it's necessary to be specific most of the time and I don't think that language is built for that um, and so using language to to discuss language it's, it's a little bit I like how recursive that can get and how kind of um, meta it is but it's sort of it's just like a, it's just like watching somebody pirouette and sort of do crazy looking acrobatics really and I feel like that's what Derrida is doing in a way Plus, you know, it's got that child, that childish kind of, but why sort of element to it, you know, which is appealing on a level. Um, but yeah, I remember like, because my granddad used to read some sort of postmodern philosoph philosophy stuff. He used to read like this bloke Richard Rorty. Um, so I've been around that a little bit and there's, there's some elements of that that I remember in quoting to me that I used to find interesting but I can't really remember much of it now my dad used to read stuff like Alan Watts the kind of beardy Buddhist guy you know um, my dad were into Eastern philosophy and martial arts and all this kind of stuff so I were exposed to a bit of that and all growing up but beyond that no I don't really and I'm not that much of a kind of I won't consider myself much of a deep thinker although I do think a lot about things um, I don't know if I'm a very deep thinker particularly I'm, I'm kind of more intuitive I think than, than sort of analytical but people describe me as analytical all the time so I don't know maybe I am I don't really know I think I probably just appear analytical but I, a lot of my conclusions I, I don't arrive at via deduction and, and there's a, there's a fair amount of induction and kind of feelings, really. A lot of it's just feelings. I feel like I can sense things a lot of the time. And then I have to kind of justify that sense with a load of words. So, I'm probably not making much sense right now. Anyway, um, Renoise, yeah, I just did, I just, most of the Renoise stuff I did was just with audio files and stuff. I didn't really do a lot of sequencing of hardware but I did sometimes sequence VSTs and stuff um, and the bit bits of hardware sequencing in there as well yeah there's a few bits but yeah mainly just working with samples but it was just I was using it to do things like remixes and stuff like the surgeon remix and black dog remix um, and the um, denier remix um, they were all done in there um, so yeah, there was a sort of brief period really where I was using it a bit for things. Did a remix for Mogwai that they didn't want to use. So, don't know why that was. Um, fucking hell, I'm really sorry I'm so far back in the chat again, by the way. Um, Kovark, you've been asking me about Kovark. Kovark is Lee Gilbert from Nottingham. And I don't know if he's still working on music, but he should be. He was an immense talent, in my opinion. Um, but then he, his hairdressing career took over. And he's a, he's a good hairdresser, so I don't blame him, really. Bless him. I've not seen him for fucking years, but I used to really like Lee. Really sound. Um, I 
I love how Vectroid's doing a, a mini AMA within the AMA, like a kind of meta AMA. <laughs> I'm enjoying this. Limmy lives on Twitch now. Yeah, I know, I know. I see him sometimes. Using an alt though, obviously. I just feel like he knows who I am though. Um, yeah. Um, Do you have Casio FZ? Yeah, well, I did for a little while. Like, so when we first started working in Dazzy's studio, which was only for about, at the most, a year that we worked in there, and we didn't really produce that much stuff because it used to take us a while using all that MIDI gear, and it was a, a bit like having to learn a whole studio at once, so that was quite difficult. But thankfully, Daz has got good taste in gear, good enough anyway, that I was able to enjoy a lot of his synths. And um, and find some good stuff within them, you know. Like the VFX SD at the time, I'd never heard anything like wavetable synthesis. So that transwave synthesis stuff was just mind blowing to me, young brain. I was just like, wow, what the fuck is this? You know, um, it was so far away from anything I'd learned about. Um, and yeah, he had an FZ, so. And the filters were really good in it, and we used it on a few things. There's, I think the only thing that's out there that, that's got that on is probably one of the tracks on that Sweatbox video, um, which is a hard to describe one, because there's not many elements that I can refer to that I don't you know what it is. But it, it's, anyway, one of the tracks on there has got it on pretty heavily. And yeah, I used to like the filters a lot. I remember first hearing Aphex stuff and thinking that's got to be an, an FZ, that filter, like straight away recognising it. And we, by that point, um, yeah, we didn't get a sampler until 92, 93. So like a proper sampler. I mean, we had the RSD10 and the Casio SK. So um, when we came to get a sampler, we went for the ASR, the EPS, I mean, because it was it had all the effects in there and everything and we didn't have many effects units at the time so it just made sense to get that but i always really liked the filters on the fz but the fact that you could only have one of them running at a time was a bit of a limitation but the fact that it was analog was really good so yeah i think they're beautiful samplers but they're just like i was able to do a lot more using the eps than i would have been able to do on the fz but the fz is good for doing that if you know what i mean so yeah i think i'd have preferred to have an fz in the early days um, and I like using them a lot um, and there was all kinds of fun stuff you could do like where you rotate the sound through the outputs that was a good trick um, so there's a few things you could do on there that you couldn't do other ways there's a few tracks actually I think that um, one of the Debris remixes uses the FZ pretty heavily um, because we did that in Dazzy Studio for him so anyway so that's out there but yeah and then i bought one i bought one off simon pike um some point during the 90s and it just kind of sat there for a while and i didn't really use it and then i sold it again so yeah What's my skincare routine? At the moment, just a bit of sun cream because I'm sitting out here. So, you know, otherwise now, just fucking water. I don't really use soap on my face, so if that helps. Because otherwise I get breakouts. I get acne sometimes. It's anxiety related as well. Like if I'm not getting enough sleep, I get it really bad, so. Sorry, it was probably covering the mic up there. Um, Man, that happens when you get through the early school years of raw intelligence and don't build a foundation for efficient studying. Yes, 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 exactly, yes. I was a fucking shit student. I didn't want to, I didn't like the formality, really. Um, I also like didn't like the fact that I knew more about some of the topics than some of the teachers did. I'm not saying that to sound big or anything, but it just annoyed me that when I was learning about atoms, I knew about particles 
and they wouldn't teach us about it in middle school in the first two years. And I, and I asked my physics teacher, Mr. Fromont, I'm not going to tell you stories about Mr. Fromont on here because I'll, I'll end up getting in trouble. But like, privately, if you ever want to ask me about Mr. Fromont, I'll tell you some shit. But, um, but yeah, I remember he was teaching us about atoms and he said atoms are the smallest thing and I said no there is no they're not like I was going what about protons and neutrons and electrons I didn't know about up and down quarks and all that then so I didn't want to go I wouldn't I would have said that as well but I didn't know then but like he was like you're like yeah well I don't have to teach you about that yet you learn about that later and I said oh does that mean I could do your job then <laughs> and he was like yeah <laughs> he laughed about it though so that was good but it used to fuck me off and it, it'd be like, the, I didn't like national curriculum at all. I, I, I think I would have been better with a one-on-one -on -one tutor. I think I would have learnt more. But, um, so I used to get bored a lot of the time or I'd just lose, I'd like lose track. So I'd just concentrate more on how much of an ass the maths teacher was being than what she was actually saying. You know, like concentrate on how she was picking on and bullying other students in the class. I never used to really get any of that from teachers, but there were there were other students who would get bullied just for being curious, you know, and stuff like that. So, yeah, I don't know. I'd, I'd get distracted too much by weird little dynamics in the classroom to actually pay attention to what we were actually meant to be learning. Um, that's not Asperger you're describing. People should stop diagnosing themselves. Um, okay. I mean, I can give you the email address of the doctor who diagnosed me if you want. You can have a conversation with him about it. Would that be helpful? The weird thing about Asperger's and autism is the different parts of the brain that are affected by it, I think. You know, whether it's your hippocampus or your amygdala that are acting up. But in my case, I get, like, overwhelmed emotionally pretty easily. I always think, like, it's weird that people don't detect how emotional our stuff is, cos... But I always think it, maybe it's just because I'm a bit more sensitive to that stuff. I don't know. Like, I think... I think average people probably just don't detect the emotion in it as easily as I do. I don't know, it's weird. I think they're less sensitive emotionally than I am. Yeah, the blow, like that Inland Empire pullback and reveal is one of the best moments in cinema, full stop. It's amazing. I'm glad you mentioned that. It's just amazing. It's right up there with the bit in The Shining where he's staring at the maze and then it's zooming in and then you realise it's the actual maze. Fucking, that's an amazing moment. It's my favourite bit of The Shining. Chris Morris Jam. Yeah, I'm, um, it's so fucking twisted. It's basically what I think Jam is. And I think a lot of people get it wrong because they think it's just edgy comedy that's trying to kind of shock you into laughing. It, it is that, a little bit. But... Um, it's really, I think what it is, is it's a satire of British attitudes. And, and... The kind of rancid people that you find around the UK. 
um, and the stupid fucking things that they think and do all the time and it's so savage um, you know and I, I think this is why you see a lot of authority figures in there and doctors and stuff like this because and this kind of appeal to authority problem that the UK has got in general um, and just how horrible and abusive people can be to each other and, and you know how disgusting people can be because I think he was getting to a point where he was just thinking about society at large by then not just you know the media or whatever you know it, it become a much bigger quest actually my favourite Chris Morris things are probably the Blue Jam monologues because I think they're amazing they're such a unique view of London I mean they dovetail quite nicely with things like um, the Yob um, and some of Charlie Brooker's stuff, you know, um, like Nathan Barley as well, you know. It's a kind of unique view of London that you don't really get from anywhere, really. I, I wish there were more things like them Blue Jam monologues. I think they're incredible, actually. Like, really, super good. They're beautifully made. Um, right, where are we? Fuck, I've lost you again. Sorry about being so far back in the chat. I'm trying to get through it, though. There's no stream delay, I'm just shit at answering enough questions. And these are old. Um, what do I think of 4chan as an anonymous platform? <laughs> oh god, this is a conversation. Fucking hell, we're going to have that conversation, are we? Um, it was good in 2006, 7. It got a bit worse in 2009. It took a proper fucking dive around 2011. Um, by 2014 it was basically toast it was just I, I stopped kind of I stopped really frequenting it around 2012 2013 because it was just so rancid and yeah it's always been a cesspool uh, we all know that there were good people on there there were bad people on there but there were a lot of bad actors um, you know, and obviously there's, there's a shitload of content that you would, at, at first you would try and argue with, and then you realise that there were actually teams of operators on there trying to push things, ideas, agendas, stuff like that. So, um, I think I first realised that in the late 2000s, when all the kind of anti-Semitic stuff started getting really prevalent, you know. It weren't just kids doing, like, edgy internet abuse it was like really targeted forced means basically by that point and um yeah i don't know we, we can have a long conversation about 4chan but it should probably be two-way i don't feel like i should just sit and monologue about it pretty sure everything i'm saying moot would agree with though to be honest it's must it must feel pretty shitty to start you, you kind of to get kicked off sa and then just end up doing your nice little anime board and then for it to turn into a a propaganda channel for bad actors and fucking neo-nazis i mean shit me what a blow you know but then again i suppose he made a lot of money so whatever right i've, I've jumped to the top so i probably missed a shit ton of stuff so maybe I'll scroll back a bit. Okay, now I've now I can only scroll back so far. So I've probably missed some stuff. So, but all you kind of where is he in the chat? People are going to be happier because I'm closer to you now. Language involves trickery, inscribes us into cultural references, opinions, and that is structurally not conspiratorially designed for us not to touch truth about ourselves. We say things, but rarely see it is us saying them. Yeah, I mean, 
coming to terms with your own subjectivity is hard, isn't it, for humans? Especially when we're discussing things that are, you know, to do with perception, which is an active process, right? So, yeah, it's fucking hard work. And that's why I find, like, discussion of art and music to be really kind of painful. Um, beyond being very basic and kind of broad strokesy about it, you know, it's, it's hard to talk about this stuff with any real depth. And so I find it much easier to produce work than talk about it. And these chats are all right, because I get to talk about a lot of different topics, but, you know, we're not really talking about what I do, because I don't know how to do that. And I don't even know if... I don't know if anybody ever asks the right questions, and I don't know how I would answer them, even if they did. You know, um... But it's nice when I see moments of insight popping up in the chat, so I do appreciate you doing this. Because, I mean, you lot are contributing a lot more to this than I am, so... Uh, Dale, Ray and Rail, all they have letters that are in Rochdale, is that intentional? <laughs> Dale is, yeah. Uh, Although I'm not technically from Rochdale, I was born there, but I moved to Middleton when I was one, so um, I grew up in Middleton, but like Rob and Jed and a lot of my other mates are from Rochdale, and when we started out sending demos out, we didn't want to put my address on the thing because it'd, it'd be an M24 postcode, which would make us a Manchester band, and in 1989-1990, that weren't an association we wanted to have. We didn't want to be part of that Manchester thing at all. You know, we wanted to be outside it. So we opted to do everything via Rob's address, which meant that when we were approaching journalists, we could say we were from Rochdale and not Manchester, cause you know, then, then we didn't have to deal with all that. But yeah, we're about, we're a mix really of Manchester and Rochdale and I suppose Middleton is itself a mix of Manchester and Rochdale, but so I suppose we, we kind of lean towards the Rochdale thing and my family, a lot of them, are from north of the, the midline in Manchester, but a few of them are from South Manchester as well, so. I'm a bit of a mixed bag, really. Uh, can you tell something about our Tech I Saw You demo? Yeah. So both of them are tracks that we did in Dazzy's studio um, in 89, 90. They're like, one of them is on the uh, Sweatbox video. I think it might be the last track. It's kind of a slow plodding kind of house beat sort of techno thing with long keys in it. Um, and a kind of weird saxophone sounding sound doing the which I think was a TX81Z sound. It might have been a preset. Um, from before we knew really what we were doing with that thing. Got a battery warning. Um, so, yeah, that's Saw You. And then the Arteca track that's called Arteca, I don't think that's out there. Um, I haven't got any plans to release them songs, so... No. As far as I know, that hasn't leaked anywhere. But the pictures of the tapes are real. Um, it was funny seeing that bloke on Discogs having to argue with people that it was real. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and they were saying like, "That's that's I don't believe it." Nobody was spray painting tape labels back then. Well, fuck off. Yes, we were. Um, I can't help it if we're a bit of ahead of everyone graphically. You know, it's just we writers. Of course, we're fucking graph writers. Of course, we're going to spray. Uh, tape labels, what else are we going to do with them? It's like they've never seen the sleeve for cavity job. Uh, Metroid Prime, I answered that earlier, so you can just watch it later. Arcteryx is the shit, love their build quality. I'm not going to sell Arcteryx on here, but they are the shit, so... It's... My gran... Alright, so... My dad's parents were both art teachers at Rochdale College. Um, and my gran taught textiles. She actually taught fucking John Richmond and Betty Jackson in, but just GAD, like she taught them basics, you know, just college stuff, you know, 16 to 18. Um, 
But yeah, she she used to complain all the time about tailoring. And Actrix is one of the first sport labels that I've seen that had like amazing, amazing tailoring. I know a little bit about how to make clothes. Not a lot, but a little bit. Um, and yeah, I do really rate Arcturix. They're, they're not just saying this because it's a cool label. You know, they are really fucking well made. You can buy Arcturix. I've got Arcturix jackets that I bought 12, no, 18 years ago that are still going. So, you know, you want to talk about ecologically friendly labels. You can buy Patagonia stuff, yeah, but it'll fuck up on you after five years. So yeah, you know, it's made from recycled plastic, big deal. But what if it's only lasting five years? So I'm not going to do all this kind of, you know, one label's better than the other, but I do really rate Arcturix just for build. So you're totally right, build quality. But I'm not an Arcturix fucking sales channel, though. If they want to send me some shit, though, fucking feel free, because it's expensive as all fuck. But I'm not, like, really needing it either, because it just lasts forever. So when I buy shit, I know it's, I'm still going to have it in 10 years, so... I'm, I'm more on that tip than anything these days. It's just turning into my dad, basically. That's what everyone does, isn't it, at a certain point. Start buying things because they're well made. Apart from fucking t-shirts. Uh, I watched The Expanse, but I already forgot how it went. Yeah, I know. It is a bit like that, isn't it? It feels more substantial than it is, you know. But Avasarala's a cool character, so, you know. Um, and Drummer. I like Drummer. Favourite Kubrick film? Hmm. Um, probably The Shining. Um, but the European cut, though, not the American one. Um, I want to like Eyes Wide Shut, but I just think it's just a bit cheesy. The sex stuff in it, and I can't handle that scene with... Nicole Kidman and Tom Cruise where she's getting stoned. It's the old fucking actors pretending to be stoned thing, which is, it just doesn't work. I get the feeling that she's never really got stoned from that. I don't know. Why, right, why when Americans do <laughs> acting, right, pretending to be stoned, why did they go like that? And then they go like a stupid voice. Like, what's that? Who does that? Who's ever done that? Yeah, I'm gonna talk like that now, I'm a bit stoned. At least you didn't do that, you know. Thanks for the backup on the autism thing. I'm not like, I don't have to fucking I'm not you wearing this like a badge or anything. I'm talking about it because somebody who I know who's also Asperger's told me that it'd be useful for other people if I talked about it. So, and also because, you know, I'm one of the few who's fucking made it through unscathed. You know what I mean? I managed to turn it into a fucking... I turned an affliction into a recording career. Um, so, you know, and it isn't really an affliction for me. And I think that's something that we have to talk about a bit more, you know what I mean? That there's some of us out there who are getting through and we're doing all right. And it's actually a bit of a boon for us, you know? In the same way that you've got a lot of corporate CEOs who've got narcissistic personality disorder and they're doing fine out of it. Everybody else is like, fuck off you cunt. But they're doing fine, you know what I mean? In my case, hopefully, I'm not hurting anybody to get where I am, so, you know. Did I rate Nathan Barley? Yeah, quite a lot. There's obviously echoes of the Yob in there, which I really kind of click with. Um, and I really like Charlie's kind of points of view on a lot of things. I find a bit of Black Mirror a bit depressing sometimes, so... Um, and a bit obvious, you know, like riffing on current trends in technology and extrapolating them and then sort of doing that. So that's a bit... But that is what the Twilight Zone used to do as well. And I think as a, as a kind of anthology series, it works fairly well. But there is a kind of technophobic element to both the Twilight Zone and Black Mirror that I find a little bit off-putting in itself. But then again, humans are humans and 
technology is an extension of us and maybe it's more of a comment on humans being humans right so but i do i do rate him a lot um i like dead set i think dead set's really good um and yeah i really like nathan barley i think i liked tv go home as well before nathan barley not the tv show although the tv shows are right but the actual publication tv go home i used to really like and i used to love con i used to love reading the con bits <laughs> they were really good you know um so yeah I, there was some some of his stuff because I, I, I rated charlie brooker before he was household name really when he was just doing tv go home so I was really looking forward to Nathan Bailey and when I first saw it I was like yeah this is good I'm not totally sure but it grew on me pretty quickly I love the Jones bits you know the the fact Jones being a kind of a parody of a type of electronic musician these kind of middle class dropouts that were running around London around the early 2000s trying to be more extreme than one another was so accurate um, so yeah there was loads of elements of it that i like and i really like jonathan whitehead i think he's he's massively unsung and if you're a morris geek you're gonna know who he is but like a lot of people won't but his shit's amazing it's properly heavyweight um you know everything that he's done really i mean especially the theme music to to brass eye and all the kind of extended extreme bits of that are just just epic you know i think he's brilliant so i think the jones tracks were done by him you can sort of feel him in there, you know, his, his sort of extrapolation techniques, you know, really good. Um, Four Lions, I think, you know, I, I can't watch Four Lions because it's quite tragic and sad. But what I remember of it is that it was very, very accurately observed slice of northern asian mad culture and from what i know of asian communities up north it, it was spot on and it's probably the best depiction of, of that type of community that i've seen actually ever in the same way that um rita sue and bob too is the best depiction of 80s life that i've ever seen and alan clark in general is fucking amazing let's talk about alan clark just as a complete tangent everyone should see christine um, and made in Britain, basically. But Alan Clark in general is amazing. Um, who has the best sense for pitch from the traditional walk guys? Do you know anyone with perfect pitch? Yeah, I think Rob's got perfect pitch. You can always tell when I'm out when I'm out of key. Like, I can sing in tune, but be out of key, and Rob will immediately know and tell me off for it and get irritated by it. He actually doesn't like it, he finds it grating. But I don't think he's... It's funny because he's not got really any musical training. He's just he's just born with perfect pitch. It's like a curse, you know. Um, but in terms of who's the, be the most musically trained, it'd have to be Tom. But I think Bok are like... I think maybe but Mike actually it's between Mike and Tom because I think both of them have got quite deep musical training you know although Tom's probably a bit more of a, a muso if you know what I mean I think Mike is like he's just very aware of nuances I think both of them are, are, are very good on that kind of stuff compared to me anyway I mean that's not hard though I'm Mr Basic um, the fact that people enjoy being diagnosed and very often ask to be diagnosed yeah I think I think maybe I think it has become a bit of an issue um, especially that people want to feel different and part of a group I don't really feel part of a group group membership was never really my thing I think the whole idea of somebody wanting to be diagnosed with autism so that they can become part of a group is interesting from the point of view of them having been denied group membership for so long because of their autism that they probably do desperately want to be part of some group but don't really know what group that is and as soon as they find a community of people who are like them i.e. all different to each other that they find some solace in that but I find that all, all the politics around autism to be a little bit 
makes me feel weird, you know. Um, but yeah, I feel, I, again, that's because I find group membership quite difficult. And I've, I've sort of, I've looked at kind of things like communities for people with autism and it's just a bunch of people who, who like saying, does anybody else feel like this? And it's like, well, it's not like that. I feel like we're all just a bit more different. So, yeah, I don't know. Maybe somebody can correct me on that. Because my understanding of it's a lot less uh, refined than my doctor's. So, um, Four champ poked the beehive too many times during the Occupy protests, and now it's just a bunch of undercover agents arguing with under over undercover agents who don't realise they're both working for the same agency. Yeah, I mean it's just it's a fucking mess in it. Like, why would anybody go there now? You know what I mean? Like, there's not a lot to be gained, and I'm pretty sure if you set up any other anonymous online community, it'd go the same way as well because it's just what you can do when you haven't got a fixed identity. You know, it's one of those things you can do. Reddit's almost as bad though. There's so many bad actors on Reddit now. It it was good in the early days when everybody, all the smart people, left 4chan and went to Reddit. But then it just turned to shit as well. It's better though, it's better. And I can still hang out there with some sense of self-respect still. But still, you know, it's still a fucking shithole. Then again, where isn't... I mean, Mastodon's probably the nicest place at the moment. It's the only place where I feel like I can be around a bunch of people who are a bit more like me. And there's a fair few smart people on Mastodon, so it, it feels a little bit more tame. You know what I actually liked, which is going to be really unpopular, because nobody else liked it, but was... Um, I can't even remember what it was called now. Google, Google's social network. Because I was able... And everybody doesn't like this, the, the, curate, the way the curation worked on there, with circles, but I liked it. Because I could have all these different feeds for different people. Um, but it didn't last long and then it just turned to shit because nobody was on there except a bunch of scientists and academics so that didn't last but that could have been quite a good social network early on i had that feeling anyway um wow what's this base base 4chan is the last bastion of free speech is it fuck i mean i'm doing free speech now there's free speech all over the internet, what are you talking about? It's the last bastion of a certain kind of speech, and it isn't even the last bastion. If you, I mean, if you want to find that kind of speech, just look in YouTube comments. I mean, look anywhere. I don't, yeah, I mean, you're right, Brap, about prescriptions, but I don't need anything, so it was probably a little bit pointless in my case, and I'm probably not getting much out of it other than knowing, oh, right, so that's why I feel like that. You know, it's my amygdala is firing too much, it's malfunctioning because of the brain defect. You know, that kind of thing. I'm sort of more interested in it from a kind of physical point of view. But, um, but I don't need to regulate my emotions using mood stabilizers or anything. And I fucking wouldn't anyway, even if I thought I had to, unless I was actually like... I don't think I'd medicate unless I was schizophrenic or something. And I know there's a bit of an overlap with autism and schizophrenia anyway, so... So yeah, maybe. If I was really bad, I might, but I don't have to. And I certainly wouldn't if I didn't have to, so... That's pretty much what happened with Usenet. It is, yeah, and that's why I'm not on Usenet anymore. I like Usenet. I mean, it was really just became somewhere to share binaries, didn't it? Eventually, so you know, um, and share weird opinions. Space is how V was Rob, so I can't talk about how he did it. You're going to have to ask him. 
Rob knows some mean tricks for stereo manipulation. And he doesn't even share them with me, so... Have you ever met up with any of the Detroit heads? Yeah, I know quite a few of them, yeah. Um, not well. Um, but yeah, I know... I met Cal Craig, met Derek, um, not met Reese. Um, met Mad Mike, really liked him. Met Gerald Donald, really like him. Uh, met James Stinson. He was really nice. Um, not at all what I expected. Um, Ox 88. Um, who else? Richie Artin. Know him. Um, he's not Detroit, obviously, is he? But, you know, let's not go there. Um, trying to think. Who, who else? Um... Yeah, you, you're going to have to start naming names for me to say whether I know them or not. But, yeah, I'd say I know Carl a bit. You know, I think he hates me. But, you know, it is what it is. No pun intended. Uh, do you smoke joints sometimes? Yeah. Couple intro live recording. I had to describe how much I love that. Do you know where that leaped from? Uh don't know which one you mean, but could be a few places. Played it quite a bit back then. It's been mentioned before, but I think you'd really like the world of Bellatar. Okay, I'll check it. I don't know what that is. Um, you talk about how Surrey Perry was made? Yeah. Um, so we had the back half of that. That was made already. And then the front half of it was another track. And then they were sort of glued together. And then the transition was worked out sort of after the after both halves had, had been made if you know what I mean so it was kind of two tracks jammed together and then a ton of work was done on the back half of it um, I don't know it's, it's sort of like there's, there was a lot in there I mean mainly like the sampling on the back half of it is all battery um, sort of loop position modulation in battery um, which is re it's really good for doing that like we used to do that before on the EPS, but you could do it better in battery because it had a kind of, some kind of, um, what you call like a crossfade built in. And it was quite, it was quite well handled and it had a quite plasticky sound to it. So used that on a few things, used it on that coil remix as well. Um, so yeah, like, and then, I'm trying to think what else, because the front part of it was like a PPG with Nord drums and just like an echo unit. Can't remember what the echo was now. Some delay thing. Um, yeah, I don't know. Pretty basic, really. Have you developed separate synth tools for percussion versus melodic harmonic stuff, or is that distinction meaningless at this point? Right, yeah, that, that got asked on YouTube. I assume you're the same person. So, like, um, and I didn't really know how to answer it. It sort of is meaningless, yeah. I've got, so I've made a few drum synths that are just that just do drums, but I use a lot of my other synths to do drum sounds as well because they can, and so I use both. But the drum, what's different about the drum synths compared to a lot of the other synths is that the attack portion of the envelope is fixed. So it's always going to have that same snap. Um, whereas the rest of the note length can be varied. Um, whereas a lot of my other sims don't do that. So the envelopes are more dynamic and do a lot more changing around and stuff. So they have to be told to just stay in one place. So it's a little bit different. But... Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't make as many drum synths as I do regular synths because I tend to make regular synths that could make drum sounds if I wanted them to. But I've made a few, like clap generators and things like that, that are quite specific things, you know. OK, I'm going to need to get a power pack, so I'll be back and on.
The best anime of all time is Macross Plus. No, like... <clears throat> is it? <laughs> I don't know though what the best... <clears throat> I grew up with Gatchaman, so I've got like a funny fucking old man attitude to anime, you know. I don't know how to play chess. Never played it. I've sort of, I, have, I think I have played it a couple of times, but I, I had somebody had to walk me through what I was doing, so I'm shit at chess. I haven't got a good enough memory for it. Thoughts on spiritual queer interpretations of your music. I know people like Sophie struck me, like being interested in electric music. I don't really have a stance on that, because I'm not queer enough to have um, an understanding of what that experience is like, especially for trans people. Not that trans people are queer, but you know, it's, they get bracketed together, don't they? But I don't really know. I know I li liked a lot of gay music growing up though. I, I loved Coil um, and synth pop in general. Was, you know, a lot of the artists were gay, so. And um, I know Depeche Mode used to flirt a lot with that kind of imagery. But, you know, in the early 80s, it was like one of the main sources of electronic music was the gay scene. So and in, the, in Manchester originally, when the house scene kicked off in sort of 86, 87, it was mainly the gay scene who were into it, apart from, you know, black kids on my side and that. So it was like, yeah, weird overlaps for us. You know what I mean? I always found it like a, a real source of kind of a different kind of energy. So I've always been interested in that stuff, but as an outsider. Pretty much. Hannah mentioned recent-ish that there was going to be a follow-up to Cavity Job called Wildstyle, but it didn't happen. Was the chin recorded though? Um, no. But we talked about it. Could ask how David Lynch has influenced your practice or work. Hmm. I don't know if I can. If I know, how? I'm sure he has. Because he's been a big influence. I think the first thing I ever saw by him was um, The Elephant Man. And I was really kind of, kind of repulsed and drawn in at the same time. And it was really sad. It made me feel like more sad than anything I'd seen. I remember seeing that and feeling... And the, the, I had the same feeling watching Frankenstein, actually. The original... I don't know if it's the original or whatever. But it was an old black and white Frankenstein film. And there was a kind of deep sadness there as well. Like... So yeah, that was the first experience. And then Eraserhead. And then Blue Velvet. Um, sort of in that order. But yeah, like, I think Blue Velvet was the one where I was really like, wow, th what is this vibe? Like, this is weird. Like, Eraserhead obviously had a huge impact on me and continues to. Mainly just the use of sound and the, and the sort of emptiness and the bleakness of its settings. I found weirdly relatable because it's a bit like wandering around an old... Because I used to live quite close to an industrial estate that you could get onto quite easily and just wander around. And At nights, that place was fucking strange. Like, it had a really odd vibe to it. And as a young kid, it has a... You know, you, you feel... It's strange. It's not like a normal place, an industrial estate. They're weird places. And there were bits of that film that reminded me a bit of that. So, but he just turned up the bleak to like a million, so. So I thought that you were wearing a beautiful DBC32 data bank. What's your favorite wristwatch? Um, probably one of the, like, 81, 
two, I can't remember what year exactly. It was an AE, oh, was it an AE 11 or an AE 12? I can't remember. It was one of the ones with a split face. So at the top, it had a fake analog LCD and the bottom was like a digital display. And then it had like little notches in the side between the buttons and then a blue outline. I used to love that thing. I, d I thought it was aesthetically amazing. Um, but yeah, I've got a lot of Casios. Like I used to slightly collect them because they were quite cheap. Um, and for a while they just weren't at all popular. People had stopped wearing watches by that point. Or they, you know, when the swatch thing happened, that pretty much killed Casios for a while in, in a fashion sense. But I kept buying them because I just liked them. Got loads. Um, I really like the solar one. I've got a solar one and it works without a battery. It's just got a, a capacitor in it, like a slow discharge capacitor in it, which I think is amazing. Like some of their designs are really good internally. Casio are a great company, I think. Super interesting. Could you talk further on your relationship with John Balance? Not really. I mean, I, I kind of... He's one of those people who I'd see at gigs and then he'd occasionally ring me up and we'd have really long conversations. So, I don't know that I'd call it a proper normal relationship. In that I never really hung out with him or anything. But I feel like I know him quite well because I kind of know what his interests are. And he would send me bits of books. You know, like he sent me Society of the Spectacle, which he just thought I should read. You know what I mean? So he would send me stuff like that. He sort of introduced me to situationism in an odd way. And yeah, I kind of, I liked his way of thinking about things. It was quite kind of, um, you know, he had a good, a good understanding of the history of culture that I think he's sort of missing actually in a lot of modern artists. A lot of modern artists just sort of have a few reference points and then they, they set off and they go. And me and Rob are a bit like that, to be honest. But he had a really deep understanding of cultural practice that's quite unusual within music it's more common within art really but yeah I liked him he was cool but I wouldn't say I knew him that well have you ever been to a psychoanalyst or therapist um well I mean clinical psychologist but psychoanalysis is a very particular kind of stream of thinking so I'm not that interested in that, to be honest. And therapist could just be anybody from a counsellor through to a clinical psychologist. It's just too much of a vague term. So I don't really know what to say about that. Um, upstream colour, yeah, I love it. Um, so if we're on that tip, um, Under the Skin, Glazer's film, is amazing. It's just totally amazing. It's one of my favourite science fiction films ever. Um, I love Upstream Colour. I think it's really good. I love the way, the, like, the, the way it's shot. It's really odd. It reminds me a little bit of being on acid. Um, it, it's super strange especially the outdoor daylight stuff i don't know what he's using what lenses and stuff what cameras but it's got a very odd feel to it very particular um yeah i i think shane caruth is one of those people i just wish he'd made more work you know but i get that it takes him ages to do anything i i, I can relate to that so yeah um i just wish there were more films of his that we could talk about Modern science fiction, you know, I, I kind of, some films I enjoy and they're a bit ropey, but, you know, I'll kind of enjoy it because the concept is a bit mind-bendy. I quite like coherence from that point of view. It was a bit silly, but it was sort of, and it was, a, there were things about it that were clunky and it was a bit like, the acting was a bit ropey, but, but I enjoyed it. You know, it was a sort of, it was sort of shit and good at the same time. Um, yeah, I don't know, like, I think Under the Skin is so much better than a lot of films, I don't really know. There's not a lot I can say about it because it's just so it, it's just so atmospheric and sort of interesting. And the whole idea of not knowing what you are, I think it sort of, it clicks with me somehow. 
I, f I found it really kind of engaging and and I could relate even though I'm not you know an alien who goes around hunting people in a van so that they can lure them into a pool of black sludge that's I don't do that um, yeah it's good hello from Wilmslow do you know it? Of course I know Wilmslow. Fucking hell. <laughs> Hello, Wilmslow. Yeah. Uh, is it possible you're going to do a massive SoundCloud dump like Aphex Twin? No, probably not. I, I don't know if I if I need to. Plus, I think a lot of our unreleased stuff, I, I sort of, it's unreleased for a reason, you know? Like, I wouldn't have leaked them, that Hano thing. I wouldn't have leaked that myself. That was just, they're the kind of tracks that I'd like. I don't mind them being on a CD to DJ with at someone's party where people are only going to hear them once and not know what it was and not really remember it. But I wouldn't really want them out there because they're just fuckabouts or sketches. You know what I mean? So... Um, and some of the guest con ones are things that are just tryouts where we've tried a few things out and we've ended up nailing it on another track and that ended up coming out but them bits are just bits that you know they're not meant to be out there really but they're alright for DJing with and I don't mind if, if some of my mates are going to play them in DJ sets but I, I'm not sure that I'd want to like have them as a release so yeah you know I guess you're seeing behind the curtain a bit there you know but I'm not sure I want to just do that because I think that there should be a kind of line drawn and I think you know I've always been at the Kubrick mentality of just like getting all your archive and burning it just before you die that's that's my tip that's probably what I'm going to do I'm off Facebook but I am trying to get to Mastodon is that you Alexa? yeah like if you're serious about that um it's I don't know how much you'd like it. You might find some of the people a bit annoyingly pseudo intellectual, but like, and the politics might wear you down a bit, knowing you. But at the same time, it's there's a lot of smart people on there, so you know, ups and downs basically. You should try it. I like it personally. I think it's it's a, at the moment it's nascent enough to be like a good social network. But as soon as it as soon as all the idiots flood in, it's gonna turn to shit. You know that, right? Like they all do. So, but for now, yeah, it's good. It's good. You can make friends on there. You know, looking at how you are on Twitter, I think you probably you probably fit in there. You know, there's some brains on there. Erasure was the gayest show I ever saw, just wild for the 80s. Brat, I mean, look, I'm kind of, you know, Erasure were very gay, weren't they? They were, they were about as gay as you can get. Yeah. Andy Bell is probably the gayest person ever to be on stage. That's worth thinking about, isn't it? Right, so there's a Gamelan in Parallel Triangle. Where did you get it? Um, Bali. Um, I always suspected you borrowed the one Tom Jenkinson brought back from Asia which he used in Gong Acid. yeah it's funny that because when I went there he he was he was about to go there and he was really weirded out um, so we actually got because uh, I bought like quite a lot of Gamelan stuff when I was over there because it's cheap basically and they'll export it for you and everything so as long as you're willing to wait for the shipping it's really cheap to get it and they'll, you can just get them to custom build you it, basically. So I'd done that. Um, so yeah, it was around the same time, but I think we went to different places. I'm not sure if we got them built in the same place. But um, but yeah, I gave them away to the Suffolk Skills Gamelan when me and Chantel split up, which is like 2005. So I haven't had them since then, but I had them all the time I was living in Suffolk. So I got them, I basically bought them in 99 got them shipped to Sheffield and they sat in boxes for ages and then the lads who were storing them in a stu which was a studio in Sheffield a, guy, a lad called Dave Will uh, Willie, Dave Willie don't know if he's Wilkinson or Williamson but he's a lad who lived in Sheffield and um, they'd opened them up 
him and this other lad, Ross, um, who were working on stuff and they used them a bit, I think. And then, so, and then I took them to Suffolk and I had them from about 2000 to just before, like, late 99 to uh, 2005. So, yeah, I had them, and I had them downstairs and so we had a studio, I was in, like, a barn. And then downstairs in the barn, I just had all the gongs laid out, like a whole room full of them. But I, I only used them on a few tracks. I used them on um, This Ghost Poise and uh, Parallel Triangle that we've released. And there's a few probably unreleased ones as well. So, Do you often get inspired or scared in, of your dreams? Um, yeah, sometimes I do. Sometimes I have fucking really weird dreams that I can't... Put my finger on fever dreams were, were probably the most scary actually the few episodes when i was a kid where i had a fever and i'd have what i believe may be alice in wonderland syndrome um where i'd get disturbing sense of first of all objects that were far away would appear to be right in front of me but very small but but and then or very big and so i'd have this weird thing of not being able to gauge distance and scale would get mixed up and I'd have these weird fucking dreams that weren't really dreams. They were sort of almost like um, that bit like tripping or something where you, you'd kind of be trying to conceptualise things that were impossible. So you'd have like things like an impossibly heavy rock suspended from an impossibly thin filament or something that was sort of like an impossibly large curved surface that appeared flat because it was right next to your eyeball or like a sphere that was also a kind of weird folded like a pringle shape or a kind of or like a sort of banana weird banana shaped sphere and weird sounds that were like impossibly loud and this feeling of like touching your fingertips together but it also but it also being like this kind of weird like a textural confusion and, and the feeling of you the, the very edges of your fingertips touching the very kind of where they're almost not touching but they are being an, like an impossibly large surface none of this shit makes any sense but it was like at the time it was really vivid and really really fucking disturbing and you and it's sort of like you can feel a weird sense of the infinite and like the word perfect Something about the word perfect. I don't even know what that means, but yeah. Those were pretty disturbing episodes, I've got to say. I was pretty young. And not knowing the difference between little and big and like getting confused between things that was impossibly tiny and impossibly huge and then feeling like the same thing. And my brain being not being able to understand what that means. You know, I was probably only about seven or eight or something when I was having these episodes. I had quite a few of them because I had like a lot of fever when I was a kid because various health issues that I had. So, yeah, long story. I could go on about that for ages. But, yeah, basically the long and short of that is, yeah, dreams are fucking strange. And I have a lot of very strange dreams that are almost like science fiction scenarios, like very, very odd stuff. One where lightning was striking the ground, and it, but it was solid. So it was like immediately freezing into these giant kind of crystals. Anyway, I think people describing their dreams is quite boring, so I'm going to stop now. Um, I often think about that Paul McCartney from the Beatles quote where it's like you can't sit around and wait to be inspired. You have to put in the work to find inspiration. Yeah, for me, definitely, like I only get... I only get ideas when I'm halfway through doing something that was sort of directionless, right? So you can start off without any sense of what it is that you're trying to achieve and just twat things out. And then at some point, you kind of have an aha moment, you know? Um, but you have to dig to find it. It's not, it's not just going to reveal itself to you. It's not, I'm not the type of person who can sort of sit and imagine a, a track and then realise the track. It doesn't work for me like that at all. I have to be in, in it to see the stuff, you know. Does Dream 3 exist? I don't know. 
fuck Freud, all my homies hate Freud. This, <laughs> yeah, I did, I did, as a kid, right, I preferred Jung to Freud. Like, I don't, I think Freud was right about some stuff like uh, very early child development and how important it is and all that. I think he was probably on to, he had some good intuitions about that, but a lot of the stuff about everything being about your relationship with your mother is just like, what? Too much coke, man. But like, I like Jung and I like the idea of archetypes and I found it quite a romantic kind of appealing idea. I like the idea that your dreams are, are sort of acting out scenarios that are hard coded almost. I find that quite appealing, but I'm not sure what it means. And I'm not sure if he was right either. It's just appealing on some level, you know. Jung's one of those people I rediscover every few years and think, yeah, man, fucking hell. So yeah. More than, more than I would Freud. I find Freud a little bit, you know, he's like a dictator, isn't he, or something, you know. Any comments on the role humour plays in your music? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, it, it does, because I kind of like, I like absurd humour a lot. So there's a kind of, the, there's sometimes there is some, like I'd say, like getting Gantz Graf on MTV was, was kind of a situationist, absurdist move. It was about like, because we knew it was really good, don't get me wrong. Like, we knew Alex was onto something and that this was some heavy fucking, incredibly involving, kind of synesthetic, almost, kind of heavyweight moves, amazing CG and beautiful aesthetics, everything about it, we'd nailed it. But we also knew that putting that shit on MTV was like, it would be ridiculous to get people to watch that and be like, there you go, there's a pop video and it's just this fucking meshing cube flying around. Like, we, we thought that was funny. We thought it was, there was a kind of humour element to it. But at the same time, we knew it was good. So quite often there's, there's things like that in our tracks where we're just like, yeah, this is it's quite funny and absurd to do this because people wouldn't have the nuts to do it, you know, because they'd be too worried about meeting demographic criteria or whatever the fuck it is, right? So we don't really care about that stuff. We're just like, wow, this is really good, isn't it? Yeah, it'd be funny to do this. So yeah, there's ob there's like always a kind of, I'd say a cheekiness, but it's more about context than understanding that some things you're just not supposed to fucking do. But why? Why are you not supposed to do that? It's really good. Why are you not supposed to do it? You know, I have to be fucking, you know, driving around in a lowrider looking cool. Like that's what a pop video is supposed to be. Not like, you know, not some fucking cube going like that, you know what I mean, so. But that's what we like, so at the same time, why not, you know what I mean? Shoe bills, yeah, I've talked about shoe bills already, come on. Who doesn't like shoe bills? Fascists. Fascists don't like shoe bills, that's why you can't trust them. They used to be, Bleep used to sell the digitals for Keenel 2 track or Tekka Remix single. There's a vinyl rip that had pops in it and they took it down, wondering if more of a source for those tracks. Yeah, I mean, I could probably do that because it's only two tracks and I probably could find the dats, but they're in Manchester, so it'd be a bit. But at some point, yeah, if you really want, I'll get onto it and we can get them remastered and put up propers, proper digis for them. Because I like them tracks, they're good. And I think I know where they are, so yeah. Um, Chris Nolan, Dennis Villeneuve. Um, okay. <sighs> These are big topics, both of them. Um, and I don't want to just dismiss them like, and just be like, nah, you know what I mean? Because I think it's not fair. Uh, Chris Nolan, uh, right, okay, so I like his Batman films. I thought the third one was fucking stupid, where he's just going around with back pain for a fucking old film, just like, ah, me back. I was like, I don't, well, that's not what you want, is it? It's a fucking Batman film, you don't want that. So I didn't, and I thought Bane was shit. I don't like Bane. He's one of the least interesting characters for me, you know. 
and his voice he was just doing a bad impression of Patrick McGuin I think so um, not a fan of the third Batman film I like the first two I think I think Heath, Heath Ledger's joke is quite good it was sort of at first I was like oh he's just doing the Jack Nicholson one but with a twist but like I actually quite like it he's charismatic enough and he nails it and you know the scene with the pencil and the table is just fantastic the whole scene in the room where he's in there is just brilliant I love that um, there's some yeah there's some elements of those films that I like but I don't really don't like the kind of you know the kind of some of the kind of meta narrative stuff you know the sort of tacit implication that it's fine to just fucking monitor everybody if you've got a bigger purpose that needs to be served like just fuck off man like no like there's, there's some stuff in there that I just can't get down with um some of the action scenes were good though like all the driving in a tunnel stuff I think it's all really smartly done um I think the new Batman film has a beautiful feel to it but there's something I've only seen it once though but there's something a bit off about it but anyway I don't want to just talk about Batman films um but Nolan yeah I mean I thought I thought Inception was messy I didn't really like it it just felt too long I think a lot of Nolan's films feel a bit long to me I think um yeah I thought what's that latest one called now um the backwards one it was all right it just didn't make a lot of sense from a physics point of view really i found it a little bit ah this is just this isn't causality what's happening like it's very difficult for me to wrap my head around how that would work on a just on a physical level and i'm sure that a lot of people probably felt like that watching it tenet that's the one yeah and but there was some i quite liked how neatly the story dovetailed with itself i thought that was clever but it was a little bit like that. I don't know whether that's enough. But yeah, anyway, there were some elements of it I liked, but, you know, largely I just thought, hmm. Um, I think Memento's very, very good. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say, really. Villeneuve, I don't know. I don't know. Didn't really like his Dune. I thought it was a bit beige and a bit Zimmer. A bit wah. Even though it wasn't really that from Zimmer, but it still was a bit. But it's just a bit beige. Not that I don't like beige, I like beige, but I just don't want to watch it for fucking two hours. Two hours of beige. Um, it was just all a little bit unimaginative. I, fa I found Lynch's Dune to be way more visually exciting and kind of arresting. Even though it was a, it was a mess for lots of fucking reasons. Um, I just found the aesthetic of it way more interesting and innovative and exciting. But it might just be an age thing that I'd seen it at a certain age. But, you know, that I, I think I might even prefer the Lynch Dune to the Villeneuve Dune. Anyway. Arrival, I want to like. I kind of like the idea of the language being how it is. I quite like Wolfram's involvement in that. I think that's all very interesting, but I think the whole kind of time travel sort of thing in there is a bit... And I think the whole kind of attitude and the grandeur thing... What what bugs me about this new sci-fi stuff is that it's just, it's just trying to bowl audiences over with a lot of grandeur and kind of epic feels and not getting in there with some mindfuck amazing ideas. I prefer sci-fi that's about mindfuck amazing ideas personally, but you know, yeah. Um, Wong Kar Wai I don't know and I will check. So I recommend me some Wong Kar Wai. Um, I watched that The Burning recently and thought that was quite good. It's fucking weird though. Oh, actually, what film did I watch recently? Um, the Innocents, Norwegian one. About kids. That was really good. I thought. Anyway.
what do I feel about the Arteca discard? I've never been on there. I don't really discard much. I, I've used it a little bit. Um, I used IRC a little bit back in the day, but it was just too many people hang out on IRC. Is why I didn't like about IRC back in the day, though, was that it was like, it was just somewhere that people would go every day. And they'd be like, oh, morning, June. Oh, what are you having for dinner today? And it was just like a bit, oh, fucking hell, I can't do it. So, yeah, I don't know how I feel about it. I probably wouldn't hang out there myself, but maybe I would. I don't know. I'm not that much of a kind of constant socialiser. I tend to socialise sporadically. So it's probably not the kind of thing I would do. But, um, and being in a community, I kind of, you know, I'm, I were more of a kind of, I'm, I'm more of a message board person than a kind of instant chat in a group type person. I way prefer talking to people individually and I don't mind posting things and waiting. So, you know. Um, and yeah, I quite liked, you know, originally when before 4chan turned to shit, I quite liked how fast it was and how you weren't really evaluating stuff based on personas, but that's a completely different thing, isn't it? So we don't need to talk about that. Is Andy Maddox Velocity Kendall? Nope. Um, what is the vocal sample being chopped up in second seat? Um, oh yeah, yeah, I'm not telling you. Um, do you speak to Boards of Canada often? Nah, I ain't talked to Boards in fucking hell, probably 20 years. Um, Is it a Surrey Perry remix you play in live? I don't know which bit you mean. But not intentionally, but it might just be the same keys. Um, I haven't noticed, I don't know. In early 00s, I saw you perform one night at Bowery Ballroom in NYC, and then the next afternoon at Princeton. Yeah, there's a picture of that Princeton gig on Wikipedia, and it's like dated way wrong it was 2001 that gig so i don't know why it's dated it's dated something like 2007 or something which doesn't even make sense i don't even think we were doing gigs that year but yeah um that princeton gig i don't know the booking came through our agent at the time so i wouldn't know how it actually came about if you know what i mean it would have just been added to the list because the date made sense in a routing from a routing perspective so but Paul Lansky was there I remember meeting him there he was really nice it was nice to it was good to meet him because I, I really rated his stuff at that point still do but you know I think I'd only discovered it a couple of years before that so I was just like oh wow fucking we're at Princeton we've got to meet Paul and then somebody hooked us up with him and he, he was really turned out to be a really nice guy so that was good um so yeah that happened and on that same tour, we had Curtis Road supporting us on one day, and we had Yasune Tone on another, because we tried to get local support to where we could. So in LA, we had Curtis. That was fucking ace. That was a really good gig. He had just like a red light on him. The vibe in that room was amazing. Um, yeah, the Princeton thing, I don't, so I don't know how it came about. It was a bit mad afterwards, because we fucking ended up in some fucking, fucking, some kind of college party where everyone was using giant bongs and fucking taking their clothes off and stuff. That was a bit insane. I think Russell got off with some girl. Um, yeah, it was mad. It was mad, actually. It was chaos. American students really party, don't they? They really go through, like, whoa, we're going to party. It's just like, fucking hell, you're really going for it, you lot. Right, um... Right, where are we now? Do you think electronic music is too much about gear and fancy equipment nowadays? I mean, you know, there's a lot of like... You're going to always get this, you know. I know the best way of doing this. That's the only piece of equipment you should use or, you know, like, you're going to get them people anyway. You've always had them in the sort of sound world. 
when I was in college, because I went to sound engineering college briefly in the late 80s, it was like that then. You know, people had very kind of fixed ideas about what, you know, about things being objectively better than other things. You know what I mean? That kind of thinking. Um, I find it all a little bit. Uh, and this sort of idea about fancy equipment is a very kind of, you know, you, you have to believe in a, in, in a kind of, in, in there being shared values and these kind of objective truths about equipment and then have arguments with other people about objective truths about equipment. It's just all a little bit fucking hell. What, does taste ever come into this? Like, what makes a piece of equipment fancy? Just the price or the fact that everybody says it's good? You know, the, the, you know, a mass kind of mass approval, like, you know, what, what is it Super Ant said? You can't trust the public. The public like they said some shit thing like the public like Britney Spears or some shit thing like that, and you're like, well, you know, not that I'm not dissing Britney Spears there, by the way. I'm just saying, but you know what I mean. It's just that idea that like it's not just because lots of people think something's good doesn't make it good. Do you know what I mean? Um, there are lots of reasons why that might be the case. So yeah, I don't know, like. A lot to think about but yeah i don't know i mean i think you know some equipment's good to me right i like some equipment so do i think music's about that i mean probably to some extent with me yeah i mean if i make a tool and think fucking hell this is ace i'm getting ace shit out of this tool then it's i guess that's fancy equipment so yeah i guess in you know it, it must be about that to some extent but do i think you know that you need fancy equipment to make good music no that, you know, you don't. You can make good music on shit equipment. You can make shit music on good equipment. It's not really about, there's not like a linear relationship between the two things. So, you know, it could be more more, more about that than it needs to be, if you know what I mean. Um, you know, it's mainly just about flipping stuff and having, having a fly idea or moving in a weird way, you know what I mean? It's like, do you have to have good shoes to be a good dancer? I mean, maybe it helps but it's not you know there's a lot more to it than that isn't there so um were you guys into break dancing or sports yeah i mean rob is quite a good popper um partly because his uncle moved to la in the 80s so he's got that kind of tie to la and la culture and all that and he kind of so he's got that going on and he sort of I, he's quite good. He doesn't pop anymore. You have to kind of get him a bit drunk. But, um, yeah, he can pop pretty good. And, like, Jed is a good popper. I'm, like, not very good. I'm quite a shit popper. But I made mean tapes. So I got to hang out with all the cool electro kids because I, I was, like, the DJ guy. You know what I mean? So... Not really very good. I mean, I you know, I could like, I could turtle backspin, I could do about half a windmill and then I'd just fall over because my legs weren't long enough to properly windmill. So I was kind of like a shit break dancer. I was really interested in it though. Um, you know, and I, I, I like dressed the part and I made good tapes, so. But I had mates who were fucking good dancers, like really good, kind of embarrassingly good. And it's mad to think that they're all just working quite boring jobs now. You know what I mean? And they're not really interested in music anymore, but they were so fucking into it when they were like 11, 12. So it's mad thinking back to them days, like how much, how important music was to us all in middle school and how much of a big deal it was, you know? And how massive electro was in the 80s in the UK. It's strange talking to Americans who don't really, didn't really have a lot of access to it unless they were of clubbing age. So if they were younger, they wouldn't have been exposed to it much other than seeing little bits and bobs on telly. We were seeing fucking loads of it. There was like countless BBC Two documentaries on it and fucking, you know, we had Wild Style. I remember in 83 or 84, Wild Style was on TV in the UK um, and Style Wars um, and Beat Street and everybody had seen Beat Street and Breakdance. But you had like the more obscure kids had seen Style Wars um, and Wild Style, everybody knew because everyone knew someone who had a copy of it. And, you know what I mean? There was all that was going on. But you also had all these weird documentaries like that BBC Hip Hop Street History, whatever it was called, like Beat This or whatever. Um, and these weird like bombing and, and all these other weird 
shows, like programs, one-off things. And then later you had shit like Bad Meaning Good that was on and that was weird because we all thought Tim Westwood was a fucking weirdo. Being from up north we were exposed to him really so. Up north we had Stu Allen so. Um, and before that we had Mike Shaft. Um, and, and I guess before that, I mean there was Mike Shaft and he was playing like, you know, the Chad Jackson Best of 84 mix which was a huge kind of thing around Manchester. Everyone had that on tape. And then there was like... And just in general, like people in school listening to Mike Shaft and then later, for a little bit, it was Lee Brown and then it was Stu Allen. Um, Stu Allen had a huge impact on Manchester music scene in general. He really shaped it. And plus we had that shop spinning, which I first went in spinning when I was, I think, 12. Me and my mate Oggy went to Manchester and, and Oggy's dad dropped us off and just says, I'll meet you back here in an hour. And me and Oggy went off to spinning because Oggy knew where spinning was. And, we, and I remember walking in there and it just being like really small and really full of people and everyone jumping and just just hip hop and electro tunes and just being blown away and just thinking fuck it was the, like that was the first shop that I'd been in that sold imports I couldn't believe the price of the records there was albums were like £8.50 which was unheard of and I was thinking fuck me it's so dear all this so I'd just save up for weeks and weeks to just buy one record, you know, and the rest of it I'd just tape off Stu Allen. So, yeah, I don't know. I could go on about that shit for hours, but it gets boring for all you young people. You said in the last AMA that you don't consider your work your music is experimental how would you consider it it's just fucking what i'm into isn't it it's just music it's just tunes i like how can we get your bandmate to bandmate to join twitch as well seems like there's a lot only he could answer yeah there is quite probably anything about his tunes like he's on here already i think i've i'm following him so if you look on my follows you'll see him he's like arteca with a seven instead of a t so Parallel Sons is um, a Nord lead one through um, a Lexicon Reverb and then slabs of that were then taken and kind of edited and faded into each other kind of thing. So I had loads of different notes in the DAW which I think was DP at the time and then I was doing loads of crossfading between all these different slabs. So yeah, it was a bit bit long process really to get the result, considering it's just a sort of short ambient thing, but it was it gives it that weird wet but dry sound. So um ah, someone else who got the depth perception fevers. Yeah, they're weird, right? They're fucking weird. I'm not really sure what to make of that. Um Impossibly loud noise. It's funny seeing all you lot being like, oh shit, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because them dream things are fucking weird and nobody really talks about them. I found one thread once on the 14 Times forum about this and it was just all people who'd had it and who were all going, shit, yeah, I had that when I was a kid. And they'd never talked to, about it or if they had brought it up in conversation, other people didn't know, but... Yeah, uh, I think quite a lot of people experience it and don't really have the words for it and then forget about it. Um, any fond memories of seeing Jeff Mills play? Yeah, at the Orbit in Leeds. Fucking absolutely slamming. Like, I'd never seen anything like it. It was mad. It was just like... It was like someone slamming the door over and over. It was like so banging. And not in a gabber way where you're kind of bouncing. It was just like this kind of bang, 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 bang. Just absolutely banging. Um, yeah, like really relentless. You know, when I first heard Mills, right? I first heard Waveforms. And I thought it was German or something because of his name, Jeff Mills. You know, it didn't, didn't really see, weren't like a typical black guy surname so I was thinking what is this like I thought he was some kind of 
European or like German bloke or something like that, or maybe American white guy. Because it just sounded so not like black music. It was just so banging and kind of relentless. And then, um, but then when I heard him DJing, it kind of made a bit more sense because you could tell he'd been an hip hop DJ because he was really mixing it up loads and there was a real roughness to it. And I got this, that was when it clicked because I was like, oh fuck yeah, they're tools that he's using and he's using them in this rough way. So yeah, I fucking love Mills. So much energy and kind of, and really good tension building. I seen him play at Lost once and he was just he was doing shit like just pulling the kick out for a good four minutes and just getting everybody really hyped. And then he'd just flip the kick in and it just, the room just lifts. Like, I know it's such a basic move, but he'd have the nuts to do it for ages. Like he's one of the best tension building DJs of techno that I've ever seen. Just amazing. When he was at his peak, kind of mid to late nineties, just untouchable. Like so much funk as well, you know. Um, but sort of hidden within this relentlessness and hardness. So yeah, I really rate Mills. Mills was great. Love Mills. You can't not rate Mills really. I think especially having grown up on hip hop, you really get a sense of what he's trying to do. Um, Cause he's not doing hip hop stylistically or rhythmically or anything like that, but he just gets it. You can tell he gets it. Do you do a lot of lucid dreaming? I talked about lucid dreaming in the last one. Um, not intentionally, no, but it happens by accident sometimes. Um, I am a job. I like that. I am a jo am I a job? Am I a job? <laughs> am I a job? <laughs> Hey. Yeah, someone's saying they don't really remember their dreams anymore. Are you a chronic stoner by any chance? Because when I was smoking loads and loads, I used to forget my dreams all the time. I'm sure I was having them, but I just didn't wouldn't remember them ever. Only if I woke up like mid dream, I'd remember them. What's your opinion on cocaine? Do you enjoy it or hate it? Um, I don't really like it. I I don't like what it does to other people. Um, one thing coke does, I don't know if you know this, but like coke, what it does is it makes you less sensitive to negative criticism. And so, which is an odd thing for a drug to do. It's very specific. Um, but if you read about it, you'll it'll bear out what I'm saying. It's not, I'm not just pulling this out my ass. It's like, you know, the studies that will reflect this. And then when you're not on coke later, chronically and for quite a long time you'll be more sensitive to negative criticism so there's a problem that cokeheads have in that they're really fucking thin-skinned when they're not on coke and when they're on coke they're wankers because they can't detect when other people are pissed off with them it's not because they're actually wankers it's just that they don't get that feedback from looking at other people's eyes and faces that they need to fucking rein it in a bit you know so they can be real pricks and you know, that can manifest itself as a kind of arrogance. Oh, I've got a woodpecker here, drinking out of some water. Maybe you can see this guy. Woodpeckers are fucking cool. Right, so, yeah, so, um... Yeah, I don't know if I... I've, I don't know, I, I wouldn't say I hate cocaine, but I just, like... It's one of the worst party drugs for me. It's, it's one of the drugs that makes socialising really difficult but makes other people enjoy being out. It makes the person on it enjoy being out and everybody else think, Christ, what a prick, you know? So if you want to seem like a prick, yeah, do loads of coke, you know? I don't think it really works socially, but, you know? I guess if you've got really bad anxiety, maybe it might help you. 
personally but I'd just if you're going to do it I'd advise never going anywhere when you're on it so don't be around other humans yeah Freud personal bias and skeletons yeah I think he was just talking about himself a lot um, yeah Freud was a cokehead right so Um, thoughts on V snares yeah he's fucking brilliant isn't he he's like he's got such a kind of there's a kind of, such an identifiable character musically I can always spot his tracks like they're really easy to spot you know they, they feel different to other people I mean, I know said, I've heard it said that he's sort of what kind of tip he's on and all that, but I don't really, I think with his stuff it's all about character and you can hear his character, like, immediately. And he's certainly really good at arrangements. Like, I always really rated his arrangements. They're, like, odd. You know, they have a kind of... Um, he's really good at building tension as well, I think. My grandma worked at Kurtzweil. That's cool. I like that. My grandma worked at Kurtzweil. That's better than my dad worked at Nintendo. Um, Seeing you all arguing about Freud and Jung here. This is an old argument, by the way, this debate. It's not really worth having nowadays, but, you know. When I was young, I found it a bit exciting. What's your favourite food drink? I've seen that picture of you guys enjoying a bowl of pasta. Have you? I don't know. I don't think I've seen that. Um, Where's that from? Um, favourite food drink? Uh, fucking hell, I don't really have a favourite. I don't have favourites of anything. You know what I mean? It's all mood dependent. I can't answer favourites questions. So let's not do them anymore. Um, with Phoenicia. Oh, that. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, like... There's a story that goes along with that picture, but I'm not going to tell it. I'll get in bother. Ever listen to Black Midi? Don't think so. Favourite books? Literary writers, philosophers. I mean, I like Philip K. Dick. I used to like Vonnegut when I was young. You know, it was sort of irreverent and it was an interesting approach to describing humans sort of appeals to the bit of me that used to like Mark and Mindy when I was a kid so um, and yeah I quite like Philip K Dick still um, I like his shorts more than I like his novels actually and I've read most of them now um, I really like that one The Electric Ant that's one of my favourite stories of his it's just your head fuck the whole idea of it is just just fucking brilliant. Um, Favourite Norwegian artist? Uh, Lassie Marhaug. I'm saying his name wrong, I know, because I'm not nosh enough. But yeah, I love his stuff. Lassie's really good. Um, yeah. There's another artist I want to say, but I'm, I'm deliberately not saying it. So. Third Batman was pretty whack, yeah. Fucking, oh, me back, oh, me back for two hours. Fucking hell. Don't think so. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's just, it's really bad. It's like, if you want to see that, I'll just fucking go around my dad's house. You know, fucking hell. Do you have any thoughts on ontology? You know, I mean, I'm British and I grew up in the 70s, so it's it's appealing to me because, you know, like, and I really like Richard Littler's stuff, Scarfuck. Like, I really like that. Um, and I like, obviously, I like Boards of Canada, right? And there's a kind of element of that in their stuff. And it was partly what drew me to it was that, that they had this and they kind of... And it was clear that it was there, even though they've spent a lot of time in Canada and they'd sort of not really been in Scotland, they still had this something, this, this tug in this direction. And yeah, I mean, I kind of, I can relate to a lot of it because I've grown up in a, in a kind of, not in a really necessarily very spooky town, but in a, in a town where you were close to areas where there was spooky history. Um, so yeah, it kind of, and, and my mum's always been a little bit interested in the unexplained. We had all weird books on the unexplained. Actually, first the first time I got really spun out and, and fucking terrified was reading about, in one of her books, about spontaneous human combustion. Holy fuck. Like, that terrified me as a kid. I kept thinking it was going to happen to me. Like, you do, don't you? When you read about things like that, you're like, oh God, what would that be like? Oh my God. Um... So yeah, like, and looking at old pictures of, like, you know, supposed ghost photographs, which should seem a bit silly now to think about, but as a kid I would look at them, spend ages staring at them, thinking, what is that? What am I looking at there? Like, because I didn't really understand double exposure and these very basic things, you know. And the idea of ectoplasm appearing during seances, you know, that was quite... The fuck's happening there, like... What were they doing? Were they just getting some weird jelly and just throwing it around? <laughs> like, what were they, do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, oh, I'm gonna pretend there's some ectoplasm, so. Um, yeah, so, like, obviously, like, the whole idea of it is a bit appealing. You have to excuse me for a sec while well, I just screw this on. And, yeah, I don't know, like, I, I can relate. Uh, but I think as a sort of music scene and all that, I'm not that interested. But I kind of like... I like spooky things, so I guess I can sort of relate to it. But it gets a little bit like... I get what buttons you're pushing, and I get what references you're going for. And so it becomes a little bit... You know, done after a while. But yeah, there are overlaps with that stuff that I really rate. Like, I'd say that, you know, that... There are overlaps between sort of Boards of Canada and Look Around You and Richard Littler and these kind of things where it's sort of a slightly scary alternative version of what the 70s felt like when you were a kid. So it's sort of more about your memory of the 70s than what the 70s were actually like, you know what I mean? And that's, that, I find that really relatable. Like I love Look Around You, I think it's fantastic. The first series you know, where it's doing experiment, ITV experiment, Granada. Because I grew up with that shit on TV and used to watch it and feel, you know, like it was all a little bit weird. The weird voiceover and the weird blue background. And yeah, it was weird. So anyway, that's my comment on ontology. Which isn't really related to ontology at all, is it? So, um, I need to check Lynch's due. Simmer always gets blah. Oh my god, we st is that how far up we are? Am I that far behind already? The original Star Wars was pretty beige. Yeah, I guess it was, you know. I got this feeling about Star Wars that it massively rips off Gatchaman. Which, for reasons, which I'll explain if you're interested, but I won't now, so. Um. Right, I need to piss, so I'm gonna go and piss and then be back shortly.
won't be that long. I'm going to stop. Thoughts on the amount of fans that are also part of the furry fandom who also like to combine your music with furry stuff. I assume you most likely don't care about that type of stuff, but it's something I keep thinking about now. Yeah, it don't bother me at all. Like, I, I think, like... Yeah, furry stuff's weird to me, but it's not, like, alienating. I don't find... I'm not, like, repulsed by it or anything, so... I'm not... It takes quite a lot to repulse me. Like, I'm not... I'm not weirded out by it. The way a lot of people my age seem a bit weirded out by it. But, um, maybe because I don't think it's that weird to want to dress up as an animal and go around being an animal character. I think that's not that weird. Um, mentioned le using some machine learning what areas of composition design sound design do you find it useful for um yeah so what i don't want to reveal because it's not it's not stuff i'm using out there yet but will be because it's already in the setup and it's like um i don't think it'd be that obvious what i'm what i'm using it for and i don't like really saying in advance of using things what i'm going to be using them for so but yeah it's not using it in a way that i've heard other people using it so that's cool at least um because i was quite skeptical about where, how useful it could be to me for quite a while it took me a while to f figure out a way of using it that i was comfortable with and yeah i think i found it so that's cool but i don't want to talk about it yet i'll talk about it later though promise Greg Bear's Blood Music. No, but I'll read it. Defo. Um, do I practice meditation of any kind? Um, not like formally, but I do a lot of staring into space and drifting. Um, so regarding mindfulness like so I've read studies that say that what the, the brain is most active when it's not doing anything when you're not tasking it to do anything so you're not thinking about anything in particular right consciously so you're just kind of drifting and letting your unconscious guide where what you're thinking about and kind of not really thinking about anything in particular and that's apparently when your brain does most of its long range forecasting so it does its predictions and it kind of builds predictive models for the for what's going to occur in the future and mindfulness gets in the way of that by making you focus too much on the present so i like my brain to do its thing so i'm a little bit skeptical about how powerful mindfulness is and that's why I'm a little bit reluctant to say that I do anything approaching guided meditation, but I do let my mind wander a lot and I do a lot of staring into space and just, I guess you could call it daydreaming, but you know, just randomly thinking about things, but not in a very directed way, just letting my mind wander and thinking through things and not even thinking necessarily, just staring into space. Um, CCRU, I don't know what that is Tell us what that is Accelerationism I don't think I was interested in that It sounds If that's that shit from the late 90s 
that bloke who seemed to me to be a little bit of a kind of crypto fascist. I can't fucking remember his name now. Tell me his name and I'll tell you if it's the right guy I'm thinking of. So I'll come back to that question in a minute when I get further down the chat. Do you do any drawing, painting outside of graffiti? No, not really. Um, most of the letter forms and stuff, because I'm a bit fascinated by letter forms, cause, just because I'm a little bit disabled <laughs> with regard to letter forms, so, which is a complicated topic. Um, did you set out to make XI double album? Yeah, just it was just we don't set out to make anything really. It just sort of everything just grows and assembles itself. The music makes itself in a way. Um, popcorn, butter, or canola oil? I'm not sure I know the, what the difference is because I'm not like. I mean butter, I guess, because that's normally what I'd use. But I've used olive oil in the past. Like, but the, the light stuff, because it has a higher smoke point than butter, so. So yeah, I'll tend to use olive oil for things if I can get away with it, because it's just quite good for you, from what I understand, so. Um, how do you synthesise those short yet heavy kicks like in Eco 4 and the live sets? Um... Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, it's just a bit hard to describe the patch, but yeah, I mean, the transient part of it's fixed. So that's just sort of hard coded. And then the rest of the kick is just, uh, it has a flexible release, but I'm sort of uh, just very short. So it's a drum sim that we made. It's a bit hard to describe in a few sentences. I'd probably just have to show you the patch and I'm not likely to do that. So, sorry. Bit Sophie have talked about that already, because um, Sophie wanted it, so I've got all the bits to product. I've got all the bits, all of it. I've got all the electron patches as well. So if I ever get my electrons back off mic, I'd be able to recreate the tracks using the electrons, which is quite cool, isn't it? It's quite a cool thing to do to send all that stuff out. Sophie was cool. Um. What drew you both towards the complete nonsense track titles from Choristis onwards? Um, they're not nonsense, um, but it was mainly a byproduct of the way that we started having to file vast amounts of stuff because we were producing a lot more material at that point because it was quicker to produce it. So we needed a kind of filing system that worked, that made sense to us. Um, but there's a lot of our earlier track titles were nonsense as well. Like, what the fuck does Augmatic Disport mean, really? Augmatic Disport. It's not really... That doesn't mean anything, does it? Or maybe it does. I don't know. Answers on a postcard. Um, hello, Spiral. I have a T-shirt with a gaping anus on it with the caption, make America gape again. I've never worn it outside. Well, that's on you, isn't it? You need to get that shit worn. I'd, I'd definitely wear that in my house. Um, problem with MIDI 2 is no one wants to spend the money to be the first one to implement it. We were asked to consult on that. Um, and when I told him that I didn't like DAW sequencing because it had um, because it didn't communicate the note length to the instruments, they were like, well, we can't do anything about that because <laughs> everyone wants to use keyboards. So that was the end of my fucking interaction with them over that. But I'd have loved to have been involved in it. I mean, basically, I think it's going to be good for our microtonal geeks when it eventually lands. So it is a thing now. Yeah, it's already. Nick Land, yes. Yes, I was thinking about Nick Land. And no, I'm not interested in his shit at all. I find it really kind of... 
it's like fucking it, it really reminds me of like a British noise artist who's a bit of an edgemeister I find it deeply annoying so tell me what you think about Nick Land see if we're on the same page Um. I've heard you dream all the time that dreams are like noise when the signal disappears, but the noises they're always like signal to noise ratio. Yeah, I'm probably down with that. I mean, that's how it feels for me because I get these weird intrusive ideas and thoughts. They don't seem to come from anywhere rational. And I'm not making them appear. And I get this thing a lot when I'm working where I'll get random a memory of a random place that's associated with a certain type of activity when I'm patching or when I'm tracking. And it'll just sit there and I'll be kind of in this place. And it's quite often from a viewpoint that I've not been in physically. It's almost like a camera was somewhere else in a, in a part of the world that I'm familiar with. I don't know if anybody else gets that. They're quite intrusive. Um, where's your buddy? Bristol. I don't know what doing. Probably having a barbecue or something. Um, I know in the past you said it might be boring, but I bet a ton of us would love to be a fly in the world if you do a Mac stream or something one day. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I know, like, people are interested in how we do things, but I think it's better if you just do your own things and let us do our things. You know what I mean? So, I don't think it's that exciting. I think a lot of it is that there's too much trial and error in it for it to be that informative for you. Because seeing when I have my aha moments and how I refine things down might not be that interesting to you. Because I think you'd just be listening to a lot of stuff and thinking, this is just shit, what's he doing? You know, but and I'm thinking the same thing, you know, this is just shit, what am I doing? So I don't think that's that useful. Do you have a feeling of how the new patch will turn out like, yeah, yeah you sort of, I'm guided by intuition a lot of the time. Um, Favourite gigs of yours were Shoreditch Car Park and in particular the Warehouse Project with LFO. Oh yeah. That first, that was the first Warehouse Project in Manchester when we had lasers for once, which was fun. Um, do you think you'd go back to that sound? That was the 2005 Electron sound, so unlikely that I'd go back to that sound in particular. Because it was very much a product of its time. I mean, the electrons probably only happened because of shit that had been, that had come out on warp. Because I know Daniel Anson were a massive warp head. And, you know, we were using combinations of gear, me and Rob, to do like quite odd things. Um, and so on. And, and the electron kind of presented it back to us in a box with a kind of, you know, a kind of tracker underbelly, if you like, that, you know, and, and it was a kind of rationalisation of a, of a lot of ideas that would have previously involved using lots of obscure particular pieces of equipment. So, and it happened when it happened for a reason, and I'm not sure that you could do that again. You know, that piece of hardware was very much a product of the musical environment that it grew out of, and then I'm not sure that I would want to go back to that position in time space and do that again so i don't know probably not but they're only on loan i've, I've just lent them boxes out because i got i kind of reached a ceiling with them and i thought okay i'll just lend them to somebody who's got a different set of ideas and a different approach to me and see what they come up with so mike's already doing tunes with them so that's nice how messy are your patches um, yeah, I tend not to slam stuff together, or if I do slam stuff together, I tidy it up very quickly. I'm, I'm quite a tidy patcher these days. I didn't used to be, um, but it just became necessary for legibility and all that. So, yeah, I don't really find it difficult to come back to stuff now. I'm, I'm quite quick at, but I also have a very particular way of laying things out. So I'm, I'm, you know, that helps to have a kind of, I wouldn't call it disciplined really, but it's just habit based you know so I can kind of recognise things quite easily now they're not it's not hard for me to read my own patches I find it harder to read other people's but that again that just depends on how they patch 
like a lot of the Max tutorial patches are extremely clearly laid out and people like Graham Wakefield are, are extremely clear in their layout and explanations and comments and stuff so I think Graham's patches in particular have been really useful for learning gen um, but yeah there are other people who, whose patches I'll see and just think what the hell's going on like I, I just can't even figure this out and if there's too much abstraction in it it can be a little bit difficult to kind of dig in and out of all the layers to try and figure out exactly what the signal flow is so I tend to leave things as upfront as I can and use abstraction only where it's necessary if I if I need to make gains by having lots of instances of, of a process or whatever so um, <laughs> there's this comment about FL Studio and Ableton from Vectroid I kind of like yeah FL's really different to other programs in that sense but um, I don't know you just use what you use don't you I wouldn't why don't you just use all these programs instead of just using Ableton and then worrying about it I mean just get all the other programs as well and use them all and you'll find that some of them are better at certain tasks than others, you know. It won't take you long to learn Logic or Reaper or fucking any of these, because basically the fundamentals are the same. It's just some of them are better at doing certain tasks, so. Polyend, yeah, I, I've seen Polyend stuff. Like Polyend Tracker and Polyend Play, they, they look fun, honestly. And I'd probably use them if I was using MIDI gear, so... You know, I don't, I think they're on the right track, no pun intended. Um, FFT plugins that I've enjoyed. Um, hmm. Strictly FFT stuff, I don't know, because you never know like how much of a thing is FFT. Like I always thought Adaptive Herb was a nice plugin, but I find it a bit identifiable. But then if you need something to ring out like that does, then it's good. I think, um, but it's not really strictly FFT, is it? So, um, I don't know, like what is an FFT plugin? Because a lot of stuff, I suppose like Tom Herb's Spectral Compand is, is really good and well designed. You know, that's good. That, that does what it says on the tin really well. Um, so yeah, probably something that Tom Herb's done. Probably that. Because I think that's quite a solid, useful little tool. I haven't used it in a while, because I've done one in MSP that's similar. So, sorry Tom for ripping you off, but you know, I needed it to be native. Um, how do you usually deal with durations in Mac? So the duration is generated by the sequencer and then just sent to the synth. And then the synth, depending on position and duration, will do different things. So it's not really a standard setup in that sense. It's a little bit odd. But it makes it a bit easier for me because I think more in terms of serial durations than like absolute position. And it's nice being able to have the, the notes changing depending on duration and position so yeah that's about as descriptive as I can be without either being really boring or revealing too many secret source details do you feel like there's any particular live sets that should be regarded as album quality or discussed alongside other records or are you find that live sets are something more for the hardcore fans yeah I mean it's just you know from from my point of view Nowadays, they're like probably more work than the albums are. Um, because there needs to be enough flexibility and variation within it, but it also needs to be very designed. So I don't want it to be something that's just like off the cuff. Um, because of the way I work is too trial and error for that to be useful to me. But at the same time, I don't want it to be like nailed down. So there's some degree of I don't know flexibility that it, that's then building that into a, a long piece like an hour long 
piece is, is quite demanding compared to making an album where everything's just finished because you want the flexibility to always sound good so you don't want it to be like flexible in a way where it's just going to sound shit if you just wab some parameters so you know um, so yeah how work things are it's sort of an awkward question like you can bust out the live set really quickly but the work that goes into making it beforehand can be quite long so yeah I don't know I don't really I don't really dictate what people are gonna how people are gonna approach things personally like I've found some people's live albums to be more rewarding than, than some of their recorded stuff depending on what kind of band they are um, like there's you know that Black Sabbath live, live in Paris 1971 or whatever it is that's like phenomenally good gig that's much better than the recorded versions um, so you know like I think sometimes it doesn't I, I don't approach things as being like this is the product and this is just a live set which is the way a lot of other people do so I think maybe I just have a different view on it to other people and we're not going to I don't expect other people to approach it like that cause, just because I do you know um, someone saying I get the same places all the time when patching yeah right it's weird right it's weird why places and what is that what's happening there why, why is this what's this tie between carrying out a little process mentally or physically and, and sort of having this particular place that pops up why, why is that going on it's dead weird they don't seem to relate to each other really Of all your generative works, and I know you guys are all about pushing the bounds of sound, do you ever think of releasing a work that utilises classical instruments solely? Yeah, so like, no, I mean, generally no, because I'm not that interested in, in doing it. It's just not... I don't know. I'm just not that interested. I don't think there's enough room for me doing a lot of trial and error experiment. Ex I don't want to call them experiments, but experimentation at least for me involving trying out lots of different ideas and then finding something that works. So doing that with classical instruments would be really time consuming, but it is something I could do in theory, but I don't know. I don't know, maybe, but I know Workham have made a thing that can translate any sound file into a, into a classical score can't remember what it's called now um, so I guess you could use that but be a bit suck it and see you know so I don't know um, I've had dreams that are like long convoluted TV series great question do you still have your CME bit stream nah Rob's got it, that was Rob's but I think he's still got it yeah Everything's on Sisex. I know he's just like Sisex demon, Rob. So, um, do you ever actively go bird watching? Nah. Username checks out though. I am a horse. Wait a minute. I am a horse. Why did it see? This is so weird, this I am a horse thing. Why are you saying that? I had the... There's some hardcore track or something that says I am a horse. And I was trying to... Me and Rob were trying to remember what it was the other week. I am a horse. I am a horse. What is it? Is it some meme thing that I've misremembered? I, I was thinking it was an hardcore track. I don't know, I'm fucking... My memory's all fucked up these days. I'm gonna try electron Sunday, but don't pine for gear anymore. I just make noise. Yeah, I've heard you were sent box high scores before it was released on Scam. Um, yeah. So if so, have you heard any of their super rare stuff? 
I don't know how rare. I mean, I had old tunes one and two on tape um, before Scam picked them up. Um, so, yeah, don't know. A long time ago, all that now. Have you ever used a DX7 before? Yeah, a bit in college, but I didn't. I didn't get my head around it there, and then. I think I understand it now because I had a DX100 for quite a while in the 90s and I understood that pretty pretty fully and then I just jumped straight into having an FS1 hour which was a lot deeper but um, so the answer, real answer is no but I'm sure I could get my head around it what's this now How do you process Milk D's rap in the track Milk DX? It's not Milk D. It's a DX100. Um, but it was in its pitch bend. Uh, and it's just played with the pitch bend. And it sounded a lot like Milk D. Because it was sort of going... So, yeah, that was it. It was just... That's why it's called Milk DX. Because it's a DX100 that sounds like Milk D. So... It's weird people actually think it's a sample. Because it, I mean, it really did sound quite a lot like Milk D on the day. I was like, to Rob, listen to that, it sounds like Milk D. So that were it, that were, that were it. So, there you go. Uh, so yeah, a lot easier than processing the vocal. Any chance of an all out noise album? It's too conservative noise. It's just like you, you already know what the parameters are before you even walk in the room. There's a few artists I like. Like, I like Lasse. I've mentioned him before. I like Incapacitants. I like bits of Merzbow stuff, but I mainly like Merzbow when he's not being very noisy. So, you know, what constitutes noise is a bit narrow. Um, so, I'm not sure that I would want to do a noise album. Um, and it's just too easy. It's just too easy. It's just not that interesting, you know. It's noisy, okay. Things are overdriven. It's quite monotonous. It's annoying, you know. And a lot of things qualify as noise that I think aren't necessarily that noisy. So, and things, I don't know, I just feel like it's a very narrow kind of it's too narrow, it's too restrictive. So no, and I think the whole noise scene is just really conservative. It's safe as fuck. Because it's all laid out for you already before you even make anything. You already know what it's gonna be. Um. Yeah, what about that old notion of an Arteca produced hip hop album? Yeah, I mean, maybe. I don't know how interesting that is. Um, my my ideas of hip-hop are, are from another time. Because I grew up with b-boy culture and it being about being fresh and kind of inventive and pulling moves that nobody had thought of. And that's not really what hip-hop's about much now. It is on a subtle level. And if you're really into it, you'll find the tunes. But there's an awful lot of hip-hop that's just totally by the book. Um, you know, it's the difference between like wearing a pair of shell toes because they're a kind of you're appropriating something from a sportswear company, and that the sportswear company aren't aware that you're appropriating it, right? So you're doing it on your own terms, and it becomes a kind of the culture's doing it, maybe, or you're just doing it as an individual. You know, like you spray paint in your trainers chrome, which I did once in the eighties. Like that might be the kind of thing you'd do. But like if the if the you know if Adidas or Puma market a trainer that's all chrome, that's not as cool, is it? It's just not as interesting. And if they're marketing trainers directly to the actual culture, and the culture are buying the trainers that the trainer company are marketing, then what's that? That's not the same thing. So that's like a different thing. It's like you know, because British sports casual culture it came from kids going out to Europe to watch football and then coming back with weird Adidas trainers and flipping it. And that was a different thing 
to people to people actually just buying them down the local shop. You know what I mean? It was it's like there are levels to how how cool and interesting it is, and similar with making hip hop now. I think like you can make hip hop that just sounds like it's off the shelf. Um, you can make a pop that's original, but if you make it too original, it won't ever be a hit on the on the commercial circuit. So the, you know you have to strike a balance as a pop producer, where you're kind of being flying fresh, but only to some extent, and otherwise you're towing the line. And yeah, that's not what it was about when I was growing up, really. So I've got a funny funny view of of all that stuff. I, I preferred it when it was about being fresh, really, you know. So, yeah, I mean, if we was allowed to do that, and we would be because we're us and we can do what we want. So, I guess maybe. It's just finding MCs who are going to be down with that, with you just making it a bit fucking different, you know, and not different in an obvious way, you know. There's a few producers still doing that. Not like everyone's shit, is it? Do you think there's still a developing in scene in modular programmable DAWs like Max, Super Collider, etc., where it can grow both in terms of the market of technology and music output? Don't really understand that question, sorry. I mean, maybe. I think they're just tool sets that allow for you to do a lot more. Or they, you know, they create more possibilities for you to explore different spaces of things. So yeah, I mean, there's definitely room in there for people to explore stuff. Because there's so many configurations, even in, just in Max or just in Super Collider, there's probably a shit ton of configurations that nobody's done yet. So, you know. Um, Last night I was thinking that for the crowd it would be a cool experience to watch a live show laying down when played in darkness, no twats trying to film darkness, just letting the music come over you, what do you think? That happened once, we did a gig in Baltimore and all the kids did ketamine and lay down in sleeping bags. Because you know what Baltimore's like, it's fucking mad isn't it? And it was just mad, we were like, the fuck is happening here? And then these lads come up to us and say, hey we're the guys who started the IDM list and we were like, oh fuck off. Like, and then there was all these other people just laying around in fucking sleeping bags on ketamine. And I was thinking, Baltimore's weird, isn't it? It's a bit weird, Baltimore. Never seen anything like that since, either. <laughs> Did the 1 6 sets feature a remix of Letter L? Yeah. Yeah, that's what that was. But it's also a remix of an older tune, uh, which I'm not going to tell you the title of, but it's on the warp tapes. There's like a full circle type thing, that. Do you see yourself ever getting bored of Max in the foreseeable future, or is it more likely that Max is the thing that you're going to be using until you stop altogether? I mean, I'll use it until I get bored. I, I don't want to say either way. Um, I'm sure there's, there's always a limit in terms of my interest in things. But Max is one of those things where I'll keep thinking of new things to try and trying them and then liking it. So, you know, if it gets to the point where I can't be bothered or I can't think of it or it does, I'm not feeling inspired enough to try out something in it, yeah, maybe I'd stop using it. But I can imagine it'd always be there as part of the studio. You know, I might branch out and start incorporating other technologies again at some point, but I haven't really had the need to do that. So, and I really like having it all in my bag it's just good for redundancy it's good for um reproducibility in terms of me and rob um it's good for travel keeps costs down means that we're not using loads of fuel to move our stuff around so there are loads of reasons why i like using max and software in particular but in particular max and also the fact that you know i can have gear i can be running gear that nobody else has got so there's a sort of exclusivity element to it and a kind of there's a kind of b-boy element in there as well, you know. 
having everything being custom. That's I've grown up with that kind of mindset, so you know. Someone saying the awesome thing about Max is it's endless. You get bored with one patch and you can build a new one. Yeah, and also like the fact that it, it's the more you do, the more you do. So if you're building tools, you know, you build one tool. Okay, you can use it in, in a few different ways depending on how many settings and parameters it's got. And then you build two tools and you can use those. And then you build like four or five tools and then there's combinations of tools that you can use different combinations in different ways. And then, you know, when you've got a few hundred, it's just crazy the number of combinations. So you can you can almost not get bored just using shit that you've built yourself without having to build anything else beyond a certain point. Um, but when you couple that with constantly being able to modify everything, so if a, bit, if a synth isn't quite doing what you want, you can just create a copy of it with a new name and just give it another function. You know, it's just, it is basically, it starts to become endless. Like, I, I wouldn't say endless, but you know, obviously there's a finite range of possibilities, but it's like atoms of the universe type stuff, you know, it's like, it is finite, but, you know, it's way beyond my ability to catch up with it, so. Was Acroyer named after the Micronauts toy? Yes. Acro Year 2 in the US and Acro Year 1 in the in Japan. So I named it Acro Year 2 because I grew up in the UK and we had the Mego line, so you get on a Micronauts conversation now. The Micronauts were cool as well. First time anyone's asked me that. Um <laughs> What's this about labels? I'm trying to get back to this. Was it entirely Warp's decision to not release Alsec on any physical formats? Uh, no, it was ours. <laughs> uh, Ah, it's a long story. When we, when we first set up the store, I wanted an opportunity to release some stuff that people might complain about if it was released on on traditional album format. Because I got the sense that the industry was sort of, in, to some extent, holding us back by saying that, you know, this is, you must produce an album that feels like this and has tracks that are this long and this these kind of weird restrictions. So I wanted to have the store as a way of circumventing all that. Um, you know, and this is why we can do quite weird things like the long form Twitch stream stuff, because I know that most people are interested in hearing one track for five hours. You know, that's, I'm not stupid. I get that. But at the same time, I enjoy it. And I know that some people would. So why not do it? He's, and I've thought that about a lot of things over the years. You know, why not just do this? Because I like it. So, um, yeah, you know, that. That was the kind of thinking there with Elsie. We, we didn't really want to burden people with a five disc set of that kind of stuff, but we thought if we just shoved it out on digital, we'd have low costs, low risk, we can do it. And it's just for the music, right? So if we make enough money back, it'll be cool. Um, so yeah, that was the reason and the thinking behind it and why we didn't plan to release it on physical at the time and why we announced that. If it looked like there was mad demand for it, for a physical version of it, we'd do it. But you know, at the time, I just wasn't sure. I was just thinking, these tracks are long as fuck, man. Is this okay? I mean, it's okay for us. We like it. But is it okay from a commercial standpoint? Are people going to stand for it? Are they going to complain, you know, that they don't have this many hours in a day to listen to all this stuff? And it's like, well, I don't want to be a burden on you. You know what I mean? I'm just like doing it because it, for the love. So if you want it, We'll put it out there. So yeah, that's what LC was. And, but when we come to doing NTS, we, we kind of knew that with the boost of it being on the radio, that we might be able to get away with doing a physical for it. So we pushed it a little bit and it turned out to be a, a wise move, but it was a gamble, you know. But we would have done the same for NTS otherwise. It would have been Digi only, but what we're pretty convinced that we could move physicals of it. So we tried it and it worked. So fair play to what for taking a chance on that, because I probably wouldn't have left to my own devices but I approached them with it and they were up for it so we did it so it's always a bit of a compromise between us and them 
you know what I mean? We we come up with a weird idea and we hit them with it and they're like, you know, letting us know if they think it's going to work or not. And sometimes we just think that there's too much of a limit and they might be trying to push us into doing more with it. So they might think, oh, we could do a physical of this and we might think, hmm, not sure. Like with the live sets, that was always going to be too much for people and that's really the store exists for stuff like that so that we've got an outlet for stuff that's just pure digital so yeah that's that was the thinking it was sort of a bit we didn't really know you know what i mean we just had we just wanted to try it is there something you miss about composing songs like flutter i mean no because i'd be doing it if i if i missed it i've still got the gear so there's, no, there's nothing stopping me getting the EPS and the RA out and doing Flutter 2, you know. I just don't feel like doing it, so. Um, but you're all welcome to have a go if you want, you know. Just get the sound effects card for the R8, um, sample some kind of arbitrary sound, like a vocal or something, and just knock out your own version of Flutter. I think there's, like, a quadriverb on there as well, so you might need that. Not hard, though. If you want it, just make it. Um Oh yeah, I forgot to change the filters. I'm sorry about the filters. You know. Yeah, I'm scrolled up. Do you want me to scroll back down? Right, I can't, well you can't say, can you? Because I've scrolled up, so I won't even hear you. Uh, let me scroll down really quickly and try and skip a few questions. Um, I'll skip anything that I think is vaguely uncomfortable. I am a horse by horse, man. Is that true? Is that really what it's called? I am a horse by horse, man. I fucking, I'm going to look for that later. It better be that. I am a horse. Am I just imagining it? It's weird. Do you know when you can't, you're not sure? you just got something in your head. I am a horse. I tried Googling I am a horse, but that didn't really get me anywhere. Well, certainly not nowadays. Um... I shouldn't say Google, I actually use DuckDuckGo because, you know, it's supposed to be more private. <laughs> it's not, is it? So, um, I'm sure it is a bit. But do you reckon some DAWs are shit with shoving too, way too much visual feedback on musicians and that ends up influencing music a bit too much? What should DAW makers do about it? I don't know. I mean, like, I personally, like, I don't like the timeline because you can see when things are coming up, so you get this apprehension thing. I prefer forgetting and then listening and just making sure that the funk's right. I think in some ways that's what's good about trackers because it's just this list. You don't really, you don't get that visual kind of thing telling you what's coming. So, I don't know, it depends on how you're structuring your projects though. Sometimes it's not that easy to see where things are because, you know, but often, yeah. I don't know, personally I find it easier to listen to music if I've not got any visual feedback, right? So just shut my eyes or like turn the screen off i used to do that a lot using logic at first because i found it a bit disconcerting so i just basically when i was listening back i'd switch the screen off i think that's the best way of doing it but it's having the discipline to do it every time you know I'm just looking for questions. I'm cruising, cruising the timeline. Right, so, um, will we ever get a release of the old tech I saw you thing? I don't know. Yeah, there's no digitized version of that. I talked about it earlier. One of the tracks is on the Sweatbox thing. The other one isn't out there, as far as I know. Hopefully nobody leaks it, but you know, I don't really care if they do either. But I'm not saying leak it, by the way. When I say I don't care, I just mean... 
it doesn't matter to me either way really but it's just i don't own it like when i said that about that hanel thing you've got to bear in mind right that i don't own the orteca tracks on there they're not mine they're what so if you're leaking it it's them that you're getting in trouble with not me so me okay in it doesn't mean it's okay you get me it just means i don't care so and i didn't okay it anyway so um Column 13, I think it was a live set cell. I don't know if we'd used it before NCS came out. I think we might have used a bit of it. I can't remember. But yeah, most of NCS sessions was like cells from live sets either the, at the time or a bit prior to that, that we already had jams for recorded. So we were just editing them down into things. And we basically like made it knowing that it was gonna go out on the radio. So it was kind of, it was a different editing process to what we'd normally do. So bits of it were from before, bits of it were from just then, bits of it were made specially for the thing, for the broadcast, you know. It was a, it was a combination of stuff. Um, Alexi Perala, yeah, I like, I like Alexi Perala, what I've heard of it, but I don't know, I've probably only got old stuff. Probably just some files I got off Rob Hall at some point. But I'm kind of shit at buying electronic music, modern stuff, so... Uh, try and play any instruments? No. Um, I mean, yeah, computer, but is a computer an instrument? Let's have that conversation. I can't believe he isn't familiar with Villa Lobos's work. It's like not having heard of Basic Channel or something. No, it isn't. They're different artists. I'm totally aware of Basic Channel, not aware of Villa Lobos. So, sorry I don't know it. Like, should I go and listen to Villa Lobos? They probably just sound different. Um, Gantz, Graf and Feed, one of the closest you guys have ever gotten to doing noise. I, no, they're not noise. They're just sort of certain types of processes. I wouldn't call it noisy. But I guess it could be. If you can't hear the individual events or whatever. I think they're just kind of like dirty synths on feed one and Gantz Graf is well it's Gantz Graf isn't it no. it's just it's certain kinds of I won't call it noisy it's not noisy no. not really I've heard way noisier music than that I think noise is supposed to hurt to some extent I think that might be partly why I don't like it but also the kind of people who do it are quite boring really when you meet them really predictable Um, I'm skipping anything that I've been asked before, so I'm sorry if I seem to be ignoring your question, but I probably already answered it. Um, can you elaborate a bit on the process behind the Confield Live site? I hear lots of FM synthesis. Yeah, I mean, it was like, so we had, I had the Nord lead and Rob had the Nord modular, the, the original one, the G1 or whatever. Um, and then we had Max running them, and then there was a couple of tracks where we used MSP to do the synthesis, and that was all FM stuff, just real basic two operator FM stuff. And then there was a bunch of kind of MSP processing on that, like gating and chopping up and kind of weird reverb delay things that we'd done, but it was all quite basic processes, just using them quite heavily, you know. Um, with a lot of modulation. I guess you'd call it modulation. Um, uh, the sequencing was the main thing. Um, how do you load patches during live? Using some kind of queuing system that would turn certain modules and X-bars and turn certain on. Yeah, there's like a global, so there's like a global pattern that contains information about which modules are loaded and what, what pattern preset each module is going to look for when it gets loaded so and that forms the kind of basic structure of the set so we can move through that manually and we can jump around and do what we want within that but we're quite often moving a, in a semi-linear fashion through it so essentially yeah they're, they're kind of the information about which modules are loaded and, and which settings they're going to look for when they load 
is is hard set but there can be it cannot be flexed and the patterns can be morphed with each other within each module so the um if we have like adjacent settings we can morph between them sort of thing so yeah um <laughs> where'd you get your ideas from where'd you get your ideas from yeah not answering that not answering it fucking question fuck off like that's that question never ask someone that but obviously I know that right wait right I'm down at the bottom I'm at the bottom I'm at the bottom can I ask about disengage yeah ask me about it Um, building anything that eye level in max is just crazy to me stuff gets so messy yeah not really this is so fast this chat this is why I can't keep up right do you process samples and stuff live or would it be more se sequencing sims yeah more um, has the XI stuff ever been played live no because it, the rig wasn't capable of playing live at that point um, it was just for it was only useful in the studio tell me Confield stories no um, I've seen chats that make this look slow. Yeah, I'm sure you did, but I'm s too slow. For Villa Lobos, I'd check out the fabric mix. Okay, I will. I will check out Villa Lobos. I'm not dissing it off. I just haven't checked it. There's lots of stuff I haven't checked, you know. I'm not like a fucking librarian. So I'm going to the barbecue and Chorin to catch you guys. Thanks. Yeah. Sign your vape? No. Would you bring Cygnus on a US tour again? Yeah, why not? It'd be fun. He's, he's a DOS to hang out with. Are you working for Cygnus? I don't know about Kanye and Apples, that's not, it must be, what are you talking about? Visit Sheffield for some shows. Yeah, that, we never get booked to play Sheffield, which is weird because I did live there for quite a while. Um, have you heard Sam Interface's beats? No. What was the approach to the disengage mixes? It wasn't mostly us, it was mostly Andy and Rob and all the other guests come lot, um, and Glyn. Uh, but we done bits for it, little bits of mixes and stuff. You can usually tell mine, because there's usually some Soviet France in there. What Soviet France should one check out to prepare for the London gig? I don't know, ask them. I don't know what they're doing this year. So get on their Twitter, ask them. I'm sure they won't tell you. Uh, have you ever tried to make 303 acid in Max? Not authentic, no, because I'm not, like, up for that. I don't really do emulation. Um, it's kind of... It's just why... And also, I'm not sure I'd be able to do it, because the 303 is pretty unique. Maybe. I've managed to get a filter sounding quite a lot like it, so... Did you ever get into EBN? Yeah, massively. I fucking love EBN. That's a really good question. And I'm glad you asked it. And you could probably tell from the Twitch streams as well, if you know. You know, right? So. That was a really good question. I'm really glad you asked that. I think EBN don't get enough shouts, you know? I think he was really good. Yeah. And funny as fuck, you know. Get down, get down. Yeah, fucking brilliant, EBN. Not mentioned enough. Especially during when, you know, when like YTP got really fucking interesting in the late 2000s, just before the tennis thing happened, because I love YTP tennis shit. Yeah, exactly. It was the original, weren't it? Totally was, totally was. I remember first seeing that and just being like, holy fucking shit, what is happening now? Like, <laughs> what is this? Like, yeah, amazing. Funny as fuck. Really good when you're tripping as well, because it's just, it's so ridiculous, you know. Okay, Radical TV, I will. Dali Mini, yeah, play with it a bit. Like it, fun, you know. All about curation, isn't it? All about 
getting the right prompts, you know. I love getting the prompts just right. Um, yeah, I did watch Breaking Bad. Um, I, I'm a mild fan of it. It's all right, you know. I found some of it a bit... Yeah. Some of it was cool. Never watched Better Call Saul. Um, okay, I will check it if it's much better, Lexi. Good shout. Thank you. Okay, I'll check it, I'll check it, I'll check it. Yeah. I fucking, I really like Bojack Horseman, for what it's worth, so... Yeah, everyone's saying Better Call Saul's better than... Okay, yeah, I'll watch it, I'll watch it. <laughs> yeah, Bojack's ace. <laughs> I'm a horse. Yeah, exactly, I'm a horse. Let's not do the I'm a horse thing anymore. Um, no, I've not read David Foster Wallace. Recommend me something. Um, this is good not scrolling the chat. It's fucking hell, it's a bit different, isn't it? King Gizzard, uh, maybe I've heard of them, I don't know what that is. Um, Greg Egan I've had recommended to me a few times, um, and I've never checked him. But his stuff's meant to be pretty good hard sci-fi, right? So I'll probably get into it. Infinite Jest, yeah, somebody recommended that, shit. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll check this. I'm getting a long list now, which I'm probably going to forget most of. Um... Lanark Artifacts, I've heard, yeah, pretty good. Um, do I know Carl Pilkington? I'm probably, look, I know I probably sound like him to you. You know, when I first heard Carl Pilkington, I was like, I'm fucking sure I know this guy. He sounds like most of my mates. He's got a similar buzz. Um, but that shouldn't be surprising, right? Because it's probably just from the same part of town. Similar sense of humour, maybe. Um, there's a fucking really funny bit that Carl Pilkington did. I think it was in one of them shit Ricky Gervais things, because I just used to listen to it for Carl Pilkington, where he's going on about washing up and accidentally spotting a neighbour, like, in, in a state of half undress, because she's getting dressed, and then, like... Anyway, I'm not, I'm not going to do it, because it's funnier when it comes to him. It's one of the funniest things I've ever heard. It's just really funny. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He just gets his ass out. <laughs> yeah, fucking hell. He's gone a bit weird, hasn't he, Ricky Gervais, recently? What's he on now? He's on some sort of turf tip. Can't get down with it. Don't know what he's doing. <laughs> um, anyway, let's not, let's not get into that. Uh, will you play Dublin again? Yeah, mm, yeah. I mean, pretty soon, hopefully. Um, I have applied for Dally 2, but they don't give a shit about me, do they? So, you know. If I was a tech journalist, I'd have it already. Pretty sure of it. Um, do you have a target loudness for shows? Yeah, no less than 103, usually. It's not D... It's just DBA, though, so... It's not really loudness level, is it? Too bad Dublin's a shithole. No, it isn't. Don't be like that. I've got a lot of friends in Dublin. Any special thing about Dublin? I don't know, yeah, I mean, having mates there helps, you know. It's a good playing anywhere where you've got mates, isn't it? All your mates show up, so.
my earring is like on this side it's not as good as it is on this side but i can't tell like if i hear a signal i can usually tell if it's center or not so it's kind of weird so if i just listen if i block this ear off i'm not, not hearing too good but my brain's somehow equalizing things so you know but it's, it's basically from years of having the monitor on this on the left side so it's shot this ear a little bit over the years but it's weird, I can, like I say, I can just tell if a signal's mono or not. I don't seem to have any kind of bias when I'm working, you know. Yeah, it's weird. Do you protect it from those 103 plus dB? I mean, that's going out front, right? So I'm, I'm behind that. So I'm not hearing it 103 at all. You lot are, though. So you might want to protect your ears. But I'm doing it for the body, basically. So... If you want to wear hearing protection, that's up to you, isn't it? You interested in ambisonics? I mean, a bit. Yeah, I've learned a bit about it. Um, mainly because I, I know someone who works with it all the time. So, But she's much better at using it than I am. Um, what's your advice to the Gen Z generation? Well, you're all getting a bit old now, aren't you, Gen Z? Aren't we on fucking, what's the next one? Generation Alpha. So, Gen Z. Um, yeah, don't, don't let somebody else give you your identity and tell you what group you belong to. Don't let, don't let that happen. Just figure out who you are yourself, you know. That's what I'd say. There's people getting outraged about things that aren't really worth getting outraged about as well. And then there's people who are getting outraged about things that are... And the other thing is fucking recognise that there's some of us, I'd say like quite a lot of us actually, most of the people I know, have been more right on than you lot are for most of our lives. And we're not just a bunch of boomer cunts. So you've got to understand that. You know what I mean? We're not like... We're not the way you think we are. So, yeah, I don't know. That'd be my advice if I had to give any, which I fucking hate giving advice, so don't ask me that again. Please. You know what I mean? Some of us were nice. You know what I mean? Fuck off, I'm Gen X, me. And um, Gen X are fucking... We're, we're supposed to be slackers, aren't we? So, and do I seem like a slacker to you? Is that how I seem to you? And plus, you know, there's two more things I've got to say, right? One is that in the UK, these generation labels didn't apply until the, the internet, the advent of the internet started to spread them around the world. So we didn't use these terms in the UK. Gen X wasn't a term used in the UK until the internet. And the other thing is that boomers in the UK didn't exist full stop, did not exist because after the war, tax was so high in the UK, no one could afford to have fucking kids. So we didn't have a baby boom in the UK. We don't have boomers. Boomers don't exist in the UK. People need to get a clue about that, no. So anyway, it's all for marketing. Yeah, probably. Yeah, no one called themselves Gen X. No one in America in the 90s was calling themselves Gen X when I was there. No one was like, we're Gen X. Yeah, no one give a fuck about any of that. <laughs> Bloody Gen Xers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you manage to live as a musician without going insane? I don't know, maybe I am insane. How do you know? Do I seem that sane to you? I'm probably not that sane. Probably, I mean, I might be a bit insane. What classical music you listen to? Not a lot. I mean, Ligeti, probably. 
I listened to Shostakovich for a while because I quite liked how his melodies go off on weird tangents. I think some of his stuff is quite mad. But in general, I find a lot of classical music a little bit like uh, pirouetting through emotional states. And I find I, I'm not like that. I don't enjoy the experience of it. Even though it might be like musically smart or whatever. Berio, okay, I'll check Berio. Feel free to recommend classical to me that you think I might like, based on what you've heard of us, you know. Um, thoughts on OPN? Yeah, I, l I love OPN. I think OPN's brilliant because he's really found his own voice within a kind of a sea of shit. And um, yeah, I find him very interesting from a kind of intellectual and conceptual standpoint. Yeah, he's good, he's really good. You know, he touches on things, he's not like always like aesthetically exactly where I'd put myself, but I think he's very definitely doing his own thing. So that's, that works for me. Any vaporwave you like? Yeah, Mac Plus, let's do it. You know, um, I like echo jams, you know, what can I say about it? I don't want to name just them, but you know, they're the two that I'm the most familiar with, so let's have it. Yeah, come on, accept it. Um, can the ship of Theseus sail through the sea of shit, or do you reckon it would sink? Yeah, so is the ship of Theseus uh, fungible or not? What do you think? Ah, you don't have to say that, but thanks, Beck. Appreciate it. What do I think about chip tune? I think it's um, all derivative of Team Diobi. No, I'm joking, you know. But, um, yeah. I feel like I was there at the start, you know. I seen, I seen chip tune spring up out of nowhere. Not really. <laughs> Is crypto a lot of bullshit? I'm not fucking saying, I'm not saying an opinion about crypto. So I'll just have people calling me a smooth brain. So, and we can't have that, can we? Yeah, I think, I think it's like funny, the crypto thing. It's a bit like a cult, you know, but it's also really driven by a lot of speculators and you've got to recognize that, you know, if you've got a lot of money, then crypto's a useful tool for making more of it. But I don't think we should be speculating using money. I think it's weird currency speculation it's a bit like currency arbitrage it's a bit like i'm not sure how i feel about it i don't think money should be a vehicle for investment really but you know in terms of whether it's good to have decentralized currencies yeah probably but maybe not using some kind of collective ledger that takes fucking years to process you know there's probably a better way of doing it And yeah, I don't know, proof of work versus proof of stake. And I don't know if we'll be really there yet. Everybody talks about Ether moving over, but I'm not sure when it's going to happen. Has it happened yet? You know what I mean? I'm not a crypto expert, so don't start asking me loads about crypto. I'm not, I just have some pretty ill-informed opinions. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, the thing about it sucking in people who were on the left because they thought it was an alternative to fiat currency and then them ending up being tech bros and bullying people on the internet because they're not using crypto was just fucking perverse as fuck. You know. You into Tom Waits? Uh, yeah, a bit. 
you know, um, there's a track by his What's He Building in there that I really vibe on. I think it's fucking really good. <laughs> yeah, some of his stuff's really fun and, yeah. I ain't heard Beyonce's new album. Should I hear that? Is that good? Do you master your own stuff? Nah, I get like Noel Somerville to do it because he's really good, but he does mainly what he's trying to do is make it sound, the, the vinyl sound the same as a digital. So he doesn't, as a rule, doesn't touch the digital and then does as little as possible to the vinyl or at least he processes it in a transparent enough way for you not to tell that it's different to the digital. So that's why we use him because he's very good at doing that. Um, and that came from him actually. It wasn't us going to him and saying, don't touch it. It was, we took our stuff to him and he just said, I don't feel like there's anything I need to do it. So I'm gonna do this. And we said, okay. So yeah. But I really rate him. He's, he's really good now. He's just fucking really good. Um, what's your favorite filmmaker? I don't know, Tarkovsky. Fucking... Do you like Kendrick Lamar? Nah, not really. I mean, it's a bit issuesy, you know. It's all right. I feel like it's trying to please people. And the music doesn't really vibe for me, so... Yeah, I love talking to Noel. He's fucking super experienced, really knows his shit, you know. Very transparent guy to work with. Very easy to work with him. Doesn't fuck you around. Not heard any new left field. How many times have you seen Pi? Once, I think, maybe twice. Um, Favourite Euro rap module? I don't know. Don't really have any Euro rap modules. I've got a load of old ones, but Rob's got them at the moment, so. Uh, probably. I mean, if I had to name one, it'd be from 20 years ago, but it's probably the remake of the bold frequency shifter that Analog Systems did, so... Because that thing was really nice. No, I've not seen Requiem for a Dream. Is that the one about drug addiction or something? I've not seen that. I think someone recommended it to me once and I, I thought it sounds a bit depressing so I didn't bother. Is it good? I'll watch it then, okay. Am I a fan of Jay-Z? I don't think so. Everyone's saying it's really depressing. Someone's saying it's a shit movie, don't watch it. Yeah, okay. I don't know. I don't know. I just sort of I just thought about it and thought, nah, I just I don't feel like I'm in the mood for that. So I didn't watch it. If I didn't know it was going to be depressing, I probably would have watched it. So it's one of them, innit? Don't watch it. Okay, I won't. I won't watch it. <laughs> yeah, I'll watch Better Call Saul instead because you told me to. So... Um, Yeah. Have you watched any anime? Yeah, bits, you know. <laughs> Train spotting. Yeah, nah, it's a different scene. Heroin addicts in Scotland. It's not really my background. I'm a different generation. Um All these questions about things I don't know about. Not you, Sir Clum, but it looks like fun. I can see why you might want to use that. Rather be doing my own stuff, but yeah, looks cool. You into horror movies? I guess, maybe a bit. Less into them than I used to be. Probably because they got a bit samey. Yeah. 
I've been asked this question about a massive SoundCloud dump, Apex style, about 20 times now. I wonder why that's like a meme question. Yeah, I don't know what's interesting in Manchester outside of the whole 80s scene. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't want to list a load of things that are cool about Manchester, but it's mainly about the people, you know. So it's like if you like being around them kind of people, then it's a good place to be. Do you like hiking? Yeah, I guess I do. Um, do you ever do a microsound album? I don't really know what that is. Um, is it where you have lots of short sounds? Is it still Manchester? Nah, it's not like that at all now. It's it's like very different. It's been kind of gentrified quite a lot. And there's a lot of suits around. But there's still a lot of locals, you know. But it depends where you live, really. Have you ever tried limiting yourself with equipment? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I am limiting myself to just using a computer and Macs. So... It's just very unlimited at the same time. I don't know about this limitations thing. I mean, I get that it's, like, attractive to people, but... I'm, I think that it might be a bit of a misnomer in, in a lot of cases. Because it's, you know... There's still probably, like, a lot of combinations of parameter settings and stuff on whatever gear you're using. There's very little gear that is actually limited in that way. You know... Thoughts on Talk Talk? Yeah, I liked them. I liked them quite a bit. Um, you know, Spirit of Eden. And even the earlier, the sort of pop stuff I used to like. But there was a girl at work who got me into Talk Talk. And she got me into the Duh as well. Because I wasn't really into pop music when I was a kid. I was only into electro. And then I started working in the shop. I used to try and sneak music onto the stereo in there. And they let me play Depeche Mode, but not a lot of the other stuff. Like I'd try playing house and techno tracks in there and I get told off so then after I was playing Depeche Mode in there she started recommending the the and Soul Mining was the first one I got into I really liked that um, and then Burning Blue Soul later and then um, yeah and I liked Talk Talk as well that was because of her as well she used to play propaganda and stuff like that how high is your IQ I don't know three do you ever talk to Apex's kids? No, no, I haven't. I haven't seen Rich in a long time, actually. Quite a long time. Talked to him a few times. Um, thoughts on Roxy Music? I should probably listen to Roxy Music, because whenever I hear a track and think, oh, this is interesting, from that era, it turns out to be them. Because some of their melodies, I think they sort of predate synth-pop melodies in a weird way so I'll probably enjoy Roxy music I've got a feeling I would uh, Susie and the Banshees a little bit yeah I was more Cocktail Twins kind of guy Garlands I liked because that's a bit Susie-ish but um, Natochka Nova. Um yeah that was that was fun all that NN shit I used to enjoy interacting with NN back in the day um, um, yeah, we're having a 4 AD chat now, so I'll get in very kind of. Okay, so. Oh, Kate Bush, yeah, okay, like, I see Kate Bush get dissed, especially lately, because of the, all the attention. So there's been a lot of contrarians popping up. But, you know, I think the dreaming's phenomenally interesting right it's like super well made and weird and i always really rated kate as a producer because i think obviously people talk about her histrionics and her weird fucking dancing and everything but um she's a good producer you know what i mean i've always thought that since the 80s i've thought that so i'd love to work with kate are you serious it'd be fucking amazing that'd be like a dream come true fucking hell 
Yeah, no, she's she was great. Um And so much more of an individual than a lot of punks. You know, which is a you know, at the same time you've got punk happening, right, where everyone's towing the line and being a punk. And then you've got Kate, and what the fuck is Kate doing but being an individual? More of an individual than any of them cunts, you know. I don't know, I hear it and all that kick. It's probably a fucking roost bus or some shit like that. I don't know. Some neighbour having a rave. Yeah, the mozzies aren't getting me today. I don't know why. But I noticed a, a few dragonflies yesterday cruising the garden. So I think they've moved in now. And they're now the bosses, the garden bosses. And they're dealing with the uh, mozzies. I was wondering if I could buy a box of dragonflies just to take out the mozzies. And then they just showed up by themselves. So, got a great nature, haven't you? Just looking after itself. What are your thoughts on rave culture? Would you ever guys ever consider releasing an album so people can remix it? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Rave culture. I don't know if I can have if I can give you a, a reasonable comment on rave culture. It was co-opted so fucking quickly. It was good at first. You know, when we didn't know where we were going and we were meeting up at Nutsford Services to drive to some obscure location or, you know, Blackburn raves. It was good then, but it got shit very quickly, so... Uh, we've been back to Manchester recently. Nah, not in a few months. Um, put up a nest for bats. That's a good... That's a plan. How do I do that? Is it, I'll look online for a guide. What's your dream sound check scenario at Earn Street? Yeah, Earn Street were a fucking good sound check. I remember walking around the room and being like, shit, this is going to be nice. That was one of the better sound checks from the last 20 years. Um, wait, what's this? How would you feel about a track he was blowing up from a big show like Kate Bush recently? I'd be stranger things. Well, I don't think it's ever going to happen, is it? People aren't going to get fucking... Misty eyed over some old Ortecker track. They're not going to be like, oh, Ortecker, I remember them. Let's celebrate Ortecker and send them to number one. It's not happening, is it? So, oh, Bass Cadet, I remember that. Oh, yeah. Let's send Bass Cadet to number one. <laughs> yeah, bike, yeah, bike. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. <sighs> nah, I've never been to a Ben Frost gig. Should I? I don't really go to gigs much. I'm shit. I don't go to things. I'm just sat in my room with my laptop, so... Did you read The Wire? Uh, nah. Sorry, I'm not dissing it or anything. I just, I just can't be asked to read music, other people's opinions on music. Not when I can just download the music. So, I'd rather just listen to the music. Would you ever score a film? Yeah, I guess it's a lot of work though, and they keep telling you what to do. So I don't know if I'd enjoy it much. Now nah, Murakami gets recommended to me all the time and I feel like I should read Murakami. I saw that film The Burning recently and um, I just found it quite depressing but it was good. It was good but it was quite depressing, you know. Um, do I like wolves? You mean the animals? Yeah, I guess. I mean, I like dogs. I probably would like wolves. I met wolves once. It was at a zoo, though. Hmm. Nah. Don't know the third policeman. 
a longer version of T1A1. Is that even possible? Um, the Bowler remix, did you... What was that? Did you love the composition and his samples, so purified it? Well, he just took his very simple piano things and then tried to make them more complex by just layering loads of them on top into... Yeah, it's probably obvious what we did, though. Yeah, I liked it. It was mainly just a way of approaching it that I didn't think that anyone else would take, so... Favourite YouTube channel? Yeah, this is going to sound like... I don't know, like, I don't know, because it's... Hmm. I like that guy, what's he called? Anton Petrov. I like his channel. There's a guy, um, Rob sends me, he's this engineer guy, who I quite like, and I can't remember his name now, but if I remember it, I'll comment it somewhere. Um, I like ContraPoints, really, really well put together videos, like, and just beautifully formulated arguments, you know. Um, yeah, PBS Space Time, good, Vsauce, good, yeah, um, Action Lab, good. There's a lot of them channels I just enjoy just because they're fun, you know. Um, I used to like Photonic Induction when he was around, but he's gone fucking missing, so I don't know what's happened to him. He was fun, though. Number file, yeah, good. Um, yeah, Natalie is great. Um, hello, Natalie, you're great. Um, yeah, Contra's fucking great. It really gets you thinking. It's just good. Really well formulated, you know. Really well put together and thought out. And there's not many channels putting that much work in, so, you know. Do you watch much Twitch? Nah, not really. Um, should Gervais retire? Yeah, probably, because he's gone full turf, hasn't he? So he can fuck off. So I don't really, I don't really know what tip he's on at the moment, but I can't get down with it. I think he's... <laughs> He's done that thing Louis C.K. did when he got called out and then he's just dug himself right in and he's just gone, this is what I want to be now, you know what I mean? And, and Fingy done it and oh, Chappelle, didn't he? So I just can't get down with it. It's like a shitty response to the problem. You get me? Grateful Dead, I don't know. I want to, but I feel like there's a lot there to digest. People say that about us, though, right? So, yeah, maybe I should get, I should try Grateful Dead, because I used to like, like, uh, it's going to sound weird, but I used to like Hawkwind, because I kind of like how, I mean, I was young at the time, very young, right? So I have a kind of weird relationship with Hawkwind. Uh, it's like my dad's kind of generation music, but I kind of liked it because it was so out there, you know? Um, and from what I understand, Grateful Dead can be a bit like that, so maybe I'd be into it. But, you know, what's the appeal of vaping? Nicotine, which gives you um, a short, both a short-term and a long-term boost in cognition and memory capability. Um, any thoughts on Nietzsche? No. Yeah, obviously it's a, it's a, a vasi, vasilor constrictor or whatever, so it can be bad for you and it can give you a stroke, so, you know, use sparingly. Um, smoking weed makes you smarter. Probably turns you. <laughs> probably makes you feel smarter. You know, it's like, dude. But you know, I like it. I like what it does to music. Um, I like how it it really triggers me synesthesia like nothing else. So, especially when you have loads of it, if you do buckets or whatever if you're into that kind of thing. I guess you call them gravity bongs, but we used to do them a lot when I was a kid. Fucking hell. It just, but it's probably not good, very good for your brain, so I'm not recommending anyone do it. Plus, it's illegal in a lot of places, so... I didn't know that about LSD. Is it facile constricted? Is it? Shit. Um. Sampled Artwind, yeah, we did, yeah. 
Um, candy flipping, not done that for a long, long time. I never really got into E's though. I was a bit like I was exposed to it and I had them a few times, but I was never really a big fan. And it was mainly cause like when we was out, people would be listening to the shittish music and thinking it was amazing cause they'd had a couple of pills. So it never really did it for me. It weren't my kind of thing. How did you find out you were sampled by ZZ Top? Um, I don't remember. Somebody sent me it. It was back when it happened, so. Got the bees cruising around here at the moment. Um, try Changa. Now, let's not have a big conversation about different psychedelics. It gets boring. You know, save it for the psychonaut sub. Um, but I'm interested in hearing any stories anyone's got about Salvia because I've always been like, com like a little bit intrigued by Salvia because it sounds like such a rough trip. But I've never had it. Ever tasted your own cum? Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? As a kid, I think I was about twelve or something. Um. <laughs> wow, that's really funny. <laughs> um, no, it wasn't. What's this is about Connect Project? Yeah, no, I was just finding, you know, I was just finding number stations because I sent a load of them to Bach and then because we were kind of going, what is this? And then Connect Project dropped, which was a kind of cataloging of number stations. But I didn't feel like it was very um, comprehensive, to be honest, but it was interesting. Have you tried snooze in Norway? Yeah, I mean, I get the, I get like white snooze. So it's not really snooze, but I use it just for when I'm on planes and stuff like that, because it's a good way of getting it in. So you don't have to worry about getting told off for vaping, which, you know, when I, cause I started vaping like 10 years ago, longer actually, um, like 2009, 10. So no one used to tell me off for it back then, but they do now. Um, DXM I've never had, weirdly. Although I think I might've had it as a kid and not known. Well, I think I did have it as a kid actually. Um, if it was in Actifed, I think. Oh God, everyone's on about cough syrup now. Like, it's not that good. It just makes you, I thought my mum was a monster when I had that shit. That was way too young to me. My mum remembers giving it to me and me having this mad trip and <laughs> thinking she were a monster. That's interesting about the bathwater plug oil thing. Yeah. Right, I'm gonna get out now while this chat's descended into a awful comparison of the effects of different easily available psychedelic substances. Um, and because it's been a while. <laughs> So, yeah, I'm going to love you and leave you again. And uh, have a nice time and whatever. And, uh, yeah, try not to get too excited about the wrong things. All right, bye.